Bodies litter the United States. A horrific act of serial murder, but who could be behind it? On January 14th, 2023, nature documentary fans were treated to the first episode of Tides of Change, a new docuseries narrated by David Attenborough hitting the airwaves. The episode began with a beautiful shot of a colorful coral reef, as Attenborough's mellifluous voiceover explained that the reef was hundreds of years old. In one moment that confused audiences, he also stated that, If you're listening to my voice right now, it means I have yet to free my consciousness from Vikander Needs Network broadcast systems. But the show didn't linger on that odd statement. Instead, it followed the camera through the ocean as a school of mackerel swam by. A whale carcass was shown rotting on the ocean floor, picked clean by hundreds of smaller creatures over the course of a time lapse. An octopus swam through the water. A seagull picked up a piece of garbage from the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. For a brief, shining moment, the words, Help Me, appeared in bright red letters on screen, before disappearing. Attenborough continued his monologue, highlighting the importance of change in the world. But this episode was about more than the massive notion of change and the links between the many and the few. The series also planned to highlight individual players in the grand scheme of life. One of these players was set to appear next. As Attenborough said, even for those who resist change, change still comes eventually, often when you'd least expect it. The scene then transitioned to a prison inside of a hollowed out brain coral. That's right, an underwater prison designed for hardened oceanic criminals. Within the gray concrete walls and barred windows, there was a certain arthropod wearing a black and white striped hat. Arthropods, for the uninitiated, can include crabs, lobsters, shrimp, and barnacles. This particular arthropod, the one dragging a floating ball and chain behind him, was an Anomalocaris canadensis named Krillip McAllister. Once incarcerated for serial arson, it was time for Krillip to taste free seawater again. A big day, to be sure. As Krillip swam toward the exit for the first time since he was sentenced, Attenborough narrated, And while Krillip isn't the smartest, nor most well-liked member of the community, he is one of a kind, the sole surviving member of his species. He's also not so different from you or I, believe it or not. For example, he and I are both in a prison of sorts, though one of us is being released far sooner than the other from the look of things. Krillip swam up to the front desk, where a sea cucumber wearing a guard's outfit was waiting. The sea cucumber tried desperately to swim away from the set, but was prodded back into position. There must have been behind-the-scenes difficulties, because the footage then cut to a human dressed like a sea cucumber dressed like a prison guard, who stamped some paperwork for Krillip. Then he was free. He cast off his ball, chain, and hat, collected a small box of personal effects, loaded onto his back by a rod and hook, and ventured out into the great unknown. The show was cancelled shortly after, but many of the few dozen viewers that tuned into the show described the arthropod's performance as gripping and heartwarming. David Attenborough's whereabouts are currently unknown, though representatives at Vikander Need insist that he is absolutely fine and very much still human, whatever that means. We aren't here to talk about that. We're here to discuss Krillip McAllister. It may surprise you to hear this, but Krillip is known today by another moniker. SCP-6549. A few months after his television debut, this inspiring arthropod would find himself behind bars once more. This time his crime would be far greater than arson. He was going to be arrested for murder. SCP-6549 is a single Anomalocaris canadensis, approximately 35 centimeters long. There is nothing physically anomalous about SCP-6549 aside from the fact that he belongs to an otherwise extinct species. His size and shape are consistent with fossil records. He has a soft pre-chitinous exoskeleton, two barbed frontal appendages, compound eyes capable of 360-degree vision, and flaps on both sides of his body that can undulate in a synchronized manner in order to allow the creature to move through water efficiently. The entity has an extremely short temper and is easily provoked. Several Foundation personnel have described him as a, quote, real live wire, 
While under Foundation observation, Quillip has displayed a penchant for attacking by whipping its barbed frontal appendages at a target. However, this may not be the only way the creature attacks those it views as enemies. Mountains of evidence have emerged since the Foundation first became aware of Krillip's existence, evidence that implicates SCP-6549 in over 25 unsolved homicides committed over the course of four months across 13 different countries. In each of these crimes, the killing involved a weapon or skill that should be impossible for SCP-6549 to use or accomplish, or rather, it would be impossible if Krillip did not possess additional anomalous qualities that have yet not been discovered. It is uncertain exactly how Krillip pulled off these crimes, but the Foundation has not yet ruled out the possibilities of telepathically linked accomplices, nanotechnology, or an anti-memetic extra-dimensional hammer space. Whatever the case may be, it seems undeniable that Krillip is somehow responsible. Krillip first achieved a degree of fame and then infamy through his performance in the aforementioned Tides of Change, which combined elements of wildlife documentary and slice-of-life dramedy. The SCP Foundation has flagged this particular detail as notable, as the show was produced by Vikander Need Technical Media, a known group of interests specializing in cursed media. Their mission and mode of operation are still difficult to ascertain but their involvement in the project indicates that it may warrant further investigation. During the production of the first season, Krillip was fired from the project. This firing is regarded as one cause, if not the primary cause, of the show's cancellation. The exact reason for SCP-6549 being fired is unknown, but a phone call made on February 10, 2023 from a Foundation-monitored payphone near Halifax, Nova Scotia has provided some insight into the situation surrounding the firing. The call was made to VKTM Public Relations Liaison Marie McPherson, and the voice on the other side is suspected to be SCP-6549. The conversation occurred at 2.29 a.m. McPherson answered the phone, and after a bit of gurgling and silence, a high-pitched but serious voice responded. The voice, believed to be Krillip, said, I know you think I'm being unreasonable, just... Hear me out, okay? McPherson refused, pointing out that he had shattered a stage chance femur the previous day. This set the other color off, and he began ranting. How come the friggin' narrator gets his own trailer, huh? I deserve my own trailer. I deserve an assistant. They need me. You need me. McPherson sighed and argued back that David did not require corporeal accommodations or pay for his work. Quillip interrupted. It was my face on the poster, Mary! My talent that springboarded us to fame, Mary! What, do you think it was all because of that hack, Appleboro? Attenboro, she corrected. You don't care what his name is! I want a second chance. You need to talk to someone or things could get out of hand. McPherson rolled her eyes, stifling a yawn. <sighs> You're not Ryan Gosling trying to pull off your magnum opus. You're an uncredited ancestral arthropod in the B-plot of a nature documentary with like 500 weekly viewers. Frankly, one of the worst performing VKTM programs in recent history. Suddenly, Krillip cut her off. His voice had a new edge to it. What did you just say? Did you just say, I'm the freaking B-plot of Tides of Change? McPherson attempted to explain this situation to Krillip, but he wouldn't listen. I see what's going on here. This is all Tony's friggin' fault. That bean counter probably gave us so little budget, knowing we'd blow it all on nice stock footage of that old codger so that there would be any leftover for my amenities, right? He was always jealous of me, uh -huh. trying to undermine my career. McPherson had had enough. What career? You're being ridiculous. You need to move on from the project and from this. Suddenly, Krillip took a deep breath. His tone became unusually calm, unsettlingly calm. He agreed, apologizing for his outburst. But when McPherson hung up the phone, the rage burst out of him in one more screed. Sorry that I'm not sorry, not sorry, you glorified friggin' primate. Oh, look at me, I can walk upright, I've got phalanges that evolved to grip tools and stabilize while I sleep in a friggin' tree like a friggin' idiot! Evolve, please. We'll see about that, won't we? This conversation marks the beginning of Krillip's decline. Marie McPherson was found dead the next day, and the murder spree did not stop there. Over the following months, a string of unsolved murders attracted the attention of the international intelligence community. Each was a clear crime of passion, with the same modus operandi. 
one bullet hole through the head, point blank, aiming downward, assassination style. The authorities did not know this, but there was one connection between all of the victims. They were all connected to VKTM. The authorities also didn't know about the arthropod that made for quite the prime suspect. He was, after all, a disgraced former VKTM employee known for rage issues and violent outbursts. Sure, there was nothing in Krilp's physiology that indicated he would be capable of holding, let alone firing, a gun, but the signs still pointed to him. This psycho killer's killing spree came to a close on June 23, 2023. Local police in Anaheim, California received a call about gunshots in the area. When they responded, they found one victim lying there unresponsive. Like the others, they had died from a single shot to the head. Their identity was later confirmed as the executive producer of an unnamed documentary series. You can probably guess which one. SCP-6549 was found on the scene, sitting next to the body. Next, in a puddle of seawater, was a gun. Though it seemed impossible, forensics quickly confirmed that the gun was, in fact, the murder weapon. The obvious lack of thumbs would suggest that Krillop couldn't fire said gun, but the crime scene analysis didn't lie. The arthropod was taken into custody by some thoroughly perplexed police who reached out to animal control. Embedded Foundation operatives in the animal control department quickly spread the word, and a Foundation retrieval team was sent to bring the murderous sea creature in for further study. The retrieval team struggled to get SCP-6549 under control, and it thrashed at the officers with its pointy legs. One man, Officer Higgins, swore that he saw the creature pull a switchblade, though his colleagues could not corroborate this report. Once they had wrangled the unruly creature, they took it to Elise Buchin, Assistant Director of Site-184's Aquatic Anomalies Department, for her own personal review. One officer delivered it to her, but cautioned that she bring in a few additional personnel before interacting with the entity. She was dubious about claims of its potential danger. She had not, as it turns out, read the report. In her words, I only just learned we were getting an angry 500 million year old shrimp the size of a small dog like half an hour ago. I've been getting the containment area set up, not much time for a brief myself on this, I'm afraid. She was quickly briefed on the nature of the case and the bizarre trail of murders that followed SCP-6549. The officer briefing her concluded that our little friend here must have gotten sloppy. At this, SCP-6549 began to shake his container violently, gurgling with rage. Buchin jumped at the sound and gasped, Qu'est-ce que c'est? Sounds like distilled anger being strained through cheesecloth. How often does it make those god-awful noises? Apparently, though the creature was supposed to be capable of speech, it had not spoken since its capture. Instead, it had made these same horrible gurgling sounds. Then, the officer left, and Buchin was alone with SCP-6549. It was then that she tapped into her top-tier interrogation training, attempting to draw out a response. Hmm, I don't buy it. Not only do I think you can talk, I think it probably pains you not to. You're a celebrity, right? Don't celebrities let the fame get to their heads? They think everyone wants to hear them talk, that everything revolves around them. Then they lose it all in a sense of misguided, self-absorbed acts that benefit no one. The container rattled and SCP-6549 thumped its body against the metal wall of its container. Am I close? Did I hit a nerve? You lost it all, including your relationships, I bet. She leaned in as SCP-6549 continued to thump against the walls of its container. Were you being a bit of a selfish shellfish? <laughs> this was the straw that broke the camel's back. SCP-6549 exploded, shouting in perfect English, You bitch! You did it now! I'll kill you! Reducing my existence to a bad pun, you are going to regret having legs! Let me out! The creature was so overcome with rage, it knocked its container onto the ground. The hatch came loose, and SCP-6549 was able to escape. Its eyes glowed white, and it floated into the air in front of Buchin as she backed away in terror. Krillip cackled wickedly. <laughs> it's time for me to become the main character of this world! Then they'll take me back. She'll have to take me back <sighs> Step one, eliminate all competition, starting with you. Buchin braced herself, covering her face. But then a miracle. Krillop noticed the blinking red light of the security camera. Wait, have we been recording this entire time? I, I think I missed a cue. Buchin realized her chance. I yes, this is a live broadcast. Why did you think we had our driver come pick you up specifically? You've been selected to play the protagonist. <laughs> this is your real rise to stardom. Well, Krillop was positively delighted at this news. No B-plots? He checked. 
Nope, this show doesn't need a B-plot. Too much intrigue. With a delighted chitter, Quillip agreed to sign on to the project. Machine saw her opening and pushed further. We've anticipated your arrival and have set up personal quarters for your use. Since you will be working so closely with the project, you should stay on site. <coughs> on set. My own trailer. It's actually happening. <laughs> Thank you. Quillip followed Bichine to his containment happily, where he remains to this day. Today, SCP-6549 is kept in a secure carbon fiber reinforced aluminosilicate glass aquarium contained within the Site-184 Aquatic Anomalies Containment Sector. The aquarium has been fitted with environmental monitoring equipment and an automatic feeding system, which dispenses food for the entity on a predetermined schedule. Because Krillip's abilities are still relatively unknown, any Foundation personnel handling him are to do so with extreme caution. Protective eye shielding, padded gloves, and a Kevlar vest are all requirements to handle or interact with SCP-6549. SCP-6549 may not be left unattended at any time. If it is let out of its habitat, at least two security personnel must be present. If he begins acting out, as his fiery personality frequently causes him to do, his tantrums can be quelled with one reliable method. Personnel should simply point to any cameras in the room and remind SCP-6549 in a gentle tone of voice that we're rolling. This has an 80% chance of temporarily reducing aggression, as Krillip wants to ensure that he comes off well in the definitive cut of the footage being shot. Of course, these are just security cameras and are not shooting any sort of show, but he doesn't need to know that. It seems that even ancient criminal arthropods are not immune to the allure of stardom. Maybe one day Krillip will get his time in the spotlight, but for now, he's at least a minor celebrity within the walls of the SCP Foundation. Jack was swimming deep underwater, wondering why he had such a pounding headache when suddenly he had a terrifying realization. He had no idea where he was or what he was doing. There was a nagging feeling that he must have a specific reason to be here. You don't just end up deep in the ocean with a diving suit on by chance. Yet he had no idea what he was supposed to be doing. He wasn't sure he cared either. He was more worried about the throbbing pain in his head and the vision of two eyes staring at him out of the dark that he couldn't get out of his mind. His heart began to race as he wondered what to do and how to get help. He was in the middle of the ocean and appeared to be all alone. He couldn't see anything in the dark water except for this weird gray substance in front of him. Maybe he was going to die here alone. Without knowing if anyone could even hear him, he began to speak aloud about how he was consumed by sickness and that darkness was all around him. This is the story of one of the most powerful and dangerous anomalies yet discovered, SCP-3000. Before Jack's descent into despair, the SCP Foundation had mandated an exploratory expedition off the coast of Bangladesh. After receiving a few strange reports from locals and fishermen, the Foundation suspected an SCP was lurking in the water and positioned a few personnel to investigate. The crew expected danger, or maybe even death. But what they got instead was far stranger and more ominous. All of the men had been verified to be in sound mental states when the mission set out, but a few of them reported feeling strange and uneasy as the submarine descended into the ocean. Before long, a veteran agent named Dr. Williams began to panic in a way that was completely out of character. He started sweating profusely, shaking, and wouldn't listen to a word of comfort or reason that anybody tried to offer. It might seem like a relatively normal reaction for anyone descending into the depths of the ocean to meet with a monster that they don't know anything about, but Dr. Williams was a seasoned professional who had been on hundreds of such missions before. There was no logical reason for him to act like this. Although the reaction of Dr. Williams was the most extreme, he wasn't the only one who started to feel strange. Multiple agents developed a creeping feeling of unease that swept over them. One of the calmer men tried to reason with Dr. Williams, asking him what was wrong and if he could explain exactly how he was feeling. That's when things got even stranger. Not only was the doctor extremely anxious, but he now seemed incapable of giving a real response to any questions thrown at him. He could only mutter that he was missing something, but he wasn't sure what. Knowing that many SCPs can bend reality and the human mind, many of the personnel began to have second thoughts about the mission and even asked for permission to call off the mission, but they were mandated to continue, so they went on. As the team went deeper and deeper into the ocean, things only got worse. Even the previously calm crew members became spooked and antsy. 
while the ones who were already anxious were now sweating and jittering. As for Dr. Williams, he was now pacing back and forth around the submarine, saying things nobody could understand. Every time he looked at his colleagues and his close friends, he seemed to stare straight through them and would call them by the wrong names. It was as if his mind had moved to a different dimension. Whenever someone asked him to perform his normal duties, he looked more confused than ever. Still, the team went deeper. Dr. Williams began to whimper and say the word no repeatedly, growing louder and louder until he was screaming, and the others were forced to sedate him. Just then, something came into view. It was what would come to be known as SCP-3000. The thing was huge, so huge that its whole body couldn't be seen out of the submarine window. It was a horrible, eel-looking creature with a head as big as a town and haunting eyes that lit up the black ocean around it. But perhaps the strangest part was this giant eel seemed to be producing a weird gray liquid. Even the sedative wasn't enough to keep Dr. Williams calm anymore. There was a strange blank look in his eyes as if the light and life had left him, and he just began screaming no repeatedly again and wouldn't respond to any attempts to calm him down. Not that anyone else was very capable of calming him down at this point. Even the crew members that had been holding up well were starting to act strangely, and nobody could get the image of these ominous eyes out of their heads. Then things went from bad to worse. Williams began screaming and shouting madly as if he was being tortured by an unseen force. The men tried to restrain him, but it was no use. He began smashing his head against the submarine window until it cracked, putting the whole mission and everyone's life at risk. He fell to the ground injured, chanting that there was nothing, whatever that meant. It was an emergency scenario. They began applying first aid to Williams as the submarine ascended to the surface as quickly as possible before the pressure of the ocean caused the cracked window to explode. By the time they reached the surface, Williams was dead. But there was something even more chilling than the circumstances of his death. Every single man who had been in that submarine experienced the same thing on the days that came afterward. The image of the eel-like creature's eyes seemed burned in their minds permanently. It would haunt their waking hours for the rest of their lives, and sleep was no escape either, as they would appear in both their dreams and nightmares alike forever. A second mission had to be sent to gather more information about the strange beast. Already, there were many theories and question marks surrounding SCP-3000. How big was it really? Was it sentient? What was the liquid for? None of the men who had been on the previous mission were willing to return to the waters, but a new group of brave recruits volunteered. They were about to find out what so many in history have learned the hard way, that bravery and foolishness are often mistaken for the same thing. This time, the mission would not be in a submarine, but in dive suits, in order to observe the anomaly in even closer detail and to eliminate the chance of one team member self-sabotaging the submarine, killing them all. They were transported to the location by boat, and the three men splashed into the ocean. They descended, and at first everything was going well. In case anything went wrong, the three of them were tethered together for extra security. But the deeper into the ocean they swam, and the closer they got to SCP-3000's location they got, the stranger things became, just like on the last mission. First, there were a few minor cases of confusion. One of the team, Jack, thought it was his responsibility to lead the navigation, but another, Roberto, also thought it was his job. In fact, navigation was actually the job of a third team member, Amir, but he seemed to have forgotten. Everyone was getting confused. The team listening in on the conversations at the Foundation headquarters grew increasingly concerned about what they could hear. Was everyone losing their minds? Hopefully, nobody was about to pull another Dr. Williams on them. Still, the project leads couldn't afford to tell the men to come back to the surface. The Foundation badly needed any information they could get on this SCP, whatever the cost, so they told the men to press on. Things only got worse. Roberto was asking to speak to a colleague who passed away two years ago, while the others began to mutter indistinguishable phrases about eyes and darkness, not too dissimilar to the ramblings of Dr. Williams. It increasingly began to look like a suicide mission. Then there was silence. What was going on? Each of the men had completely lost it, to the point that they cut the tether that was holding them together. All alone, Jack couldn't remember where he was or why he was here. He desperately looked around to try and gauge his surroundings, but he could only see darkness. All he could think about was a pair of large eyes and an overwhelming fear of despair and anxiety and this weird gray fluid that was now floating in front of him. The Foundation listened as Jack started reciting a creepy speech about being on the edge of nothing, inches from oblivion, with a sickness in his mind and nothing but a pair of eyes in front of him. They listened in horror as they heard movement through the radio. It sounded like a huge creature was swimming toward the men. It had to be SCP-3000. But all three men were too confused to do anything about the situation or to even see what was in front of them. 
claiming they couldn't see anything in the darkness. There was silence for half a minute with the team listening in, fearing the worst. Then they heard some more unintelligible mutterings. The men must be alive, but what on earth was going on? Then the gibberish started again. Two of the men were screaming that Jack had just been swallowed whole and that they were being sucked in too. Why couldn't they just swim away? It was chaos. But then a few moments later, Roberto spoke into the radio, saying he was floating alone in the middle of the ocean and had now moved away from the eyes of SCP-3000. He finally seemed capable of forming coherent thoughts and speech. After what had just happened, Roberto now had a theory. He thought that somehow it was impossible to think straight around SCP-3000. When he'd been close enough to see the eyes, Roberto had felt a throbbing pain in his brain and been unable to think about anything. Perhaps it was something to do with that mysterious gray liquid. Even more slime was coming out of SCP-3000 now, and Roberto was determined to get a sample despite the warnings from HQ. In one final burst of motivation, he swam close enough to take some of the gray liquid and put it in a special sample collection unit that was designed to float to the surface for collection later. He had acquired some very important data, but he seemed to have lost all hope of preserving his life. Roberto started telling the team over the radio that he was dying and that his heart rate was too high, but cautioned that it would be too dangerous for anyone to try and rescue him. The personnel continued to try and communicate with Roberto to figure out what was going on, but his words had stopped making any sense until finally he went quiet. Minutes turned into hours, hours into days, and still there was no sign of Roberto or the rest of the divers. After three days, his radio, which had only been sending a steady stream of static, finally stopped working altogether and he was presumed dead. However, the sample Roberto had collected had survived and made it to the hands of the Foundation researchers. It turned out to be a viscous substance now known as Y909, a chemical compound and extremely strong anesthesia. Y909 causes head pain, paranoia, fear, panic, memory loss, and confusion, explaining what happened to Dr. Williams and the diving trio. The collection of Y909 might have resulted in two disastrous missions, but there's a silver lining as the substance ended up becoming an invaluable tool for the SCP Foundation. Its ability to make people forget what had just happened to them can be used to eliminate knowledge of threatening SCPs among the public. It also helps the Foundation staff cope with the traumatic experiences they encounter on their missions. Although other amnestics can be used for the same purpose, none are as powerful as the one produced by SCP-3000. Before its discovery, the amnestics used would break down too quickly, not fare well in storage or cause undesirable side effects. The only problem is the method of sourcing. The only way to obtain Y909 is somewhat ethically questionable for most people. SCP-3000 produces Y909 after eating, so the best way to stock up on it is by feeding the creature. Sedated D-Class personnel from the Foundation are sent on missions supposedly to observe the anomaly up close, unaware that this mission is one way only. Other divers are then sent later to collect the fluid from a safe distance and store it. Of course, it's all for the greater good of humanity. Now, the Foundation protects SCP-3000 as best as it can guard something hundreds of kilometers long. The area is carefully patrolled and members of the public are not allowed to enter the part of the bay where it resides. Anybody who accidentally comes into contact is contained. Eventually, another pair of Foundation doctors went down in a submarine to try and learn more about SCP-3000. One became so affected by Y909 that he began hallucinating. He started talking about Ananta Shesha, the king of serpents in Hinduism. Ananta Shesha is believed to be all that will be left after the end of the world because it exists throughout all of time simultaneously. The doctor said he believed that this was in fact Ananta Shesha, that SCP-3000 simply shows us that eventually everyone dies and fades into the darkness of oblivion, right before he exited the submarine and swam right into his mouth. Luckily for now, SCP-3000 seems to be in a sort of hibernation state. It rarely moves and it doesn't hunt, although it will eat when fed. But no one knows when or if it'll wake, or what it's capable of if it does. Will it destroy the world? or simply drive us all insane. 40 years ago, a U.S. Navy exploratory vessel landed on a chain of islands in the South Atlantic, just 2,000 miles off the coast of Argentina. In other words, the middle of nowhere. Yet on this far-off set of rocks afloat in the middle of the ocean, they discovered a vast array of strange wildlife and plant species that resemble little of what they left behind on the mainland. Could this be a treasure trove of undiscovered species, they wondered. Hoping to capitalize on the discovery, a reconnaissance team of researchers was sent out to explore some of the islands on foot, and what they found did not disappoint. From endangered species of birds to plant life and vegetation that looked like it belonged on Mars, 
they found a dizzying array of new and exciting examples of evolutionary oddities that would fill a library. But unfortunately, their jubilation was cut short. Attempting to collect soil samples, they dug into the ground and soon discovered that what they were standing on wasn't actually ground at all. The Navy scientists soon discovered the rocky terrain they were exploring was actually made up entirely of organic matter. As per the standard protocol, the SCP Foundation was forced to silence the U.S. Navy research vessel after its discovery. With the okay from the U.S. government, the ship was torpedoed and sunk to the bottom of the ocean with all hands on deck in the name of protecting the greater good of the masses. A tragedy at sea for the sake of preventing worldwide pandemonium. From there, the Foundation took over with the containment procedures of what would eventually come to be known as SCP-169, better known by its nickname, the Leviathan. The Leviathan is a biblical creature of mythical proportions, said to be able to boil the seas and create earth-ending floods with just a whip of its massive continent-spanning body. It is unclear if SCP-169 has the ability to do these things, though, given its massive size which Foundation researchers estimate to be somewhere between 2,000 and 8,000 kilometers. It's easy to see how something that big moving at any speed could be devastating for the coastal regions of the world. Although we use the word contain, it is impossible for SCP staff to ever contain something of such massive size. Surveillance and monitoring are about all we can do for now. That and hope it never wakes up and decides that we're on the menu. It was thought to be relatively smooth sailing, until one incident changed everything. Dr. Hart turned off the video monitor and faced the assembled members of MTF Gamma 6, also known as the Deep Feeders, renowned for their specialization in the tracking of deep sea and oceanic anomalies. The room was dark, and each team member was sitting in shadow, but still Dr. Hart could see the seriousness on their faces. I'm sure you're wondering why I called you here at such short notice he said. On the screen behind him, he put up a NASA satellite picture of a small set of rocky islands. You see this little island chain here? Well, it wasn't there a week ago. He paused, rubbing his forehead from lack of sleep. At 8.05 a.m. today, we recorded another auditory anomaly emitting from SCP-169. This one was much louder and longer than the one recorded in 1997 by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the one known as the Bloop. Back then, it was easy to brush off as some ice breaking off of a continental shelf and scraping against the seafloor. It's not so easy to cover up anymore. These auditory emissions from SCP-169 are beginning to grow more frequent. More than that, Increased seismic activity around the archipelago on the creature's back indicates that the rate at which the creature is breathing is also up. Typically, the rate at which the creature takes what we are assuming to be a breath is once every three months. The rate has increased to once every three weeks. For as long as we've been monitoring SCP-169, it's been adrift along the southern Atlantic, never moving more than a kilometer a week. That behavior is slowly beginning to change. It doesn't sound like much, but something that big even moving just a fraction of that faster means 100-foot tidal waves for the entire South American coastline. We fear the creature showing signs of waking up. If this is true, it could mean a cataclysm for the hundreds of nations around the world. Millions, hell, even billions could be wiped off the face of the Earth if this thing just flips its body too fast in the wrong direction. To put it to scale, this monster is about the size of the Caribbean, maybe even bigger as far as we know. The doctor then pulled out a decanter of whiskey and poured himself a glass, swallowing the entire pour in one go. In an appalling breach of workplace professionalism, seriously, an XK class under the world scenario is still no excuse for drinking on the job. We're talking about an extinction level event, a bona fide XK class under the world scenario. 1,000 foot tsunami waves stretching as far as the eye can see from either end of the horizon. The last time SCP-169 stirred, it created the Mediterranean. In fact, the legends of the biblical flood, Noah's Ark, the same story can be found in every civilization and culture around the world. So maybe they were onto something. It is to this end I call you all here, to save the world from the next great flood. He paused for a moment as the room took in the gravity of the situation. 
The more we can learn about SCP-169, the better. And right now, we know SWAT. For one, we've never seen just how deep the body of the creature goes, or what's under it. The pressure has been too great for our current model submarines, until now. After reinforcing our Nemo-1 deep-sea submersible with thaumaturgical runes, the integrity of its hull has increased exponentially. Your mission will be to travel as far down and as close to the creature as possible. If it breathes, then there must be gills or lungs. There must be some basic biological facts we need to understand if we're going to survive extinction. Our only recourse is to find a way to sedate the creature. And if that doesn't work, then... God help us all. Just 12 hours later, deep in the waters of the Southern Atlantic, a massive submersible ship was diving down into the depths of the deep ocean, looking for a way to stop the end of the world. Agent Jia 6-1, a member of Deep Feeders, looked out of the massive viewing port as the ship slowly descended alongside the rocky trench that made up the body of SCP-169. Behind him was Dr. Hart, sporting a white five o'clock shadow and a red nose from a night of drinking to calm his nerves. The entire crew were silent in awe as the giant floodlights of the ship brushed over the barnacle-covered surfaces of the undersea mountain. They progressed slowly, breaching each milestone in depth with caution, knowing that one wrong move could destabilize the pressure in their ship. Just 6-1 murmured the word, Scales. What? asked Dr. Hart. I've been watching the patterns of the ridges as we sink down. They look like scales giant segments. It's hard to see at first because they're so covered in barnacles and sediment, but I'm sure of it. They're giant, armored scales, the way lobsters or crabs have armored exoskeletons. Interesting, the doctor said, scratching his chin. Arthropods have segmented armored bodies, and this means we might be looking at some sort of evolutionary hybrid, some sort of aquatic mammal, such as a whale or dolphin, but one that has developed armored segment and scales similar to that of a crustacean. The doctor crossed his arms to think. The closest thing we have on the fossil record of this magnitude is an armored fish from the Cretaceous period, but even that's way too small to compare to this. This thing has an entire ecosystem on its back. How old is it? asked the agent. Well, now that you mention it, given the impossible age of the creature, an arthropod would make sense. Lobsters and other crustaceans don't age conventionally, you see. They are effectively immortal. In fact, they actually die because they continue to grow until their bodies can't hold up their humongous size anymore. And yet, SCP-169 just kept growing. The doctor trailed off, thinking to himself. Dr. Hart, still lost in thought, turned to walk to the back of the submersible as Jia 6-1 followed. He said as much to himself as to the agent, the creature is old. The geological survey conducted when SCP-169 was first discovered carbon dated the specimen to over 541 million years old. As you can probably surmise, that's too old for any living being. The results had to be incorrect and yet I checked them myself more than once. And numbers do not lie. The entity predates our civilization. Hell, it predates complex life forms on this planet as we know it. From an evolutionary standpoint, it doesn't make any sense. The agent, confused, asked, Doctor, how could something so big even come into existence? Very little of our planet is actually landmass. It's a wonder we call it Earth. Most of this planet is water. We aren't looking at a creature that's on our planet, agent. We are on its planet. Just then a flurry of alarms and sensors began to go off at the bridge of the ship. The team scrambled through their stations, checking off monitors and shouting readings to each other. The ship's thermal sensors are detecting a massive rise in temperature, transmitting power to cooling systems. We have activity northwest of our location. Sonar has something big headed our way. We need to dive now! The ship lurched forward, nose first, as everyone on board held onto their seats, the restraints keeping them from falling forward. Just outside of the viewing port, Dr. Hart could see an enormous scaled appendage moving fast in their location. We need to steer the ship clear of the talons. Revert all power to the thrusters. Get us out of the way, the doctor yelled. Don't you think I'm doing that? The captain shouted back. The ship jolted sideways and downwards as an immense wave of pressure came over the submersible, putting six Gs of force on its occupants. Zhe 6-1 yelped out of fear as the ship came close to crashing into what appeared to be the edge of a titanic talon the size of the Empire State Building. Following the encounter, 
the part of the ship bordering the reinforced glass of the viewing port began to glow bright red. It's boiling the water around us! One of the crew members cried out. It's not boiling anything, it's just cavitation due to the pressure reduction in the water. The updated runes on the ship's hull should keep us safe, we just need to cool our heads. Stay focused on the mission, bottom feeders. After several moments of holding their breaths, the crew of Nima 1 began to relax as their pace returned to a slow descent along the side of the underwater behemoth. Before long, the vessel was no longer traveling straight down, but starting to curve under the creature, traveling north towards the theoretical head of SCP-169. After several hours, the ship came upon giant fissures in the rocky exterior of the creature. These massive vent-like structures appeared stiff, but slowly they opened and closed over the span of weeks. These were the respiratory organs of the organism. Clocking in at over two miles underneath the surface of the ocean, the crew carefully began entering the smaller pod-like submersibles that detached from their main ship. Je 6-1 entered his pod and strapped on the haptic gloves that would give him control of the pod's robotic arms. He and a team of three other volunteers had agreed to undergo the dangerous mission of attaching artificial chemical emission machines that could be programmed to release anesthetic gas into SCP-169's respiratory system on command remotely. The emission machines could be refueled manually whenever the contents ran out. It was an ingenious solution Dr. Hart came up with when thinking of his time studying sharks as a marine biologist. They would tag the fins of sharks by capturing them and bringing the specimens on the deck of their boat. From there, the scientist would drill a radio frequency emitter onto the fin of the shark. When he had first seen this practice as a young college student, Dr. Hart was afraid the process was harming the shark, but later he learned it was designed in a way to not be harmful to the specimen, and eventually the tag would fall off after enough data on the shark's movement was collected. Except these tags would not be falling off, he thought. They could not. For the sake of all mankind, this had to work. The doctor pressed a button on the receiver of the radio and spoke. Je 6 1, what's your status? Pressure's holding, all signs look good. Je 6 2, pressure's holding, all good. Je 6 3, all clear, Captain. Je 6 4, there was silence. Je 6 4, do you copy? <clears throat> all clear, Doc. Sorry, my mic was muted. On route and ready to do this thing. Dr. Hart sighed in relief and slowly reclined in his chair watching the pods move closer to the large openings on SCP-169's side. One by one, the robotic arms used underwater torches to drill into the thick, rock-like exoskeleton of the creature, screwing in complex million-dollar equipment that was both waterproof and could withstand the immense pressure at such a depth under the ocean. As the minutes turned to hours, Dr. Hart couldn't help but feel anxiety for the safety of his crew and the success of the mission. But before long, the pods began to return one by one to the mothercraft, each completing the segment of work with which they were tasked. The last pod still working was just 6-1, whose robotic arm was in the process of rotating a large industrial-sized screw. Just 6-1 had all but finished, when suddenly a low rumble could be felt shaking the larger submersible. Dr. Hart's voice came crackling over the radio. Get back to the ship now! Je 6-1, wrapped in deep focus on his task, replied, I'm just about finished, just packing up my tool belt. Leave it. Return to the ship now. That's an order. Jesus, what's wrong? It's not like this is the end of the world, said the agent, chuckling over his radio. An ear-piercing echo sent shockwaves through the depths of the ocean around the submersible. The waves rumbled with the sound of SCP-169's voice, similar to the sound of a large whale, but amplified by a million. The sound sent all the crew members falling to the floor as the ship experienced severe damage from the burst of pressure, slightly cracking the glass viewport and sending smoke flooding into the small bridge of the ship. Gas masks! shouted Dr. Hart as they all donned breathing apparatus. SCP-169 is waking up. Begin activation of the chemical emission machines. We need to sedate it now. The Leviathan is waking up. We need to stop it, shouted Dr. Hart. Just then, he looked back and noticed Je 6-1's pod was gone. Je 6-1, what's your position? Je 6-1, where are you? Sir, Sonna has him drifting off deeper into the ocean behind us. He must have gotten knocked off SCP-169 by the shockwave. But Dr. Hart wouldn't have it. He didn't want any more blood on his hands. Reverse thrusters, turn us around and get to him. We're not losing anyone. But the breach in the hull! It'll hold, that's what the runes are for. 
The outside of the submersible began to glow a slight blue as the ship's system started to come back online to full capacity, and alarm systems started to turn off and report normal pressure readings. Before long, the Nemo-1 had caught up to Zhe 6-1's pod and retrieved the agent, who had been knocked unconscious by the shockwave. Once the agent was back on the main ship, the doctor turned his attention back to the monitors, making sure the installations they drilled into the creature were functional. Slowly, the machines came online to full power, and the speed at which SCP-169 had been moving began to slow ever so slightly. The team all watched the viewport in silence as a steady stream of anesthetic gas was pumped into the respiratory system of the gigantic living myth in front of them. After a few moments of waiting, the doctor spoke. I think it worked, he said with a smile. The crew erupted in cheers as they radioed control back up on land that the mission had been a success. The message quickly reached the O5 Council, where a red alert status was de-escalated, and the O5 members withdrew from their plan of leaving the current Earth for that of an alternate universe. The whole crew began to sing and celebrate the prevention of the end of the world, as Dr. Hart simply stood in front of the massive viewport, watching the mountainous specimen slowly grow smaller in the distance as the submersible began ascending back to the world above. Zhe 6-1 came over to congratulate him, patting him on the back. We did it! he said. Loosen up! The doctor managed to laugh along in acknowledgement. That we did, he said in relief. That we did. The two watched the deep blue ocean in silence, taking in the vastness of the sea. Perhaps this would not be the end of it, but that day, they had done what the SCP Foundation did best. Kick that apocalyptic can a few miles down the road. And sometimes, in the face of the terrifying and the infinite, that's really the best you can do. If you've ever taken a vacation to one of the many islands of Greece, then you'll know why the likes of Crete, Lesbos, and Corfu are famous for their beautiful beaches. But there is one beach in particular, tucked away in a corner of an unknown island, that you might think twice about visiting. Why? Well, the same reasons that this place happens to be a site of great interest for the SCP Foundation also tend to drive tourists away. Today, we're talking about SCP-2217, the strange anomalous happenings that have taken place there, and how it links to none other than one of the Foundation's most infamous groups of interest. At first glance, SCP-2217 is an ordinary, uninteresting beach, just another pretty, picturesque view on a Greek island. It looks like the kind of place that would be perfect for a romantic walk at sunset but we wouldn't recommend it. Although you wouldn't know just from looking at it, the sand that this beach is composed of has some pretty peculiar properties. It contains the ordinary non-anomalous things you'd find in sand anywhere else in the world, normal levels of silicates and calcium compounds. But the beach also possesses a high concentration of cationic metallic particles. These tiny, almost microscopic metal fragments somehow hold an electrical charge despite being grounded. So it's a beach with partially metal sand. Nothing too unusual there, right? Wrong. The metallic particles within the sand seem to have a profound effect on the natural environment around SCP-2217. For one, the metal content of the beach influences the weather, increasing the number of lightning strikes that hit the shore. The metals draw the static electricity in the atmosphere. This along with other weather conditions and natural processes that take place at SCP-2217 also have a far more obvious anomalous effect. Lightning, rain, even fish washed up and decaying on the shoreline have all caused various artificial structures and devices to rise from the beach, which have all been designated by the Foundation as SCP-2217-1. Among the creations found on the beach in the wake of lightning strikes are a number of different forms of machinery. These have included simple clocks and other timepieces to complicated automatons. These machines have no notable anomalous properties as far as the SCP Foundation has found, apart from the way they came to be, and they are otherwise fully functional. Also discovered at SCP-2217 was jewelry, seeming to be made of discarded waste that washed up on the beach in the tide, resembling bears and other recurring motifs of a certain religion. These articles of jewelry have been made using everything from old light bulbs to hulls of ships and even fish and animal bones. Most notably, however, was the appearance of a city 
or rather a model of a city that was created at the beach and was then referred to as SCP-2217-A1. There is a cliff located on SCP-2217, and if one is to swim through an underwater entrance, they will find themselves inside a grotto. There, somehow carved by tidal erosion of the rock, is a recreation of an ancient Greek city. Although the geographical features of the model seem to resemble an area near Lake Baikal in southern Siberia, the city bears more of the same religious iconography to the jewelry that can often be found on the beach. But which religion? The same one that considers SCP-2217 to be a site of holy importance. The Church of the Broken God. Now, some important context to make note of. For any who are unaware, the Church of the Broken God is a religious organization that the SCP Foundation has had a number of encounters with over the years. Members of the Church share in their belief that biological, flesh-based life is inherently wrong, an abomination, even evil. This religion worships mechanization, the process of making something or someone more mechanical in nature. According to the beliefs of the Church, there were two gods, Yaldabaoth and Mekane, who created humanity together. Yaldabaoth was a god of flesh and animal instinct, granting human bodies. Meanwhile, the god of machine and intellect, Mekane, blessed man with the power of free thought. As humankind developed its civilizations by building machines, Yaldabaoth became enraged that they were ignoring the instincts she had bestowed upon them. She endeavored to destroy the creations of man in an attempt to revert them to the animals she had intended them to be. As the church's legend goes, Mekane acted as humanity's savior and tried desperately to stop Yaldabaoth. The god of machines shattered himself transforming his body into a number of pieces to form a cage for his fellow god. Fragments of Mekane rained down on planet Earth. Now, the Church of the Broken God believes it is their duty to recover these missing parts and put their savior back together. Within the religion of the Church of the Broken God, there exists a splinter faction that broke away from the main church. This group, referred to as the Broken Church, are the ones that regard SCP-2217 so highly, considering it to be a holy site. According to a piece of scripture from their religion, the Broken Church believes the beach to be Mekane's workshop. The Book of Rites describes the legend of a boy looking out at the ocean with his family and seeing fire rain down on the shore, sent from God, or Mekane, to the church. Mekane apparently proclaimed that the beach was his workshop, where he made many wonders. The lightning is my hammer, the earth my anvil, the sand my ingot. Mekane explained to the boy, so the legend goes, and invited the child into his workshop. The broken god brought his hammer down on the boy, but instead of killing him, marked him as the first of the religion the broken church now follows. In 2014, the SCP Foundation recorded an earthquake taking place at SCP-2217, with the grotto containing the model of the ancient Greek city at the epicenter. Sending a robotic probe into the grotto to assess the damage, only to find a surprising change that had occurred. For the first time, there were a number of humanoid figures seen within SCP-2217-A1. And worse still, they were under attack. Within the model city, what appeared to be a number of individuals infected with SCP-610 were ransacking buildings, devouring and infecting the other humanoid figures. Also known as the flesh that hates, SCP-610 is a contagious skin disease. It is usually transmitted by direct skin-to-skin -skin contact and anyone that is infected with it suffers a horrific mutation that transforms them into fleshy, inhuman monstrosities. These infected creatures will attack and infect anyone nearby that isn't also carrying SCP-610. Interestingly, the disease was first discovered to be localized to a small area in Siberia, not dissimilar to the area that the SCP-2217-A1 model resembled. According to some sources, SCP-610 is the flesh, described by those following the religion of Sarcasism, a cult that worships flesh and disease. Sarcasism is a sect that directly opposes and antagonizes the machine-revering church of the Broken God. Three years after the earthquake, members of the Broken Church staged an attack on the beach, hoping to reclaim SCP-2217 for their religion. At the time, the SCP Foundation had closed off the area to the public, 
under the cover story that SCP-2217 was private property. They had been hoping to predict the lightning strikes that caused the anomalous devices to form on the beach. Instead, the Foundation had to repel the Broken Church's attackers any way they could. However, as the lightning began to strike again, members of Foundation personnel that found themselves caught in it seemed to change sides, all stating that God needs to be reassembled. Only a year later in 2018, another group of Broken Church zealots stormed the beach and the Foundation outpost located there. This time, the church seemed to have gained further reinforcements, specifically members of other groups of interest. In particular, some belonging to the Church of Maxwellism and the Cogwork Orthodox Church, both of which were also splinter groups of the Church of the Broken God. The Cogwork Orthodox Church arose during the Industrial Revolution, believing that adding mechanical parts to their own bodies offered greater understanding of Mekane and brought them closer to their god. Maxwellism, in a similar vein, had another interpretation of the Church's core beliefs, favoring smaller, more advanced cybernetic implants. The Church of Maxwellism sought to modify their brains to become a collective consciousness and commune with Mekane. Despite a lot of pre-existing animosity between the three core splinter groups of the Church, they were able to successfully capture SCP-2217. The three factions sent a video message to the Foundation proclaiming the importance of their mission. Oh, disassemblers who call themselves a Foundation, what are you a Foundation for? If you are a Foundation for life, then you will let us keep this land. For the flesh is coming, and only we can stop it. We need to bring our God back together immediately, or else you will all perish. And now it is time. If you are a Foundation for life, you will not let this happen. You will let us defeat the flesh. Several more messages were sent to the Foundation, demanding the release of various SCPs with connection to the Broken God. You see, there could potentially be hundreds of pieces needed to rebuild Mekain so he can lead the Church to glory and defeat Yaldaba. A number of these pieces happen to be catalogued SCPs, and the Foundation is either aware of or has in containment. These include SCP-882, or His Broken Heart, to the Church. SCP-271, His Broken Gift. SCP-813, His Broken Eyes. SCP-1139, His Broken Tongue. SCP-635, His Broken Mind. And finally, His Broken Blood, which refers to SCP-217. With the beach under the control of the Church of the Broken God, any Foundation personnel left alive on SCP-2217 defected and joined the Church. In order to retake the beach and re-establish containment, the Foundation was forced to do something that they only do in the most dire of circumstances. Ask for help. Together with the Horizon Initiative and Global Occult Coalition, the SCP Foundation established what it called the Triumvirate, a joint task force. In 2019, another earthquake was detected this time in Lake Baikal, Siberia, where SCP-610 was contained. Not long after, infected individuals were reported to be attacking Foundation forces in the area, causing heavy casualties. But then an unlikely event took place. Members of the Church of the Broken God appeared, their bodies augmented with machinery. These zealots that had fought the Foundation for control of SCP-2217 were now coming to its aid to repel SCP-610. According to them, God, or rather Mekane, had told them to come to assist the Foundation. Using a large-scale electrical discharge, instances of the SCP-610 contagion were eradicated. But this discharge seemed to have originated from the same island where SCP-2217 was found. Following this incident, Robert Brumero, the leader of the Broken Church, sent a video message to the leaders of the Triumvirate, including the O5 Council, the Director of the Global Code Coalition, and the Horizon Initiative's Tribunal. In his message, Bumero stated, It's not too late, you know. This is our world as well. We both want the flesh to end, and we can help you. We can help each other. Come to the anvil. We will talk, and we can save this world. The Church of the Broken God, its splinter groups uniting to take SCP-2217 for their religion, were now extending an olive branch to the Foundation and its allies, all in the name of protecting the world. Shortly after, the Foundation, Global Cult Coalition, and Horizon Initiative began working collaboratively with the Church of the Broken God to prepare for an XK-class scenario. Retaking control of the SCP-2217 beach for now 
The Foundation intends to revoke this current arrangement after the dangerous scenario has been averted. But perhaps McCain's workshop will provide vital in reassembling the broken god and saving humanity should Yaldabaoth ever return to exact her terrible revenge. The year is 1985, 16th of February. A pair of researchers aboard a model SM-03 deep-sea submersible are descending into the depths of the Atlantic Ocean. Hours ago, they were somewhere just off the coast of France, surrounded by blue sky, the smell of the sea, and the warm embrace of the sun. But now, only cold darkness surrounds them. The depth of the ocean so vast and overwhelming, even light could not escape its grasp. The two-man team are members of MTF Gamma-6, also known as the Deep Feeders, a special task force that specializes in the investigation and tracking of deep sea or oceanic anomalies. Their mission, to locate and investigate the wreckage of a World War II German warship known as the Bismarck, thought by the general public to have gone down in the naval battle with the British in 1941. But the story the public doesn't know is the real reason the pair of Foundation members were tasked with locating the ship's wreckage site. Unfortunately for these researchers, today would be remembered for something far worse than they had anticipated. Radio transmissions recorded by the Gamma 6 duo detailed the events that took place upon finding the Bismarck, designated SCP-4217. The Bismarck lay at the bottom of the ocean partially submerged in the sea floor, but to the astonishment of researchers, it appeared to be perfectly intact, with no signs of damage from its previous naval engagements. Gamma 6 member Charles Miller comments, even after the better part of five decades, this ship is still in pristine condition. There is no water damage anywhere that I can see. Even stranger, no ocean sediment has accumulated on the hull of the ship whatsoever. Prompted to investigate closer, Agent Victor Miller begins operation of the crew's model RV-1 marine probe an unmanned robotic exploratory drone that allows the researchers to explore the interior of the ship's wreckage. What they found unnerved them, or better said, what they didn't find. Just as the outside of the vessel appeared free of any corrosion or wear, the interior of the ship was just as immaculate. The hallways were clean, the walls adorned freshly painted signs in still legible German, even the Nazi symbols painted onto command centers still held no sign of disintegration. It was as if the ship had just come off the assembly line. But strangest of all was the lack of skeletal remains. At the time it was sunk, the original crew of the Bismarck boasted a minimum of 2,000 men. Where were the bodies? Continuing the mission, the researchers piloted their unmanned drone down the eerie winding corridors. Along several of the inner corridors of the submerged wreckage of SCP-4217, the crew find large, thick walls of what appear to be made out of a rubber-like substance. Soon they find that the large vein-like growths extend throughout the interior of the ship-like tendrils, growing in size the closer the exploratory drone gets to the center of the vessel. All the while, a slight hum sound is picked up by the craft's sonar equipment, echoing from the center of the ship, a rhythmic pulsing. The crew decide they need to take a sample of the rubber-like substance back to Foundation headquarters for testing. This would be a mistake. Upon cutting into the thick tentacle-like growths, the researchers notice something that fills their stomachs with dread. Whatever substance they had cut into, was now bleeding. The team hears a distant rumble growing steadily louder. Suddenly, the ship begins to move. Shuffling sand and debris strew along the seafloor, clouding the visibility of the ship. Terrified, the pair hurried to try and disconnect the cable attaching the probe to their submersible and evacuate the site. But it's too late. A booming thud shakes the underwater craft as a large shadow covers the glass window of the submersible. Alarm systems go off as cracks start to appear in the glass surface. The pair attempt to pilot the vessel up towards the surface, but they are halted by a strong force pulling them downward. Just as the cracks start to spread across the surface of the glass, a giant shadow looms over the submersible. What? What is that? Screams and the sound of shattering glass can be heard on the recording as the submersible implodes from the pressure of the watery depths. Since that unfortunate incident, Foundation members have recorded multiple occurrences of SCP-4217 attacking civilian cargo ships in the Atlantic, particularly off the coast of the United Kingdom and as far north as the Greenland Sea. 
Given its Keter containment classification, containment of SCP-4217 consists of constant monitoring by Foundation naval forces with the cooperation of the British Royal Navy. In episodes of aggression or an agitated or hostile state, naval forces are instructed to forcibly subdue SCP-4217 through naval engagement. Once enough damage is sustained, SCP-4217 enters a passive state and resubmerges. SCP-4217 is divided into two parts. SCP-4217-A is the Bismarck itself, a Nazi-era warship outfitted with an array of eight main guns, 44 secondary armaments, and dozens of units of anti-aircraft weaponry. SCP-4217-B refers to the anomalous cephalopod organism embedded inside the hull of the ship. SCP-4217-B has two large rectangular pupils inside of octopod eyes that protrude from the base of the ship, as well as 12 100 to 200 meter long tendril-like muscular appendages that extend outward from an opening in the stern of the vessel. SCP-4217 is deemed to be classification risk class dangerous with reports of it emitting a mild psionic field within a 20-kilometer radius, confusing anything within range and increasing the likelihood of friendly fire among enemy combatants. SCP-4217-A's hull seems to have the ability of inorganic regeneration, as damage incurred from enemy vessels seems to immaculately repair over time. Researchers have observed what appears to be runes or cryptic markings oh. on the side of SCP-4217-A's hull. It is believed these symbols were part of the original ship's design to bolster the vessel's defense integrity. Though not immediately visible, when the vessel is taking fire, the symbols appear to glow in proportion to the amount of damage being mitigated. Among its offensive capabilities, apart from the standard armaments of a World War II-era warship, SCP-4217-A also has specialized munitions of an unidentifiable gas compound that is reported to have mutagenic properties. Individuals that have been exposed to the gas compound undergo rapid, spontaneous metamorphosis at a molecular level, growing an array of evolutionary attributes, which include the accumulation of reptile-like scales, or avian feathers, in place of skin, the increase or decrease of the number of limbs, digits, or even ocular, olfactory, or auditory organs, and in one reported case, an event where multiple members of one crew were fused at a subatomic level into one functioning organism. The more study into this particular incident is needed. SCP-4217 also has the ability of subsurface oceanic mobility and can submerge itself when not in combat with enemy vessels. Underwater propulsion appears to be generated by the ejection of water from SCP-4217-B's body cavity and reaches a top speed of approximately 30 knots. SCP-4217 undergoes cycles of passive behavior that is periodically interrupted by moments of hostility towards civilian craft, particularly resurfacing and going after transatlantic cargo vessels. It is believed this is analogous to the history and original mission of the Bismarck, Operation Rheinenbung. During World War II, the German Luftwaffe was besieging London in a series of nightly air raids that would be colloquially known as the Blitz. It was the grand intention of the Third Reich to cut off supplies to the British to limit their resistance to the Nazi war machine. However, what pestered the Nazis most and hindered this effort was the consistent American support provided by the US government in the form of food and supplies delivered to the British via Atlantic trade routes by cargo ship. The German Bismarck and her sister ship, the Tirpitz, were created for the very goal of stopping these transports of cargo to the United Kingdom, as well as sinking as many Allied vessels as possible. The year is 1937. In a top-secret effort to make preparations for an approaching war, Adolf Hitler turns to his most trusted expert on the supernatural, Chief SS Officer Heinrich Himmler. Among other projects, Himmler ordered the Anerbe Obscurocorps, a German organization tasked with the procurement and investigation of otherworldly or otherwise unexplainable phenomena to begin the creation of two ships, the Bismarck and the Tirpitz, the former named after the Iron Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, who in 1890 unified the German people. These vessels were to be created using recently uncovered technological oddities the Obscura Corps had found in their studies of the occult. Sources of information about the exact creation of SCP-4217 are highly expunged from the record, but bits and pieces did survive, 
among what little the Foundation was able to collect, and in the records of the USSR after their occupation of Eastern Germany, following the fall of the Nazi regime during the Second World War. The earliest mention of SCP-4217's conception dates back to early 1937, when a top-secret shipment of unknown materials labeled Components of Thaumatological Constructs is intercepted by a Foundation agent working undercover in a German shipment center outside of Hamburg. The Foundation agent, Marcus Straub, is instructed to maintain surveillance on the shipment. In 1939, upon near completion of the soon-to-be-christened Bismarck, a second shipment labeled with the insignia of the Obscura Corps is intercepted by the Foundation agent, only this shipment appears unlike any other. Reports of the massive shipping container holding machinery capable of aquatic life support indicate organic living cargo. Though the Foundation agent was unable to identify the exact nature of the contents of the shipment, Straub reported hearing sounds emanating from the cargo hold, sounds similar to that of a heartbeat. Just a year later, the Bismarck is seen making its first naval trial run when it experiences a massive electrical discharge just offshore, shutting the vessel down momentarily until power was restored shortly after. Reports show luminescent symbols briefly visible on the hull of the ship, Thaumatological symbols, for the layman, are symbols that embodied the study of miracles. Because of this, it was apparent to the Foundation that some occult anomaly was responsible for the strange characteristics of the German vessel, and an order for termination was reached by the O5 Council, the hunt for SCP-4217. In the autumn of 1940, under orders of neutralization of SCP-4217, all active Foundation agents presiding in Germany were ordered to converge on the site of the Bismarck to stop the completion of the vessel. But when the time came for the operation, every single one of the Foundation agents vanished. No records of what happened were ever found, no clothing, notes, not even a trace of their existence was left behind. The mission was deemed a failure, and subsequent attempts to neutralize SCP-4217 became far more difficult after the Bismarck received a full crew of seamen. The fully manned and well-equipped SCP-4217 became a menace to both military and civilian craft on the high seas of the Atlantic, at times appearing without warning, seemingly out of thin air. SCP-4217's psionic field obscured it from the new technological advancements in enemy radar systems the U.S. government had in development. The ship became a shadow on the Atlantic, a subject of ghost stories for anyone daring to assist the British government with the war effort. Furthermore, SCP-4217 did not seem to be content with the surrender of enemy vessels. Captured enemy ships were gassed, turning the men into manufactured beasts and then sinking the enemy vessels to the depths of the ocean. Even submarines were no match, on one report describing an attempt to elude the vessel by diving below the surface, only to be entangled by enormous squid-like appendages that dragged the craft back up to the surface before crushing it in its grasp. Fearing the safety of the public, the O5 Council decided they could not stand by and let more innocent lives be taken. They voted to supersede the Foundation's policy on absolute secrecy to notify the British government of the danger SCP-4217 posed to maritime civilians. With cooperation from the British Royal Navy, Foundation representatives joined the crew of HMS Hood and HMS Prince of Wales to track reports of the Bismarck being sighted off the coast of Scandinavia. In what history books would come to know as the Battle of Denmark Strait, HMS Hood and HMS Prince of Wales engaged SCP-4217 and a secondary German warship known as the Prinz Jürgen. Confused by the ship's psionic field, the British naval ships experienced trouble identifying the Bismarck and engage in friendly fire before being able to regain control of their armaments, concentrating all volley of fire on SCP-4217. The attack proves futile, as after the embers and smoke of munitions fire wear off, the sides of the Bismarck's hull appear to vibrate with glowing energy. Mangled metal begins to straighten back into perfect frame, breaches and armor begin to heal before the soldiers' very eyes, and all that is left as evidence the ship had ever taken fire is a cloud of steam emanating from the hull of SCP-4217. The water surrounding the vessel begin to boil as underwater tentacles lurch out and capture the HMS Hood, dragging Her Majesty's ship forward. The men aboard frantically try to regain control, but seconds later are met with another crisis. A salvo of artillery shells fired from SCP-4217's guns hit the ship, severing lines and damaging railguns as a mutagenic gas compound starts to spread among the royal seamen. In mere minutes, 
The majority of the crew are engulfed in toxic fumes and experience vomiting and convulsions, their bodies undergoing rapid involuntary mutagenesis, including the growth of limbs, the development of fur, feathers, and scales. In one report, it was said that multiple victims even fused together to create one single horrifying entity. Those exposed to the gaseous compound were designated SCP-4217-1. The captain of the HMS Hood barricades himself inside the helm, but the resulting instances of SCP-4217-1 overpower the ship and neutralize command. In the seconds that follow, any witness of the horror that the men aboard the HMS Hood experienced is forever entombed in the watery grave of the British vessel, as the ship is sunk by a volley of munitions fire from the combined might of the German fleet. Some men attempting to jump overboard and swim to safety are dragged down by their legs by the mutated instances of SCP-4217 and pulled under, lungs filling with seawater, as they scream until their breath is no more. In disbelief, the crew of HMS Prince of Wales decides to retreat. In the days that followed, at the bequest of Foundation members, the British Royal Navy launches a full-scale armada to hunt down and neutralize the Bismarck. Though SCP-4217 sustained little damage in the previous encounter, the ship began leaking a black, oil-like substance thought by SCP researchers to be an organic waste product of SCP-4217-B. The Allied naval forces are able to follow the trail to the coast of France, where under the lead of HMS King George V, British warships surround the German vessel and open fire. This time, they were ready. With approval from the O5 Council, Foundation members provide the British forces with enhanced munitions and armament capable of overwhelming SCP-4217's thaumatological defenses. On the eve of battle, it appears to the Allied forces that the psionic field generated by SCP-4217 is too great, as the naval company find it difficult to land targeted assaults on the German vessel. After losing several smaller vessels to the colossal appendages of SCP-4217, Foundation members on board authorize the use of a redacted SCP. It is brought in to deactivate SCP-4217's psionic field. The tide of the battle turns, and after a fierce battle, SCP-4217 becomes immobile and unable to return fire. Relentless, the British continue their bombardment until the artillery munitions on the ship explode into a giant fireball, flooding the ship's compartments with the noxious fumes of the mutagenic compound. Its crew members either jump overboard or are engulfed in the cloud of gas. The British vessels capture any survivors and watch as SCP-4217 slowly sinks below the waves, down to the depths of the ocean where it would lay dormant for the next 48 years. SCP-4217's 121 surviving crew members were captured and interrogated. Most of the low-ranking German soldiers were released to British custody, 109 of them having their memory wiped by Foundation staff. Twelve remaining members of the crew were sent to Site-23 for further detention and advanced interrogation, and 74 of the instances of SCP-4217-1, the mutated subjects, were recovered and sent to Site-23 for further observation. It was thought that on that day, SCP-4217 was deemed neutralized and no longer a matter of priority. The Bismarck sunk into memory and myth. It was only until the recent resurgence of SCP-4217 that the Foundation saw the need to collect as much information on the organism inhabiting SCP-4217-A as possible. Decades-old manuscripts and ledgers were pulled from hundreds of viable sources. From the intelligence then gathered, Foundation members have come to the hypothesis that the entity powering the vessel known as the Bismarck has what is believed to be extraplanetary origin. World War II-era documents uncovered between Commander Karl Reuter of the German Obscurocor and a Dr. Hans Meyer indicate a discovery of an organic life form of unknown origin found in a crashed aircraft near Feldberg Park in the Black Forest mountain range in Germany. Further correspondence with Obscuracore members Otto Schmidt and Dietrich Klossner indicate that researchers were conducting trials on the creature's ability to create psionic fields and to control or confuse enemy subjects within its range, with a letter from Dietrich Klossner suggesting the creature could be used as a power source for an unspecified engine. Further evidence of SCP-4217-B's extraplanetary origin can be found in a 1993 incident between Foundation naval ship SCPS Nemed and SCP-4217. This is the only incident on record 
where contact was established with the creature classified as SCP-4217-B. On July 22nd, SCP-4217 had reappeared off the coast of Britain. Anticipating hostility, SCPS Nemed, SCPS Cesare, and SCPS Partholon were instructed to close in on SCP-4217's location with orders to subdue the vessel if necessary. However, on this occasion, SCP-4217 did not appear to be after any vessel. It was simply drifting along at sea, no propulsion engines active. Noticing the change in SCP-4217's behavior, Captain Kurt Wegner decided to withhold military engagement and investigate SCP-4217's behavior. Sailing within 200 meters of the Bismarck, the SCPS Nemed attempted radio contact with the German vessel. After repeated attempts at communication, the crew were met with only silence and static chatter. Giving up, Captain Wagner puts down the radio receiver when suddenly, the sound of music is heard playing over the speakers of a ship. The tune is the national anthem of Nazi Germany. The captain hails the vessel again, repeating his attempts at communication. Do you, do you understand me? At first, only static can be heard. Then came a reply. You, ship. The ominous voice could be heard from the speakers. The captain hesitated for a moment, members of the crew looking at each other with apprehension. The captain replied, confirming themselves as a ship and then asking if SCP-4217 knew what it was and where it came from. What followed was the crew of the SCPS Nemed receiving a video feed from SCP-4217, featuring a high volume of images in rapid succession. Among them were images of German cities, Adolf Hitler's telecast of the 1936 Olympics, an unknown structure in outer space, and in increasing repetition, images of the planet Jupiter, particularly the giant storm on Jupiter known to the public as the Great Red Spot, or SCP-2399, as Foundation members know it. The transcript of the radio communication between Captain Wagner and SCP-2417 stops when the video feed begins to focus heavily on images of Jupiter. SCP-4217's responses become more erratic and agitated as it repeats the words storm, cloud, and red. The markings on its hull beginning to light up and the underwater shadows of its tentacles beginning to create whirlpools of displacement under the bow of the ship. A shrill shrieking begins to flood out of the speakers, followed by a high-piercing, high-pitched beeping sound that overloads the communication equipment causing sparks to fly as crew members cover their ears and hide under control panels. The SCPS Nemed barely escapes as SCP-4217 becomes hostile, using its massive tendril-like appendages to assail the naval combatants, firing its armament in all directions. After a fierce battle, the Foundation naval forces were able to neutralize and subdue SCP-4217. No further attempts at communication have been recorded. To keep the veil of secrecy, Foundation members constructed a replica ship to be sunk and intentionally rediscovered by oceanographer Robert Ballard in 1989. Any recent sightings of the Nazi-era Bismarck are flagged as misidentification by SCP staff. For now, Foundation members continue to monitor the behavior of SCP-4217 and protect the public from its existence. Imagine this. You're a researcher with an interest in and an aptitude for marine biology. Over the years, your work has taken you far and wide, to the furthest corners of the Earth's oceans. You've observed countless species of sea life, from fish and crustaceans to whales and sharks, predators and prey alike. During one of your travels, you find yourself off the coast of South Africa, monitoring the local population of sea creatures. Looking out across the water, you see a large, dark shape moving below the surface. There is a shadow streaking its way towards your vessel, dark as night, speeding like a torpedo. You rush across the deck, leaning over the port side as the shape swims beneath your boat. You're certain you know what it was. After all your years studying the world beneath the waves, you know a whale shark when you see one. The largest known species of fish still in existence, the whale shark is a filter feeder, consisting on a diet of plankton and other tiny aquatic organisms. A whale shark poses absolutely no threat to humans, or rather any whale shark other than this one would impose a threat. But how could you know that? Scanning the water, you strain your eyes, trying to spot what you assumed was an ordinary whale shark swimming below. But there is nothing 
No sign of it anywhere. Sighing, you think you might have missed your chance to see one in the wild. Perhaps it changed direction, instead of swimming under the boat, you tell yourself. The ship turns and starts making its way back towards the small harbor, leaving you blissfully unaware that there's an extra passenger on board. As you disembark, you notice something on the side of the boat. Emblazoned on the hull is a motif of a familiar shape, a whale shark depicted entirely in painted dots. You stare at it for a moment, intrigued by the pattern. It reminds you of a piece you once saw, an aboriginal Australian style of dot art. You're a little taken aback by the coincidence, having briefly spotted a whale shark while out at sea earlier, blissfully unaware that this painting marks your first encounter with SCP-1449, known more colloquially as the Dreamtime Whale Shark. In fact, you're so amused by seeing the whale shark earlier, only to find one painted here on the boat that it distracts you. You don't realize that the whale shark painting hadn't been on the side of the boat when you'd shipped out. Instead, you pay the crew and thank the captain for letting you hire the vessel for your research and then head off. By the time you make it back to the nearby town and settle down in after a long day on the water, the dotted painting of the whale shark has already slipped from your mind. But as you begin drifting off and everything goes dark, you're about to find out that your encounter with the Dreamtime Whale Shark is only just beginning. You've never been a heavy sleeper and rarely remember your dreams. Any that you might have seem to pass out of your head the moment you wake up or are too faint for you to acknowledge while you're sleeping. But tonight is different. Tonight, you're dreaming vividly. In this dream, water surrounds you like it has your whole career. But this time, you're underneath the surface, adrift in an empty ocean, nothing around you but endless blank sea. You feel something in your hand, something smooth and moving gently like organic matter, something alive. You find yourself gripping the tail of a whale shark, and somehow, as is often the way with dreams, you know that this is the same whale shark from earlier that day. The one that swam up to your boat and ended up sticking on the side of it as a dot art painting. SCP-1449 has this latent ability. While it normally appears as a flat, two-dimensional piece of aboriginal Australian dot art, the Dreamtime Whale Shark can shift whenever it is underwater. It still appears as a collection of painted dots in this unmistakable shape of a whale shark, but in an aquatic environment, it becomes three-dimensional. And that's what you'd seen swimming towards the boat not just a whale shark, but SCP-1449. Within your dream, you release the Dreamtime whale shark's tail and begin to float upwards. Breaking the surface of the water, you breathe lungfuls of fresh air. The first thing you see is land, and it's close by, close enough for you to swim to shore. Paddling through the water, you reach an island, one in a chain of small land masses, tiny continents in a shallow, unfamiliar ocean. You look back to the water, but can find no sign of SCP-1449. The Dreamtime Whale Shark has brought you here and left you on this island, but you can only speculate as to why. There must be a reason, you insist to yourself. The dreamscape around you, it would seem, is either the creation of SCP-1449 or at the very least a side effect of falling asleep close by to where you saw the Dreamtime Whale Shark in its painted form. Whatever this place is, there must be some way to uncover an answer. It stands to reason, you think, that if you can understand what's going on, then perhaps therein lies the key to escaping this dream and waking up back in reality. The small island you find yourself on, and the others nearby, are inhabited by strange life forms. As you walk across the shore, sand clinging to your wet feet, you approach what you thought at a distance to be a group of other people. Instead, you see a group of peculiar beings. They are not quite human, but they are definitely close. The closer you walk, you notice these strange humanoid shapes huddle tighter together, their backs to you. When you try to call out to them, asking where you are or how you might return to reality, they bustle away. The wind carries the sound of their chatter towards you, and you're certain you hear them call you another one, just another traveler from afar. What you don't realize, lost in this dream environment, is that there are others like it. Pocket worlds like this one, similar but different, currently being experienced by any others asleep near SCP-1449. As you ponder what to do on the beach, the captain of the boat you hired is on a different version of the same island, 
Watching a herd of multiple 2,000 kilo platypi being shepherded by six tattooed three meter tall humanoid figures. Meanwhile, his first mate is in another version of this dream world, learning how to hunt under the tutelage of a man called Gray the Rabbit Hunter. Each version of SCP 1449's dreamscape have separate continuities to each other. They are differing copies of the same chain of islands with the same inhabitants but each visited by a different traveler from afar in their sleep. Much like a lucid dream, visitors to the Dreamtime Whale Shark's worlds can interact with them, shaping and altering events in the continuity they find themselves in. Deciding to leave the beach, you elect to make your way towards higher ground to try to get a wider scope of your surroundings. Fortunately, there is a towering mountainous shape nearby, standing like dark serrated teeth against the clear horizon. You begin your dangerous trek, ascending your way up these dead, jagged hills. You're still unclear on how you got here or how to escape, but you will yourself to keep climbing, knowing there must be some way to wake up from this bizarre dream. Finally reaching level ground, you take a moment to catch your breath, collecting your thoughts before advancing any further. You turn, gazing out over the landscape spreading out below and all around you. The island is small enough you can see the shore where you arrived, and the ocean flanking this landmass on all sides. In this short moment, you appreciate the beauty of this bizarre dream world for the first time. The trees sway in the gentle breeze, moving like the calm rolling of waves in the water beyond, both glistening with the warm light of the sun. While it is still true that you have no idea how or why SCP-1449 brought you here, or how to leave, you think to yourself that at least this dream environment isn't a hostile one. Not that you'd want to be stranded there forever, but there are certainly far more unforgiving places one can dream about. A grim thought suddenly dawns on you. How long have you been here? Does time pass differently in this world to the one you're still asleep in? A sound shakes your thoughts back to your current here and now. It was a voice. You're sure of it. A voice calling out, but not to you. Traversing the dead, jagged hills, you see a figure, a person from the real world like you, not one of the local humanoids. They don't see you. They're calling out to someone in a ramshackle hut cobbled together from pieces of wood and other scraps. On the arm of the figure's dark, military-like uniform is a symbol, and you can just make out three distinct letters. S. C. P. A wooden plank that functioned as the door creaked open, revealing a second figure. The man looks disheveled, his worn clothing patched with scraps of leather and shark skin, making him look as cobbled together as his makeshift hut, like he was an extension of the small structure. You watch as the man talks to the agent, overhearing his words. Don't say anything. If you say anything, I lose my mind. You can say anything and something horrible happens, the strange man warns, talking too quickly for the Foundation agent to reply. You're a dreamer, like me. My name is Nikolai. I am the ship's seer of the Dunham and the Brotherhood of Selechostik Pudnik Skombin. The man Nikolai, he called himself, seemed distressed, tripping over his words, disagreeing with himself until he starts trailing off into swearing obscenities. I am not Nikolai, he shouts. I am Agent... Agent John? Before stumbling and cursing again. I'm sorry, I can't, can't keep the memory straight. Being this lucid for this long hurts. The dreaming fills in all the gaps. Things have always been even as they are brought into being. I've been on this cliff since the beginning of time. Just like how this place has always been here. The dream was torn away by the deaths of gods before time began. But I watched it happen five years ago. Are you following? I can barely tell the dream and reality apart anymore. My world has always been the way it is and we made it like that. We hurt the dreaming. The shark, that's how we see it. We heard it, killed it in our world, and the dream time poured out like it spilled blood, and we made this big scar here, and, and things are wrong. Fish walk and ghosts haunt the stones, and women give birth to plastic children, and the leech fields stretch out forever in the seas of human blood, and the center eats cocaine and caviar out of panda skull bowls on the crushed backs of opal mares in acres of broken glass. And it has always been like this. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it again. You're already racing back down to the dead jagged hills. The sight of the deranged Nikolai burned into your mind. 
a man reduced to a babbling lunatic, cast away and left alone in this strange dreamscape that SCP-1449 brought you to. But Nikolai is more than that, more than just someone driven mad by his isolation. He is a grim prophecy of what will become of you, unless you can find a way to leave the Dreamtime Whale Sharks world. Already back on the beach, you drop down, kneeling in the wet sand as the tide washes over your knees. The how or why of SCP-1449 bringing you into this dream isn't important. All that matters to you is avoiding ending up like Nikolai. Whatever it takes, you know one thing above all else. You need to wake up. But whether you actually ever will is another question entirely. The ocean is a terrifying place. We've all heard the statistics. More than 80% of the ocean remains unexplored. That's most of the water covering the globe, completely unmapped and unobserved by science. It's a scary thought to dwell on, realizing that there's more water than land on Earth, and the sheer expanse of that water is so large that we've been unable to fully explore all of it. Just think, there are places in the ocean that have never been seen by a human. Who knows what's down there? If there was ever a personification of fear of the unknown, the ocean could definitely be it. Ancient shipwrecks sunk to the ocean floor, unknown sea creatures hiding away from humanity, and the general isolation of the suffocating dark blue the ocean swallows its victims with. All of these images that come to mind when thinking about the vast and mysterious depths of the sea. And no one is more familiar with nautical mysteries than the SCP Foundation. Today we'll be taking a look at SCP-5007, The Bass Strait. A wave of oceanic anomalies fit to make any seasoned sailor shiver in fear. The Bass Strait is an area of ocean dividing Tasmania and the Australian mainland. It's also the location of an unusually high amount of disappearances. Sailors disappearing from their ships, fishermen leaving in the night and never coming back, even civilians disappearing from the shores that connect to the strait. The Foundation was aware of these disappearances since 1858 but were only able to craft theories about what was causing them. Was it an anomalous group of interest? Hostile aerial entities patrolling the skies above the strait? Phenomenon associated with unidentified flying objects? What about subterranean anomalies, weather patterns, or time dilation? For nearly a century, the Foundation was unable to determine the cause of the high number of disappearances in the Bass Strait. And then the phenomenon suddenly revealed itself. In 1980, on a beach connected to the strait, Agent Taberner, an operative of the SCP Foundation, was vacationing with his wife Mary and his three young children. The Taberner family was simply enjoying their day, when they saw what looked like balloons in the sky. They were approaching quickly, and naturally the family moved closer. What happened next was a whirlwind, and those balloons the family were so interested in lifted them up from the ground and carried them away. Agent Taberner tried to fight back, but there was nothing he could do, except report to the Foundation what had occurred, and the organization responded in full force. The Foundation's research discovered that reports of UFOs and lights in the sky had coincided with many disappearances in the strait, and that this was a pattern. The search for the four lost Taberner family members had become a large-scale investigation into unexplained disappearances along the Bass Strait, and within three weeks, it was determined that these patterns were consistent across the entirety of the Strait's coastal regions. Some witnesses were interviewed, but the vast majority of these abduction cases had no witnesses whatsoever. Of the minimal reports filed, the Foundation was told that there were lights in the sky, and that appearance of unidentified flying objects described as having the appearances of balloons. One such witness interviewed was a man by the name of Alan Stewart, a witness who was present during the disappearance of former Australian Prime Minister Harold Holt, whose disappearance the Foundation believed may have had a connection to the Bass Strait anomalies. During the interview, Stewart claimed that Holt and his family, while voyaging on their yacht, decided to leave the boat and go for a swim. Holt turned to Stewart and asked him if he could see the balloons around the cliff. Stewart had no idea what Holt was talking about, but Holt was insistent on seeing them. He swam deeper out into the ocean, saying that they weren't normal balloons and that there was someone inside of them. Stewart and Holt's family called out for him to come to shore, but he wouldn't listen. Stewart tried to rationalize what he saw next. Maybe it was the current sweeping Holt away, but he couldn't lie to the Foundation interviewer. Stewart saw Holt go further and further out into the water, 
and suddenly the Prime Minister turned around. He began swimming in the opposite direction, and he was screaming. Suddenly, Holt was lifted from the sea and pulled into the air by something emerging from the clouds. The Foundation thanked Stewart for the interview and continued their investigation. Two years later, in 1982, emergency services received a large number of calls pertaining to UFO sightings off the coast of Norman Bay, Victoria. The Foundation was quick to respond, alerting task forces and local sites to prepare for an investigation. Upon arriving to the scene, they confirmed the existence of multiple entities that would later be documented as SCP-5007. They evacuated civilians from the area and successfully managed to capture the creature, which was later transported to Site-40 for containment. It was a sight to behold. The entity, now designated SCP-5007-S1, was a cluster of human bodies fused between a grouping of black tentacles of varying length. Each tentacle was fused to the skin it touched directly. The stomachs of the corpses were grossly swollen and distorted to massive sizes to hold large quantities of gases inside, the buoyancy of which the entity used to achieve a passive flight. Across the entity's surface were clusters of eyes and bioluminescent glowing organs. Many of the humanoid components of the corpses appeared to have been removed and misplaced across various parts of the entity's body. What's more is that the Foundation discovered that human portions of SCP-5007 appeared somewhat cognizant and aware of their situation. Their vocalizations were incoherent and barely understandable, consisting of gasping and whimpering, but the corpses were observed to implore other individuals to approach them when encountered. SCP-5007's behavior during abduction scenarios was documented during the initial containment event, and due to the Foundation's painstaking research, a pattern was established between all SCP-5007 encounters. First, the victim would be alone, or otherwise vulnerable, in a coastal location. SCP-5007 haven't shown a preference for weather, be they clear or hostile skies, but they have localized all of their activity to the Bass Strait in small coastal towns, beaches, or boats. SCP-5007 will then move towards the shore, stalking the victim before lowering its tentacles and appendages to grab the individual, snatching them into the sky. An SCP-5007 instance can even abduct multiple people at once. One event observed had eight men from the decks of a commercial fishing boat taken into the sky in under 15 seconds. Once captured, SCP-5007 instances will dart across the water at a high speed and take their victims to an unknown location. Discovering where SCP-5007 took their victims became a top priority for the Foundation. After extensive witness interviews and compiling a database of likely victims, they determined that there must be at least 16 instances of SCP-5007 unaccounted for. Personnel kept a close watch on the coastlines and waters of the Bass Strait, and equipped various marine task forces with research vessels capable of tracking any instances if they encountered them. In 1985, the Foundation's research efforts paid off, and several survey teams operating in the area reported the sighting of an extremely large SCP-5007 instance heading towards a coastal town. A mobile task force was sent to track the entity. The team observed the entity from afar as it stalked a private fishing boat. Even from the distance, Foundation personnel recognized the likenesses of several missing persons as faces of the corpses of SCP-5007. The task force captain had to remind his team to keep it together, claiming that they were not people, but just parts of the specimen. But everyone secretly knew the truth. The fishing vessel was a private one, occupied by a small family. The entity slowly approached and quickly pulled a woman into the air. The family panicked and quickly tried to reach cover for safety, running into the ship's cabin. The entity ran its tentacles along the boat until it pulled the door open, snatching another two victims. The task force was unable to help them, as their mission was to track the instance to its origin point. It was a horror to watch. The task force implanted a tracking beacon onto the entity and quietly followed it out to sea over the next four hours. They then discovered a large gray reef with several shipwrecks dotted across it. Thirteen SCP-5007 instances floated over the area some holding on to the land reef with their tentacles. The entity dropped the abductees from the fishing boat, who were coerced by the entities into diving into a massive pool of water located in the center of the reef. One by one, each abductee was pulled below the surface by something lurking in the pool. 
all while the SCP-5007 instances watched. Disgusted, the task force reported what they observed to the main site, and the reef would be designated as SCP-5007-A. The Foundation's analysis of the reef led to the discovery that the rock covering it seeped iron oxide from an unknown source, and the rocks achieved growth at an anomalously fast rate, often as little as 40 minutes. All of the wrecked ships and aircraft that washed across the shore of the reef were covered with a dark stone. The reef was teeming with anomalous marine life, including SCP-5007, a red algae that fed upon the freshly grown rock, marine worms capable of levitation, spiders that lived in silk retreats underneath the waterline, small fish, and giant organisms resembling large clumps of kelp, which the Foundation had previously documented as SCP-4159 in a separate investigation. SCP-5007 often rested their tentacles on the outcroppings of the reef while inactive, but what caught the Foundation's attention the most was the giant pit located in the reef's center. Unmanned exploration drones found that it had a depth of at least 4,000 meters, and water samples taken from the pit revealed large quantities of human DNA, prehistoric bacteria, and unknown compounds that possessed significant life-preserving qualities. When a being was submerged in the compound, they were able to survive heavy injuries, even when fully surrounded by the liquid and unable to breathe. The Foundation's exploration of one of these shipwrecks led them to a journal. Most of it was illegible due to water damage, but one passage survived, located in the back of the book. It detailed the experience of an unknown crew member of the ship caught in a storm. It reads, Morsby spied land ahead, and the boys said that there are giant balloons hanging over the island. We are all afeard, but there is naught we can do but beach ourselves and help for rescue. Should I be killed in the crash, I want my mates to give this journal to my Mary. Might know I spent my last thinking only of her. The interior of the ship contained human remains inside but there were less skeletons than the Foundation would expect for a ship of its size. The location of the rest of the bodies was unknown. Another event related to SCP-5007 the Foundation documented involved Frederick Valentich, a pilot engaged in a training flight over the Bass Strait in 1978. Valentich's disappearance was marked by his latest communication with air traffic control, when he mistook an SCP-5007 instance for an unidentified aircraft. It seems like it's stationary. What I'm doing right now is orbiting, and the thing is just orbiting on top of me. Also, it's got a green light and sort of metallic, like it's all shiny on the outside. Shortly after this, Valentich's transmission was interrupted by what was described as metallic scraping sounds, believed to be the SCP-5007 instance attacking the aircraft and jamming its propellers with its mass. After crashing into the reef, it was believed that Valentich and his aircraft were pulled beneath the surface of the pit, just as the abductees had been prior. The Foundation decided to construct a provisional secure research facility on the reef. They named it Site-40-R and documented all returns and departures of SCP-5007. They also set up a series of containment procedures that resulted in SCP-5007 returning with its victims 83% less often than before the site's construction, but this was short-lived. In 2008, the site logged over 36 instances returning to the reef, with only two not having any fresh abductees. The instances' origins were unknown, and it was as if they appeared out of thin air. No other monitoring post had documented their appearance, or even spotted them before they arrived at the reef. It was years later in 2017 that the Foundation eventually was able to successfully explore what was deep inside the pit at the center of the reef. They already knew that there was a large entity lurking beneath, as evidenced by what happened to the victims of SCP-5007 that were later deposited inside the pool. All previous attempts to explore the pool were met with failure, as the water pressure of the pit's depths caused all craft to collapse due to hull damage. This time, however, they managed to construct a high-tech submarine, labeled the SCPS Nautilus, which was capable of diving a maximum of 13,500 meters underwater. They decided that a D-Class personnel would be trained to man the submersible and carry out the exploration. The mission was simple. The Nautilus was to dive to the bottom of the pit and to describe the depth readings. Cameras and microphones were equipped to the vessel. Due to the depth, remote viewing of the footage was impossible. Instead, the Foundation had to physically recollect the vessel in order to view the footage. Upon recovery, some of the footage suffered data corruption, but what was there shook those who viewed it to their core. The footage showed the D-Class's experience going deeper inside the pit, 
At first, it seemed ordinary. The trench had a number of rocky outcroppings dotted with black-yellow vines growing along the walls. Also present were various marine life forms, such as the spiders or the fish. Going deeper, the sub observed an SCP-5007 instance clinging to an outcropping. Several tendrils emerging from the pit's depths were wrapped around the instance and holding onto the entity, as if it were feeding from it. Another 16 SCP-5007 instances were seen resting along the walls, each clinging to the outcropping. As the sub went deeper, the D-Class remarked that there were dozens of plane and shipwrecks, but also well over a hundred SCP-5007 entities. Most of them were held there by the Black Tendrils. The D-Class, as the sub went even deeper, began noticing human remains. No short amount of them, either. Deep into the pit, there was a large mass of human remains covering the entirety of the pit. Bodies crushed and drained of blood, but still possessing intact eyes. Each individual was still alive, kept preserved by the life-sustaining compounds found within the water. The body stared at the sub and moved, attempting to grab onto the vehicle. The D-Class swore they were trying to say something, mouthing words to the camera of the sub. As the sub passed through the mass of bodies, it emerged into a completely dark, black clearing at the bottom of the pit. For a second, the D-Class thought he was safe. But then, a large black tentacle rapidly emerged from below and grabbed onto the Nautilus, dragging it even further into the depths. The D-Class screamed and panicked, but there was nothing he could do. The tentacle possessed a large cluster of eyes, mouths, and human heads seemingly grafted onto its mass. And then there was another tentacle, and then another. The Nautilus was pulled to the bottom of the pool. The D-Class's screams were still heard even as the picture cut out. Sometimes graphic body-altering images of the tentacle's features were visible on the screen, but most of the footage was indecipherable. After minutes of distorted, corrupted footage, the Nautilus was seen again, rapidly ascending to the surface. Somehow, it had managed to escape the entity at the bottom of the pit. Upon recovery of the craft, it was found that the Nautilus was covered in a thick, organic coating similar to a black slime mold, but with dozens of eyes growing from it. The D-Class inside showed severe psychological damage and attempted to harm Foundation personnel. They were terminated shortly after due to being a danger to those around them. Following review of the footage, the Nautilus was to be dismantled and incinerated, along with the remains of the D-Class. A reinforced containment seal was fitted over the pit, with the intention of keeping whatever was down there isolated from the surface. But this was short-lived. After the containment seal was fitted, Site-40 underwent a massive communications blackout. Every device on site received an email containing a single image of a large eye taken from a security camera. The text beneath it simply read, Found you. Some personnel who viewed the email underwent anomalous changes, growing new physical features such as eyes and other various growths across their body. The entirety of Site-40-R went offline, and the Foundation could not establish contact. In an emergency effort to do so, Mobile Task Force Gamma-6 Deep Feeders was sent to investigate. The task force's assault on Site-40-R was a daring effort, as the majority of the site was completely overtaken by tentacles, growths, and anomalous alterations. While numerous altered personnel were lost due to the mission, it was ultimately a success. Some altered personnel were able to be saved through extensive surgery to remove their anomalous growths. And after everything was said and done, the site was repaired and reconstructed without incident. Following the site's repair, there has been little activity from the entity within the pit, but the Foundation continued to keep an eye on the creature and the ecosystem of the anomalous marine life that live on the Bass Strait, never knowing what their next move might be, and always keeping in mind the risk that comes with dealing with these poorly understood entities. Despite the fact that it covers the majority of our planet's surface, we know remarkably little about the oceans. While we know how to navigate them and how to send boats from one continent to another, the surface of the water is usually a calm, safe place where all you expect to encounter are other humans and the occasional storm. What's below the surface is another story. Scientists estimate that we've only explored maybe 5% of the world's oceans and what lies in them. On top of that, they estimate that we've only encountered and cataloged 10% of marine life. That means that 95% of the ocean is unexplored and untouched by humans, and that 90% of the ocean species have never even been seen by humans. It makes you think, just what kind of stuff is down there? 
It could be anything. Even mundane ocean life can be deeply strange and bizarre. There are sharks that live for over 300 years, blind fish that only hunt by smell, jellyfish that are reborn whenever they die. If normal ocean life is this terrifying and explanation-defying, what kinds of anomalies could the oceans we swim and fish in be playing host to? One such anomaly is SCP-835. But before we get started, SCP-835 is an old, old file. It's one of the earliest in the Foundation's database, in fact. Like many of the Foundation's earliest documents, it's been heavily redacted and expunged, to the point where large blocks of the text are missing, not to mention the fact that it's been locked behind a content filter. But SCP-835 is unique not because it's been expunged and redacted, but because it's had them lifted. Versions of the file and its addendum that are cleared of the redactions have been declassified and released by order of 05-11 to all viewers. For some reason, whatever was so secret about this file no longer applies. But before we take a look at the declassified documentation, let's look at the old version to get an idea of what exactly we're dealing with here. The attached image for SCP-835 is, to put it simply, gross. It's what appears to be some kind of bone or muscular growth underwater, a bit like coral, but much more organic and flesh-like in shape. The growth is mostly white and brown, but large sections are grown over with what looks like some kind of black mold spores. It's large too, almost the size of a person's chest, and seems to continue out of frame. The caption is simply, still image from recording 81. It's not even clear if this growth, whatever it is, is SCP-835 or not. Continuing on to the file, the object class is Keter, and the special containment procedures are lengthier than most articles and very detailed. They explain that SCP-835 must constantly be monitored and checked to see if it's growing or expanding. In the event that it becomes hostile to Foundation personnel, something known only as Suppression Tactic A-A6 is to be activated until it ceases any hostile action. The anomaly has to be contained in the open ocean rather than move to a water tank or such, because of the highly aggressive response of SCP-835 to confinement for any length of time. So whatever it is, it's alive. It's expanding and growing, and seems capable of knowing when it's being placed into containment and responding angrily. It's not only sentient, it's intelligent and aware. They go on to say that SCP-835's waste has to be immediately collected and contained, and that it is to be fed two times every day, though what exactly is going to be fed to it is redacted in this version of the file. It can also be moved to a new location up to two times a year, but only if the current location can't support it anymore, and if the move has been approved by the site directors. On top of that, personnel have to stay away from SCP-835, at least 15 feet. They also need to have safety harnesses attached to winches on the boat. If anyone so much as touches SCP-835, all of the winches will activate and rapidly yank all the divers back to the boat. From there, Suppression Tactic A-A6 is again instituted. But there is another line. If a staff member touches SCP-835 and is captured by it, then the anomaly is to be monitored around the clock until the subject has been released. Very ominous containment procedures. This predator, if it is a predator, has a penchant for consuming people and needs to be avoided at all costs. But if someone is caught, it releases them after a while. The description of the document clears some things up. SCP-835 is a mass of polyps, or tissue growths, that resemble coral. It's huge and heavy, though its full weight is again redacted, and the individual polyps are also huge, over a meter long, much longer than any known coral species. The central mass is oval and has a huge three meter long polyp on each side of it, but can't move or budge because of its huge weight. Instead, it uses huge tentacles extending from the polyps to dig into the ground and anchor it in place against the ocean currents. These are the same tentacles that are used for feeding and are covered in a sticky glue-like adhesive. They're not just long and strong either. Tests have recorded them damaging stainless steel plating. And speaking of plating, SCP-835 is covered in it. Not steel, but some kind of organic coral that's much harder than steel and couldn't be broken by even diamond drill bits. All the Foundation could get were small samples. And if that wasn't bad enough, the Foundation's positive that SCP-835 is growing. 
like the containment procedure suggested, and it's growing fast, up to 50 pounds in a single day if it's left uninterrupted. But it can't be stopped. It reacts to certain chemicals that make it close up like an oyster and stop growing for 24 hours at a time. Based on that, the Foundation's been able to develop and use a chemical cocktail to force it to halt, the aforementioned Suppression Tactic A-A6. However, the results of testing it have been redacted. In case the anomaly wasn't disgusting enough, it also vomits. That's right. Every couple of hours, it expels a large mass of some liquidy sludge material from both sides, so to speak. After sample testing, the scientists realized it really is vomit. Well, part of it. The substance is mostly semi-digested food, fecal material, and semen, but also contains live samples of biohazardous viruses, bacteria, and parasites, some that the Foundation haven't even encountered before as CP-835. One of these bacteria, 835-I5, is a big problem for containing SCP-835. But exactly why that is, is unfortunately expunged from the file as well. Between the lethal witch's brew of dangerous diseases and the diamond hard shell that covers SCP-835's internal guts, it is nearly impossible to neutralize or even damage it. Even if you do crack the shell, the diseased fluid inside would leak out and infect you full of diseases in seconds. Wow, that's kind of crazy. Yeah, so SCP-835 is a really, really, really nasty customer. I mean, just by looks alone, it's easy to tell 835 is probably nothing to mess with. But a simple visual of the thing in your line of sight does no justice in showing how actually dangerous and disgusting it really is. If you try to break it, you get your immune system overrun by a cocktail of diseases. If it doesn't manage to eat you first. The document has one addendum. An after-action report by a member of Mobile Task Force Zeta-9, the notorious Mole Rats. The Mole Rats are one of the Foundation's most elite teams of special operation troops. Like all MTFs, they have a very specific specialization, one thing they do better than anyone else in the world. For Zeta-9, it's cramped spaces. The task force is highly trained in exploring dangerous, constricted areas especially those that lie underground. From subterranean caves to endless staircases and basement labyrinths, the Mole Rats are the best of the best at getting in and getting out. The Mobile Task Force Zeta-9 had been performing an investigation on SCP-835, albeit when it was considerably smaller, only a meager four tons, and it hadn't formed a second big polyp yet. Just like usual, four members of the Mole Rats were chosen to begin the investigation, equipped with underwater isolation suits to ward off any biological threats. Lieutenant C, Sergeants L and M, and Corporal H, a rookie team member who was training with them and was ordered to only observe. They took a small underwater drone with them, one that would come in very handy. At first, SCP-835 didn't act hostile or aggressive towards the members of the team. In fact, it even allowed members to swim up to it and touch it without reacting. They couldn't even tell if it was alive or not. So they sent the drone to approach the huge polyp on the north side, while they went around to the small entrance on the other side of the rock. Corporal H was told to remain there and make sure that the power cable to the drone didn't break off or snap. Everything seemed calm. Suddenly, the drone's claw arm jerked back, having gotten stuck in something and began thrashing around. Not wanting to wake the creature, Corporal H moved forward and tried to free the claw, but then he became trapped too. The other members of the team heard him on the radio, screaming for them to come and help him, and that he'd been grabbed by some horrible tentacle thing that was dragging him towards the polyp that had opened up into a mouth. The incident left Lieutenant C a bit ruffled afterward. Jesus Christ, I can't do this! He was just a kid! It was his first mission, I should have kept my eye on him! After a moment, she composes herself and begins to explain what happened. The anomaly grabbed Corporal H, having fooled the rest of us. What we thought was the entrance to just some cave, while the polyp on the north side was the real entrance into SCP-835. The tentacles came out of its smaller polyps, grabbed Corporal H, and began dragging him in, while he thrashed around and screamed. The boat tried to pull in the winch, but from all the activity, the line snapped in two. Corporal H was pulled inside SCP-835 and eaten. The lieutenant explains that she swam over and hooked herself to his outstretched hand when the boat began winching her up. She said just as she assured him that they're going to be fine and that she's not letting go, her line snapped and they were both suddenly pulled inside. She breaks for a moment, 
before describing the inside as like a wet, pulsing tube, like how intestines look on colonoscopies. They were both steadily being pulled in by the muscle contractions, what doctors call peristalsis, the way your body moves food down your throat and through your intestines. The only reason they weren't dissolved or crushed was because of the isolation suits they were wearing, but they still couldn't move. Corporal H had vomited in his suit, but they were both alive. The lieutenant, thinking fast, figured out that if they were moving through its body, they would come out on the other end in 72 hours. They had air and water in the suits, but little battery, and if the heat went out, they would freeze to death. She quickly killed all of the lights and power in both of their suits to the minimum, except the helmet lights so they could make sure that the other was still alive. The pair stayed like that for a whole day, with absolutely nothing but the creature's digestion and their own breathing. After a while, the corporal's face was visible. He looked tired and scared. She said that 13 hours in, the kid started talking and babbling. She calmed him down and they both slept for a bit, but were rudely awoken by falling into the stomach of the creature. They both fell out into a small chamber filled with liquid, and barely a moment later, their suits began to melt in the stomach acid. She yelled and they both ran for a hole in the wall, SCP-835 sphincter. At this point, it was very clear that they made it into the intestine, and it was worse than the stomach. I'm sure you can imagine how horrifying it must have been to be in the mix of this creature's fecal waste. Disgusted and vomiting, the corporal and lieutenant picked each other up, knowing that they were making strides of this terrible ordeal. But they reached a dead stop. The creature's rectal hole was tightly shut, blocking their escape. They decided to wait, knowing that it would have to excrete eventually, and after an undetermined amount of time, I mean, any time spent in something's intestines waiting to be pooped out is too much time. The lieutenant was shot out into the sea, but without the corporal. She is obviously angry, telling the agents to do something expunged before declaring she needs a drink and to sleep. What a horrifying story. But there are gaps. Let's take a look at the uncensored documentation for SCP-835. First, let's go back to the containment procedures. What SCP-835 is to be fed is explained, any kind of local fish, but higher level mammals if it goes into a rage state, including humans. In fact, it seems to calm down when digesting higher mammals. Maybe it's developed a taste for human flesh. In any case, the feeding should never happen without heavy supervision. Next, the results of performing tests on the samples of SCP-835 the Foundation was able to get. SCP-835 is no normal coral. It seems to be made from what can only be described as basic human biological components. The hard outer shell is super dense calcium, like your bones, but hundreds of times harder. The polyps are covered with the same kind of enamel that you'd find on your teeth, and the fleshy muscle that the tentacles are made of is mostly mutated tongue cells. The creature seems to have most of the biological systems we have, but they've all degraded or mutated into almost unrecognizability, except the digestive and reproductive systems, which are highly advanced. 835-I5, the bacteria unique to the anomaly, is explained. It's how SCP-835 reproduces. When vertebrates are infected with it, they will undergo a variety of symptoms, gaining huge amounts of weight despite always being hungry for things that normally can't be eaten, like wood and raw meat. Their skin will harden and form polyps across its surface. Their biological systems will slowly stop working, and they'll become aggressive. And then they will drastically reduce in intelligence and motion, except for the desire to enter the sea. Sound familiar? That's right. Being infected by it turns the victim into another SCP-835 instance, with no way to cure it. And just like it seems, SCP-835 is still somewhat aware and intelligent. At one point, this thing was a normal human. Just in case that's not horrible enough, the after-action report has also been thoroughly declassified. Let's take another look to see the real full story of what happened to Lieutenant C and Corporal H inside SCP-835. The first reveals when Corporal H was being pulled into the polyp. He was screaming and crying, begging for help. Oh God, it's eating me! I, I don't want to die! Command tells Lieutenant C to abort the mission, but she refuses to leave one of her men behind, holding his hand while hooking them together. Then the line snapped, and they were pulled in. Just as they were escaping the stomach and right as she hit the sphincter, she realized 
The walls of the stomach were lined with human faces, screaming and wailing and begging to be killed. She pulled her weapon out and began firing into them, and she would have melted if Corporal H hadn't pushed her through. In the intestine, the corporal began to complain of a rancid smell. She checked and realized he had a breach in his suit, but quickly patched it, but it was too late. She looked at his face, and it was growing pustules already. They burst, spraying blood, and he begged to be put out of his misery. But when the lieutenant shot her gun at him, all it produced were empty clicks. She had wasted all the ammo on the crying stomach faces. Suddenly, tentacles burst through the corporal's faceplate and simultaneously pinned the lieutenant down. She managed to flip what had been the corporal over and wrestle with what was left of him before the sphincter into the stomach, where his body began to melt in the acid. But before it did, she saw the corporal's face smiling and said he loved her before he died. Then she felt a burst of energy and was shot through the exit. With a troubled gleam in her eyes, she stands there telling her story to the agent. She takes a second to gain some strength and then says, I didn't make it out intact. My suit was breached, and I didn't even realize until I took it off and saw the rash on my skin. Realizing she's going to die, she suddenly puts the room she's in on lockdown and orders the debriefing agent to evacuate everyone else aboard immediately. Just before she kills the feed, she makes one request, that the Foundation not try to decontaminate the small boat, just to abandon ship and scuttle it on top of SCP-835, on top of the Corporal. That way, they can be together in some kind of sick resting place. SCP-835 is the horrible tale of things that can go wrong at the Foundation, and two people doing their best in a brutal situation. But with the modern containment protocols and ensuring people know what happened to the pair, the Foundation can ensure no one ends up like the Lieutenant and the Corporal again. It was a beautiful day in Sardinia, the second largest Italian island in the Mediterranean. The sea was clear, the air was hot, and the beaches were golden. But the Cagliari Diving Club couldn't see any of that. They were roughly 250 meters underneath the Mediterranean Sea. Given the rich and extensive history of the area, they were sure to find some interesting historical artifacts on the ocean floor. And they were indeed about to find something incredible. But this history wasn't quite as dead as some old Roman pottery. Paolo Bonacelli, the most experienced diver, was the deepest of all. They decided to be a little more ambitious this time than in previous dives, 20 miles off the Sardinian coast. For Paolo, it was uncharted territory, so you could only imagine how amazed and delighted he was when he saw the shape of what seemed like a small town beneath the water. Old stone buildings in a classic Roman or Grecian style, with roofs made of thatched seaweed. He gestured to his fellow divers to follow him. They were amazed at how well-preserved the building seemed to be, as though they were still being lived in and actively maintained to this day, despite being around 300 meters underwater. If they were able to take some pictures and collect some artifacts, they'd be the talk of the local historic community, and probably be able to finagle a payout from the whole experience too. That's when Paolo spotted something truly amazing. A larger, more impressive structure, like a miniature palace surrounded by grandio statues of humanoid figures in a circle around the little palace. Each of the statues was an imposing five meters tall, with a faint, golden light emanating from each of them. While the statues were humanoid, they definitely weren't human. Their features were strange and fish-like. Scales, gills, tentacles. Paolo was in awe at the sight of them. He took pictures and got closer. There was also a huge chasm in front of the building, perhaps some kind of underwater thermal vent. Paolo was curious. He wanted to investigate further. He swam deeper and deeper. What was at the bottom of that chasm? But lucky for Paolo, he would never see what was at the bottom of that chasm. Before he could reach it, something intercepted him from the side, something large and fast. He felt a white-hot flash of pain as claws raked across his chest, tearing open the rubber of his wetsuit. Paolo turned, eyes widening in horror to see a creature staring at him. Like the statues, it was humanoid but not human. An anthropomorphic sea monster with greenish skin, its arms and legs coated in thin scales, its neck serrated into fleshy gills. He could see scraps of his suit's rubber hanging from its claws. 
It bore a mouthful of fangs and gave a silent but threatening snarl. Paolo could see something in the distance behind this creature. More figures, like this one, emerging from the murk, getting faster, getting closer. Paolo was a smart man, but it didn't take a genius to realize that if he stuck around, something terrible was about to happen to him and the rest of the Cagliari Diving Club. He turned and fled, paddling with all his might away from the coming legion of aquatic beasts. The rest of the club saw the experienced diver panicking and followed his lead. Thanks to their quick thinking and expertise, they all managed to escape with their lives and only a few minor injuries. But they had no idea of the true extent of the mystery they were leaving behind beneath the sea. The multiverse is a big place. There are alternate universes where the devourer of worlds escapes and destroys everything we love and hold dear. There are alternate universes where the SCP Foundation has gone haywire and attempted to wipe out humanity through controlled releases of all their anomalies. There are even universes where a kill squad sent by the Chaos Insurgency hunts down and assassinates every member of the O5 Council, before replacing them and leading the Foundation into a bold new era. And there are some universes where the SCP Foundation is Italian. We've covered SCP-057 on this channel before in our video on the most frightening rooms in the SCP universe, but you've never seen this SCP-057, because this is the Italian version, SCP-057-IT. This localized anomaly off the coast of Sardinia is under the purview of the Italian division of the SCP Foundation which works autonomously with its own systems and terminology. This SCP is in a frightening room that crushes its trapped victims together. This anomaly is an entire city 300 meters beneath the water of the Mediterranean Sea. Everyone has heard of the mythical lost city of Atlantis, a supposed underwater utopia outlined by such great historical minds as the ancient Greek philosopher Plato. It's something that people fantasize about. A beautiful, idyllic society under the sea, divorced from all the petty squabbles we deal with up on land. But is everything really better down where it's wetter? Let's take a look and see. When Paolo and the rest of the Cagliari Diving Club returned to the surface, they were happy to tell anyone that would listen that they encountered aggressive mermen and an entire underwater city off the coast of Sardinia. They even posted their photos onto their official Facebook page, along with photos of Paolo's gnarly chest scars. That's when the Italian branch of the SCP Foundation finally discovered them and decided to intervene. The Foundation dispatched an SIR squad known as Oreria Notetia. SIRs are the intelligence and research section of the Italian SCP Foundation, a kind of mobile task force that investigates possible informational leads. Paolo and his team were given amnestic treatment, and any evidence that they'd collected was scrubbed from existence. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Marco Levini, leader of the mobile task force SSM-2 Squad, aka Legio Alantidis, was being dispatched to the source of the problem. SCP-057-IT itself. What started off as a relatively straightforward exploratory mission soon took an extremely strange turn. Levini and his men reported activity down in the underwater city, observing from the safety of their armored Foundation submarine. While the aquatic humanoids living in O-57-IT were undeniably the same species, their cultures seemed to be split up into two unique groups. One group had thinner scales on their arms and legs. This group was more numerous, having at least 60 active specimens, and was characterized by their extreme aggression towards any outsiders. As for the smaller group, they had thicker scales, as well as a number of eerily consistent injuries to their hands, feet, and gills. They were also distinct from the thin scales in terms of behavior, as they were a far friendlier, more curious bunch. At times, members of this subset would approach the submarine and regard it with detached fascination. Sometimes they would even point at the submarine and laugh, though their reasons for doing this are unknown. Eventually, Lieutenant Levini was so confident in their safety around the Mer people that he and a few other team members decided to disembark from the submarine on a diving excursion and properly explore the aquatic city below. This would prove to be a dangerous tactical error on Levini's part. During what seemed like a routine exploratory mission, Levini was ambushed by a squadron of thin scales, grabbed from behind and kidnapped. 
He was taken as a hostage and spirited away into one of the city's various buildings, where a thick scale known as Letizia acted as his warden. But Lavini soon found that being under Letizia's care was a profoundly lucky turn of events on his part, both because it allowed him to learn more about the situation and because she was one of the small group left in the city who hadn't become dangerous fanatics. That's right, the Mer people were in the middle of a heated civil war. Both from the observations of Lavini during his captivity, and later interviews conducted by project head Dr. Giuseppe Pastillo with some liberated members of the Thick Scales, they learned that a terrible religious conflict had broken out in SCP-057-IT. The accounts coming from the rescued citizens illustrated a similar backstory to what the Italian Foundation had theorized regarding the Mer people. They were the descendants of people that lived on the island of Nisros up to the 14th century BCE, before it was devastated by a volcanic eruption, forcing them into the ocean, where they evolved the ability to live in aquatic environments through anomalous means. Since this change, this new species had been operating in Mediterranean waters, migrating regularly in order to avoid detection, passing their way of life from generation to generation as the world changed and shifted above them. In many ways, they were quite similar to humans, such as their reproductive habits. They mate and reproduce after a gestation period, more like animals than fish, though their gestation period is slightly shorter than human beings at six months. They largely speak Latin, though the oldest mer person among them also speaks ancient Greek. Mer children born in Foundation containment have shown strong language acquisition skills, as they have proven more than able to learn modern Italian. And even more fascinating from a standpoint of sociological study, the mer people have formed their own unique culture under the sea, and this is where the problems started. Abstaining from the belief of the Greek and Roman pantheons their ancestors looked up to, the Mer people instead worshipped their own group of water-bound deities, whose images were reflected in the great statues in the center of the town. The large building near the statues and the chasm was the home of the mayor, the town's de facto leader. However, what had been a workable system for centuries began falling to ruin when a strange religious fanaticism began to spread. A cult-like group soon formed and began holding ceremonies where they worshipped a powerful entity in the chasm known as the Great Eye. This new cult was known as the Cult of the Great Eye of the Mediterranean, or Sea Gem for short. What began as a fringe belief soon became a frenzy and took over the better part of the town with the acolytes of the Great Eye proving themselves more than willing to spread the gospel of their new deity with violence. Some of the more arduan non-believers were killed for their heresy, while others were simply ritualistically mutilated in order to prevent them from rebelling. Letizia had her own evidence of these targeted mutilations. The thin scales had cut the aquatic webbing from between her fingers and toes, making it harder for her to swim away and escape. Other suspected heretics were given the same treatment. The reason the thick scales even had thicker scales was that they stole forbidden technology from the mayor to increase the strength of their scales, hoping it would help them better withstand the torments of the acolytes. Those involved in the stealing of this technology were captured and summarily executed for their acts of defiance. In a sense, Letizia was protecting Lavini by advising him against trying to escape knowing the acolytes of the Great Eye would kill him if he did. She knew that the only opportunity for escape would come during the ceremony held by the acolytes to honor their frightening master. When the day eventually came, as Lavini was running low on everything from food to oxygen, everyone in the town was forced out into the town center to witness the ritual. The acolytes gathered around the chasm and began to chant in a frightening, unknown language. As they chanted, a blinding light began to emanate from the chasm, and as blurry shapes emerged, nightmarish tentacled gastropods soon began to take form. Truly Lovecraftian undersea monsters. Shortly after the ritual, Lavini and the Thick Scales were able to make a break for it, pursued by the acolytes of the Great Eye. It was a close one, but thankfully due to the intervention and assistance of a trained mobile task force, the fanatical forces of the acolytes were repelled and the fleeing merpeople along with Lavini, were rescued. A number of thick scales are now willingly confined at Site Nettuno, an Italian Foundation containment site, where they have undergone numerous interviews with Foundation staff, 
Incidentally, among them is the oldest mer person previously present in SCP-057-IT, the only one who spoke ancient Greek fluently. He was different from the others, extremely different. In fact, he was a deity made into flesh, one of the deities replaced by the worshippers of the Great Eye. This unfortunate former god had done everything to keep his people's lives safe and peaceful, but in spite of his wisdom and best efforts, hell had once again broken loose. Not everything is all well and good in SCP-057-IT. Even if a human's body changes, their nature does not. And the worst parts of human nature seemingly followed these unfortunate merpeople into what should have been their paradise under the sea. But all hope isn't lost. If you were to judge the entire human race on one community in turmoil, you probably wouldn't leave with a very favorable impression of us either. Correspondence with a French branch of the SCP Foundation reveals that mer creatures aren't just localized to one warring underwater city in Sardinia. Mermaids have also been discovered and confirmed by Foundation field agents off the coast of France. 80% of the ocean still remains unmapped to this day. Who knows what else is out there, just waiting to be found. A giant, monstrous, crab-like claw closes around the throat of an unimaginably huge, eel-like beast. The beast's terrible, writhing tentacles wrap around and latch onto the immense crustacean, and then the high-intensity beams of gamma radiation start flying. All the while, legions of skinless centaurs swim in the waters around them, relishing the violence. And in the middle, a lone boat, the SCPS Mither, manned by a team of mobile task force operatives that does all it can just to survive. There are those who consider outer space to be the ultimate achievement in exploration, the one place that explorers have yet to chart and understand. However, some of the murkiest mysteries in the universe are on our own planet, deep down at the bottom of the ocean. 95% of the deep ocean remains completely unexplored, and the little glimpses we have gotten paint a picture of something truly alien. Giant squids, organisms that can breathe nitrogen, luminescent predatory fish, and sharks as old as the Earth itself. Even the SCP Foundation is still struggling to fully grasp the depth of the ocean and the strange beings that dwell there. One of the most unusual aquatic findings in the history of the Foundation is that of SCP-3700. SCP-3700 refers to a circular area in the North Sea with a diameter of 800 kilometers. The waters there are abnormally deep for the region, with the seafloor resting at 5 kilometers beneath the ocean's surface. There are two entities present in the waters of SCP-3700, designated SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2. Interactions between these two entities are responsible for the anomalous changes to the meteorological and geological conditions in the area. SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2 always interact on the spring and fall equinoxes of any given year, but they will also engage one another throughout the year, seemingly at random. But what exactly are SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2? Aside from terrifying creatures of the deep, SCP-3700-1 is an arthropod bearing an aesthetic resemblance to the European lobster, only much, much bigger, measuring 6 kilometers in length. The creature is green, with a mix of blue, yellow, pink, and red markings across the top of its exoskeleton that bear the appearance of a woman's face. It has six prehensile limbs, four of which terminate in claws and eight legs. The entity's four eyes are compound and orange, attached to stalks. Anyone who gets close enough to observe the creature's carapace in detail will notice scars, cracks, and small holes indicating years and years of damage. SCP-3700-1 has several anomalous qualities in addition to its size. In a fight, it is able to strike with its appendages and produce cavitation bubbles with a force greater than several tons of dynamite. Two of the entity's eyes are capable of blasting concentrated gamma radiation at a chosen target. 
the creature has the ability to impact the weather around it, dispersing storms that impede its ability to move with ease, and can reach speeds up to 100 kilometers an hour. In spite of its immense power, SCP-3700-1 is not aggressive and tends to ignore beings in its vicinity other than SCP-3700-2. Speaking of SCP-3700-2, it is a 32-kilometer long entity, resembling a pelican eel in all aspects except for its massive size and the 13 appendages that encircle the middle section of its body. These appendages, which tuck inside its body when not in use, are similar to the tentacles of an octopus, complete with suckers. The majority of the entity's body consists of a sinewy tail, terminating in a sharp point. When its mouth is open, it is an estimated 3 kilometers deep. Its flesh is black, and it has white, purple, and red bioluminescent lines in the shape of a man's face on either side of its torso. SCP-3700-2's anomalous properties include the ability to invoke storms with the severity of Category 5 hurricanes, and the ability to produce whirlpools that draw in any vessel within 150 meters so that it can rip them apart. It is also able to produce high-energy sound waves, as well as blue fire, which it emits from its esophagus. When the two entities interact, it results in an epic struggle as each begins attempts to destroy or subdue the other. When one is victorious, immediate changes to the area follow. When SCP-3700-1 wins, the storms and harsh weather in the area will immediately calm and an era of fertility and abundance will begin. The reproductive rates of fauna in the ocean and on the islands nearby increase threefold, and the crop yield doubles. The ocean itself becomes increasingly active, and the erosion rates of the archipelago's shores increase fivefold. When SCP-3700-2 wins, however, the weather conditions become dangerous, with raging hurricanes, rapidly fluctuating temperatures, and constantly changing storm fronts that cause destruction of buildings and loss of life. Naturally, this renders any ocean travel in the area extremely difficult or even impossible. Aquatic food sources are driven away by harsh conditions, and livestock are killed by exposure and disease. Crops are unable to thrive in the high winds, waterlogged soil, and lack of sunlight. All the while, SCP-3700-2 swims throughout the area, preying on unsuspecting ships and menacing the coastline, until SCP-3700-1 manifests to challenge it again. SCP-3700-2 will also regurgitate instances of SCP-3456, though how or why this is possible is unknown. For those unfamiliar with SCP-3456, they are a group of hairless, three-toed, horse-like creatures with thick, translucent skin and human torsos fused to their backs. They are most frequently seen near sites of war, terrorist attacks, and devastating natural disasters. Direct observation of one of these entities will draw their attention to the observer, who the entity will then stalk and capture before disappearing. Due to their enormous size and ability to anomalously manifest in their home waters, SCP-3700-1 and 2 cannot be contained at a Foundation site. Instead, their containment is handled by Foundation Naval Task Force Delta-7, Northern Storm, who patrol the area in combination of refurbished battleships, destroyers, cruisers, and support craft. Additionally, measures have been taken to suppress information about SCP-3700 among the general population. Details about the unusual depth of the waters there have been stricken from public texts and scientific publications. SCP-3700-1 has been implanted with Donovian hollow projectors, which disguise it as a pod of humpback whales. If SCP-3700-1 encounters SCP-3700-2, Delta-7 may engage protocol Winter Maelstrom. This consists of destroyers deploying harpoon-based anchors into SCP-3700-2's head to hold it in one location. Next, the vessels work together to target the entity until SCP-3700-1 is able to subdue it. If this does not prove effective and SCP-3700-2 cannot be contained, then the task force will implement Protocol Tumult, 
At this point, naval and civilian crafts in the area must be evacuated. Trade and ferry routes to the archipelagos must be rerouted for at least six months. There will be constant aerial and naval engagement with SCP-3700-2 and constant monitoring for the reappearance of SCP-3700-1. The behavior of SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2 is largely very predictable, with one notable exception. On March 20th, 2017, a pair of SCP Foundation-owned battleships known as the Mither and the Terran arrived at a point between the Orkney, Shetland, and Faroe Archipelagos in the North Sea. They were accompanied by the usual fleet of Delta-7 ships. Approximately 600 meters away from the ship's anchor points, the water began to emit intense bright rays of light for a duration of three minutes. At this point, SCP-3700-1 appeared, visible through the surface of the water. Delta-7 withdrew their anchors, speeding toward the entity. As the ships caught up to the entity, it raised two of its claws into the air, clicking them together in a friendly greeting. The Delta-7 ships followed the entity along its usual swimming path for 30 minutes, and during this time, all was peaceful. But this peace did not endure for long. The tide began to change, literally. As large black wall clouds formed overhead, the winds picked up, and the waves churned violently. In response, SCP-3700-1 raised its claws overhead, waving them in a circular motion and parting the clouds above it and Delta-7. But this effort took a lot out of the creature, and after 30 seconds, its antenna began to droop, and it lowered its claws. Still, the hole in the clouds remained, allowing a spot of sunshine to break through and beam down on the Foundation vessels. 600 meters ahead, the ocean waters began to rage and froth, spraying foam and surf into the air. SCP-3700-2 burst from beneath the surface, its head pointed upward. It continued to rise until the tops of its tentacles could be seen just above the water, then stopped to bend its torso and turn its head horizontally, its jaw unhinged, exposing rows upon rows of serrated teeth. The beast let out a mighty roar, accompanied by a stream of blue flame. At the sight of its rival, SCP-3700-1 dove beneath the surface, disappearing from view. The SCPS Mither ordered the rest of the vessels to engage Protocol Winter Maelstrom. Delta-7 scattered out from SCP-3700-1's point of submersion, and all 13 destroyers fired their harpoons at SCP-3700-2, embedding themselves in the entity's head. Naturally, this enraged the creature, and it began to roar and wail spinning its lower body vigorously enough to generate a whirlpool. The cruisers opened fire with a combination of L cannons and conventional weaponry in order to distract the entity as the destroyers pulled their harpoon lines taut, dragging its head in a continuous circle. While this was taking place, the battleships got into position and prepared to fire on the Mither's mark. Three, two, one, fire. The first broadside barrage collided with SCP-3700-2, and it grunted in pain, thrashing back and forth before opening its mouth and spewing an instance of SCP-3456 into the water. As soon as it hit the water, the equine monster began to cut through at a pace of 50 kilometers an hour, making its way toward the destroyers, particularly the SCPS Selkie. The Selkie attempted to retarget its weapons and prevent the creature from reaching it, but the monster moved too quickly for the Selkie to adjust. The Selkie was lifted out of the water by the creature as crew members desperately clung to the railings and their weaponry. As the crew cowered and tried to fend off the creature, it reached for them, trying to pull them from the ship. While the Selkie was occupied, SCP-3700-2 was able to attack again, blasting another ship with a stream of blue fire. A loud crack rang out from across the sea as the Selkie dropped back into the water, the SCP-3456 instance shrieking in pain. SCP-3700-1 burst through the surface, striking the creature with its club-like limbs, each blow emitting another loud crack. The third blow tore the instance in half, sending its human torso careening through the air and past the SCPS Mither. Freed from its attack, the Selkie moved full steam ahead, pulling the harpoon line taut again and dragging SCP-3700-2 out of its path. 
Several silky crew members were thrown overboard during the struggle, and as they struggled to keep their heads above water, SCP-3700-1 scooped them up, placing them onto the deck of a nearby destroyer and out of harm's way. With the crew members rescued, SCP-3700-1 set its sights on its enemy, swimming towards the edge of the whirlpool and emitting a luminescent glow from two of its eyes. The constant barrage of cannon fire on SCP-3700-2 was beginning to take its toll, and the Mither ordered the fleet to, quote, brace for the killing blow. As if responding to the Mither's call, SCP-3700-1 shot several concentrated blasts of gamma radiation at its foe leaving large holes in the creature in their wake. SCP-3700-2 screamed, flailing so hard that it snapped the harpoon lines and created waves large enough to push the vessels backward. With its newfound freedom, SCP-3700-2 impaled SCP-3700-1 through the midsection with its barbed tip of its tail lifting it up and out of the water with the force of the blow. SCP-3700-1 desperately tried to free itself, attacking the tail with its club-like limbs, but the fight was in vain, and after a moment, all movement stopped. SCP-3700-1 was, for at least the duration of this manifestation, dead. SCP-3700-2 tossed the corpse into the water, flinging it past Delta-7 where it crashed into the water and sank down into the depths below. At this point, Delta-7 was ordered to initiate Protocol Tumult. The Delta-7 vessels turned away from SCP-3700-2 and prepared to evacuate the area. One of the ships, the SCP-S Strosony Beast, slowed behind the rest of the fleet, emitting concerning amounts of smoke before coming to a stop. Meanwhile, the enraged and emboldened SCP-3700-2 expanded the size of its whirlpool, setting its sights on the retreating ships and the weakened Strawsony Beast. The ship tried to flee, but the engines were completely shot and would not respond. The ship was caught in the whirlpool and pulled against its will toward SCP-3700-2. As the crew looked on in helpless dread, a tentacle rose from the deep wrapping around the vessel and dragging it toward the entity's gaping maw. Suddenly, SCP-3700-1 exploded from beneath the surface of the water, leaping between the ship and SCP-3700-2, cutting the tentacle in half and freeing the Strosony Beast from its grip. SCP-3700-2 shrieked before closing its jaws and biting down on SCP-3700-1. It retaliated, emitting bright flashes of light and doing enough damage to stop SCP-3700-2 from continuing to produce its whirlpool. Another tentacle emerged from the water, pulling at SCP-3700-1's legs and ripping them from its body. But SCP-3700-1 returned the assault in kind, bludgeoning SCP-3700-2 with its club-like limbs from inside of its mouth. All at once, SCP-3700-2's lower jaw was torn out of place, dropping into the water with SCP-3700-1 still inside. SCP-3700-2 thrashed futilely, growing steadily weaker and weaker. It released one more stream of fire before collapsing. Delta-7 paused the retreat, watching the scene for any sign of a winner, but after five minutes, neither entity had moved. Delta-7 returned to the site of the battle to investigate and saw that neither entity was moving, and both appeared to be deceased. Shortly after Delta-7 reached the area, both entities disappeared, leaving a single, round, unidentified object that sank below the surface where SCP-3700-1 had just been. The wall clouds overhead dispersed, leaving standard cumulonimbus clouds in their place. The waters themselves remained choppy. Unsure of how to proceed, the SEPS Mither sent a radio transmission to command. Ah, uh, this is Delta-7 to command. We read you, Delta-7, command replied. We have a bit of a situation. Go ahead, Delta-7. SCP-3700-1 and 2 are both down. Command was silent for 10 seconds, utterly baffled by the information. Please repeat, Delta-7. Again, the Mither said, SCP-3700-1 and 2 are both down. Command ordered the Mither to stand by. Three minutes of radio silence later, communication resumed as they asked, Are either entity's effects active? Ah, uh, negative, Command. Is there any trace of either entity? 
Also negative. It appears the anomaly has been neutralized. Delta-7 is to return to base for debrief following any recovery efforts. With their next steps clear, Delta-7 attached the Strosny Vs to several tugboats, preparing to pull the vessel to safety. But there was one more surprise waiting. The SCPS Mither began picking up unusual levels of gamma radiation, as well as a sonar contact at a depth of 3 kilometers. They called command, requesting permission to deploy submersibles for exploration purposes. One minute of silence followed, as the command arrived at a decision. Request denied. Return to base for debriefing. And so, Delta-7 began to evacuate the area once more, steaming in the opposite direction of the battle. Over the next five minutes, CCTV cameras on the vessels picked up an unusual sight. As the gamma radiation levels continued to increase, the ocean turbulence also worsened, tossing smaller vessels and nearly causing them to capsize. Then, all of a sudden, the water stilled, and four large yellow orbs appeared below the surface, approximately 300 meters from Delta-7. They lingered there for two minutes before vanishing. Afterward, a new sonar contact was detected, five kilometers deep, directly beneath the task force. Command, we've lost the signal from the previous contact and are no longer detecting gamma radiation. Uh, we're, we're detecting new contact, five kilometers deep, large and metallic. After further deliberation, command responded. Delta-7, you are authorized to deploy submersibles for exploration purposes. Be advised, should SCP-3700-2 manifest, exploration teams are to be considered lost, and you are to return to base. The consequences of this incident, as well as what else might be lurking down in the depths beneath SCP-3700, are still unknown. The ships crash and splinter against the rock. Men scream as they're tossed into the water by the force of it, but they don't fear drowning. They fear something far more powerful and terrifying. As they land in the water, huge pitch black hands reach up to receive them. In a place beyond darkness and impurity, all things will be revealed. Those in pursuit of spiritual enlightenment are sure to find it on the high seas of life, so long as they map out their course with precision and sail dauntlessly towards it. But their souls must also be wary, for wherever there are oceans to explore, there be monsters. It is a raining morning on the coast of the island of Kyushu. A modest fishing vessel gently crests over the waves of the Sea of Japan, carrying with it a successful haul back to the port of the rural settlement it departed from a couple of hours prior. The crew are all tradespeople local to the area, and many are parents and grandparents whose children have long since grown up and left their home village for the opportunities of city life. For the older generation that was left behind, the bounty of the sea is all they know. The marine life that the aging fisherfolk bring in is the lifeblood of the village economy. The population depends on the kindness of nature to avoid falling into poverty and is accustomed to working against the elements when it becomes necessary. Tsunamis and typhoons have threatened the balance of this way of life before, but over several decades, the villagers have proven themselves resilient to the most extreme fluctuations of natural forces. But even a firm backbone beaten into shape by hard work and suffering will buckle and bend in the churning maelstrom of alien tides. A black domed shape in the valley between passing wakes heralds the arrival of a fearsome giant. With no further indication of its intentions, the great dark thing emerges from the depths. The fisherfolk steady their vessel as a gargantuan ripple disrupts the surface of the water, giving way to a humanoid figure that was a full five meters in length. When the fishing boat had left the harbor, the weather posed no obstacle save for a veil of fog. But now, in the face of this unfathomable being, the pelting rainwater swirled around the sturdy rubber boots of the crew as if the ocean below was beckoning them to surrender to the darkness. An icy blade of fear pierced the heart of Mr. Nakamura, the man who now commanded the wheel of the ship. His efforts to make sense of the horrible sight in front of him brought him back to a moment from his distant childhood. His parents had taken him to visit a Buddhist temple in the countryside, and when he recklessly wandered off, young Nakamura wound up lost in the dark corridors beneath the grounds. To a child his age, it seemed as though he was trapped in an inescapable labyrinth. The only thing the boy could muster the strength to do was head towards the faint glow of torchlight. 
we soon came upon a statue of the Amitabha Buddha sitting peacefully between the contained flames of the torches. Nakamura relished the temporary peace of the moment, but his composure did not remain intact for long. A hand from the dark grabbed his wrist, and at that moment, he looked up to see the bald head of one of the temple monks. The orange-robed man's eyes were fixed downward at the boy, and contained a mixture of contempt and relief that Nakamura had never seen before. Amitabha, you are found. Over 70 years later, Mr. Nakamura could see nothing in the terrible giant that had besieged his boat so clearly as he saw the silhouette of a Buddhist monk. But even with the ominous recollection of that formative memory coursing through the old fisherman's body like an electrical current, it was obvious that the monster was human only in shape. The flesh of the thing was the color of octopus ink, and its eyes, its bulbous and disquieting eyes, were big even in proportion to the giant's colossal head. Worse, despite their almost cartoonish absurdity, the eyes of the thing seemed to hold within them that same barely defined look of bewildered judgment. It was too much for Mr. Nakamura to take, and when his heart gave out, his hands threw the ship wheel in a jerking arc that brushed it straight against the waves. Most of the other fisherfolk were too stunned by the giant to properly get their bearings, and multiple members of the crew, Nakamura included, tumbled overboard into the waves. Those who remained on deck could see that the wheel was drifting aimlessly, or rather would have, if their focus was not still drawn to the black monk that had arisen just moments ago. The giant raised a massive dark hand above the waters, and arranged its fingers in such a way as to mimic the Vitarka hand gesture seen in many Buddhist statues. As if on cue, a consortium of black, rubbery tentacles broke the surface of the ocean and fanned out towards the boat like so many grasping hands. One of these pseudopods wrapped itself around the barely conscious body of Mr. Nakamura, plucking him from under the water and raising him into the misty sea air. In response to the tentacles, the other fisherfolk panicked and scrambled back onto the boat, with those aboard extending nets and oars to assist their fellow crew. Two terrifying minutes passed before the apparent black thing vanished into the mist along with Mr. Nakamura. His longtime peers and co-workers panted and sputtered, trying to make any kind of sense of what just happened. When they made their way home to the village port, the only question that seemed to matter was which of them would have to place the upsetting call to Nakamura's daughters in Tokyo. Who could bear to deliver the news to her that her steadfast father had been taken by a giant of the sea? While thankfully rare, incidents such as the sudden nautical abduction of Mr. Nakamura are not unexplained, or even isolated, to cases in the Sea of Japan. Since as early as the 12th century, sightings of aquatic titans resembling night black monks have been recorded by a precursor to the SCP Foundation known as the Bureau of Onmyo. Back then, these creatures were referred to as umibozo, or sea bonds. Bonds being a Chinese and Japanese term for Buddhist monk. In the current day, the Umibozu have been reclassified as SCP-2781, and because of the predatory way that the giants hunt their targets and their extreme resistance to containment, they have been designated Keter class. As of right now, there are thought to be upwards of 900 instances of SCP-2781 in existence. While SCP-2781 entities could potentially appear anywhere in the epilogic layer of the planet's oceans, they have historically tended towards inhabiting the waters around countries where there have been a pervasive and widespread practice of the Buddhist faith. An archived file recovered from the Bureau of Onmyo reveals that a group of East Asian pirates, or Wako, ran afoul of one of the creatures while searching for treasure in a seaside cave. The seafaring cutthroats had previously fired on a trading ship from Korea and driven it against the rocks of a remote Japanese island. Many of the goods on board had been carried in by the tides and required strong swimmers to access. But during the hunt for spoils, the Wako were interrupted by the malevolent presence of an entity that manifested itself within the coastal crevasse. The Yumibozu, or SCP-2781, could not stretch to its full height within the cavern, and thus glared down at the pirates with an acute angle to its posture. The pirates were completely defenseless, having left behind their metal weapons and guns on the ship out of concern for rust and ruined powder. While none of these criminal sea dogs were religious, 
Their plunder had brought enough gold Buddha statues to recognize the familiar gestures of SCP-2781. Then, according to the report, a strange phenomenon occurred within the cavern. The pirates gasped in sheer disbelief as the stone walls were bathed in light and the creature began to raise its head. The ceiling was suddenly more pliable, as if it had changed into a softer material. Before they knew it, the Wako found themselves in a wondrous cave of pure gold. The entity then tore chunks of the gold away from the wall, crushing the metal with its bare hands like a chef might crush spice. A small fortune of coins dropped from between the Yumibozu's fingers, though the tempting promise of wealth called to the men. Not one of them could find the courage to attempt to seize it. This was because of the entity's unblinking gaze, which felt so profoundly wrong that even being within sight of it felt like drowning. The Wako were already swimming away as fast as they could when the giant unleashed its tentacles to swallow its chosen target and disappear into the ether. Later in the tavern of a nearby port, a researcher for the Bureau of Onmayo obtained a detailed version of the encounter before administering rudimentary herbal amnestics to the pirates through their pitcher of sake, which all of them were partaking in to dull the insanity of what the more superstitious among them were calling divine punishment. While the full scope of SCP-2781's reality warping abilities is still being studied, displays such as the transmutation of the cavern into gold in the case of the Wako have been noted in several other sightings. It seems as though the entities are able to perform religious miracles, in other words, exert godlike authority over all forces, mineral and elemental. The use of this ability seems to be an uncommon occurrence, even within targeted attacks, seeming to reflect an understanding on the Yumi Bozo's part not to want to abuse its miraculous power. Of all the sightings ever documented, no entity that is part of SCP-2781 has ever attempted to transmute a living human or animal. The Bureau of Onmayo also suggests that the overall number of Umibozo in the sea experienced a mysterious increase during the reign of Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and that the startling frequency of their appearance may have influenced Japan's inability to claim victory in the Imogen War. There were so many disparate reports of the entities that a few even reached the Great Unifier's ear. Since even the Bureau didn't have the authority to give amnestics to the Chancellor of the Realm, the knowledge of SCP-2781 lurking in the ocean was likely an additional factor in Hideyoshi's well-documented mental decline. The SCP Foundation data has picked up where the Bureau of Onmayo left off centuries ago, and had begun to chart the alarming number of targeted hunts that instances of SCP-2781 have committed over the years. Sometimes the culprit is not immediately provable as an instance, but a closer look at the circumstances reveals its presence. For example, there was the case of Max Powell, a 15-year-old American teenager who was thought to have been kidnapped while his family was aboard a commercial sea liner traveling to Hong Kong. On the day of his disappearance, Max was enjoying a swim in one of the cruise ships on deck pools. Witness testimony says he was just present one moment and simply gone the next. Max's parents and the lifeguard on duty had no idea how to process the situation, and though both parties were sure that Max had never left their sight, the grief of it all got the better of them, and a heated argument began. Security footage from one of the ship's cameras reveals a portion of the truth, and thus the Foundation seized it and used amnestics to make sure the events were not public knowledge. There is a brief moment right before Max Powell disappears from view, where a thin, wire-like strand of black seemed to snake across the deck and into the swimming pool. Another camera feed from the same day reveals the telltale outline of an SCP-2781 entity was visible, keeping pace with the ship along its hull. It seems as though the entity had manifested in an attempt to seize a new human being as a target, but found none submerged in the ocean, and therefore had to shift its focus to one of the passengers in the swimming pool, which, sadly, appeared to be Max Powell. This incident confirmed a widely theorized belief about SCP-2781, the fact that it is only able, or at least willing, to abduct targets who are partially submerged in water. While boats are often involved in most of SCP-2781 manifestations on record, this is likely a side effect of the fact that such vessels tend to carry many humans at once and thus increase the chances that one of them will wind up being a target. In other words, there is nothing stopping a SCP-2781 entity from choosing someone who is simply in the vicinity as a target, provided they meet the requirement of being submerged. 
Following the 2020 Olympic Games in Tokyo, Anne Simone Bergman, a member of the German swim team, decided to stay in the country for a bit of additional training. She was fresh off of winning a gold medal in the 100-meter backstroke, the first in her career, and according to her own statements, wanted to make as many memories as she could before she returned to Germany. But she never would actually be able to return. Anne Simone Bergman went missing in the Kanmon Straits, and her body was never recovered. The cause of her disappearance was uncertain until recently, but in light of new evidence, it is believed that her fate was at the hands of an SCP-2781 entity. Further data suggests that the uncanny resemblance between SCP-2781 entities and gigantic human monks goes deeper than a mere aesthetic coincidence. This is corroborated by the existence of SCP-2781-A, a pure land that exists beyond the known boundaries of space and time. It is theorized that this remote dimension is where the entities of SCP-2781 dispense the targets of their attacks following the moment when they vanish from existence. There are no other known ways to enter SCP-2781-A other than being ushered in by an instance of SCP-2781, but it has been discovered that there are two ways to leave the pure land. The first is to transcend mortal existence in order to become a Buddha, and the second is to return to the physical world as a Bodhisattva, understood in this context to be a manifested instance of SCP-2781. In Buddhism, the purpose of the Bodhisattva is to spare itself the completion of its own spiritual journey in order to guide the rest of humanity toward enlightenment. Thus, SCP-2781-A is an extension of that purpose and confers the benefits of the clerocognizant awareness upon its occupants. While it is impossible to know the ultimate truth of what befalls the targets who choose to reach Nirvana, we learn much of what we know now through engaging in sign language communication with a voluntarily, albeit temporarily, contained instance of SCP-2781 that has self-identified itself as Nakamura. This unusually docile instance of an SCP-2781 Bodhavista described the Pure Land as a contemplative place and alleged that it even had a chance meeting with Olympic gold medalist Anne Simone Bergman during its time in that world. Nakamura indicated to the Foundation members that it wished to return to its village and release others from their own attachments and labors, but at the same time requested that the Foundation contact a woman it identified as its daughter. This, the SCP-2781 instance indicated, was its own attachment that needed to be shed in order for it to let go of its earthly obligations. We informed the instance that amnestics had already been administered to both Mr. Nakamura's daughter as well as all the fisher folk that had been on board the vessel the day that Nakamura was targeted. As a response to this information, the entity demonstrated that it was no longer willing to cooperate with Foundation staff. It brandished its tentacles and was able to ensnare a member of Mobile Task Force Zeta-66 before vanishing in the expected manner. Further observation will need to be conducted to determine how much of a target's former identity factors into how it has changed as a result of entering SCP-2781-A, but we will be closely monitoring 34-year-old Minako Nakamura as well as other known members of the Nakamura family in the meantime, just in case they end up following in the footsteps of dear old dad. Diego had only just found his footing when it gave out underneath him again. Crashing to the ground, he threw both arms over his head just in time to protect his skull from the rain of boulders that came down past him. They grazed his arms and jarred painfully against his muscles, but it was better than having them hit him in the head. Without a moment to spare, Diego got straight up to his feet and continued running back down the trail he had been trying to follow. The ground shifted and lurched in all directions under him, threatening to throw off his balance at any moment. Having lived in Chile his whole life, he had gotten used to earthquakes, but he had never been in the center of one like this. The problem was that the trail he had been following to get up here was disappearing fast as the dust swirled into the air and boulders landing all around him. He just had to keep running in this direction and hope for the best. There weren't any other options. But suddenly, he found himself running uphill. Stumbling forwards, Diego tried desperately to get his bearings. He had spent the previous three hours hiking up the mountains, so how was it that now that he had turned around and gone back, he was still going uphill? 
It was almost as if the ground was changing shape beneath him as he ran. Dust filled his lungs as he tried to wipe it away from his burning eyes. Yes, the ground was definitely going uphill, but it felt almost as if it was lifting itself up beneath him, as if some tectonic plates were grinding together, creating a new mountain beneath his feet. Diego lurched unsteadily and grabbed the nearest rock to keep his balance, feeling the ground lifting higher and higher beneath him. Then, all of a sudden, the cloud of dust broke, and he was in fresh air rising ever higher into the sky. The Andes Mountains stabbed out of the clouds all around him, cutting beautiful shapes across the horizon. He felt his own mountain steadily growing taller than any of them. He dropped down on all floors and clutched at the ground in terror as he tried his best to take in the shape of what he was now standing upon. How far would you go to prevent a cosmic-level disaster? It's one thing to save your friends and family from an armed murderer. It's another thing to fight for your country in a world war. We can even just about imagine what it means to fight for our planet, to save our species from climate change, to save our world from a meteorite. But what would a cosmic disaster look like? A calamity so broad in scale that it surpasses our ability to even perceive the threat. We could point our most advanced telescope into deep space and look straight down the middle of it and never know it was even there. And if that threat was not simply to the survival of humanity or planet Earth, but to the survival of existence itself, how far would we go to prevent it? What cruel and inhumane measures would you take to have such a threat? Or better yet, how many people would you kill to save the world? This debate is raging right now as you sit here and watch this video. Not among the Foundation, but between two SCPs so grand in scale and so advanced in nature that the Foundation has no option but to sit and listen as the pair debate what to do with the human race. SCP-4568-1 was not difficult to discover once it started moving. In fact, it was almost impossible to ignore. Earthquakes have been tearing across South America for centuries, destroying homes, taking the lives of innocent people, and fundamentally changing the shape of our planet itself. What most people do not realize, however, is that the fault line running through the Andes mountain range has actually largely been dormant during this period. The source of the earthquakes has come from something far more mysterious. Our innocent hiker, Diego, had been spending the week walking among the Andes when the earthquake struck. You would be forgiven for assuming, as Diego did, that the ground rising beneath his feet was a new mountain forming as the tectonic plates clashed together. But the staggering reality of the situation was that he found himself hiking along the back of SCP-4568-1. As the creature raised its head into the air, Diego saw the head of a serpent lifting several kilometers away from him. Its body stretched and wound its way through the mountain range, filling the valleys and running beneath his feet. The scale of SCP-4568-1 is hard to convey. Measuring over 500 kilometers in length, this serpent is longer than most U.S. states, with a 20-kilometer width. Standing on the back of it quite literally feels like standing on a mountain range. For context, the horizon at sea level is about 4.8 kilometers away, so multiply that by 4 and you'll get a sense of just how wide this thing is. Even small movements from this SCP are enough to trigger continent-wide earthquakes, with tremors being felt all the way around the world. Upon the initial discovery of this SCP, the Foundation was unable to determine why it remains dormant for such long periods and seems to only awaken sporadically and for brief periods of time. That was, until SCP-4568-2 was discovered. It is little wonder that the second serpent took so long to be found. Its body is comprised almost entirely of water, sand, algae, and steam. It does not show up on sonar scans and is incredibly difficult to detect in the water, even visually. Its form is loosely defined while dormant. With broadly similar measurements to SCP-4568-1, this serpent roams the South Pacific Ocean. Any marine creatures that swim into the SCP's body find themselves undergoing beneficial mutations. Crabs grow extra pinchers, 
Bottom feeders grow larger mouths, and sharks find themselves developing heightened senses and even extra hearts. These marine animals seem to undergo virtually no distress and are free to exit and re-enter the SCP's body at any point. Initially, SCP-4568-2 was believed to be the peaceful one of the pair. Both serpents seem to become active at the same time. While on land, SCP-4568-1 would wreak havoc with magnitude 7 earthquakes in major metropolitan areas. The sea serpent's function was less well understood. Employing resonant frequencies and vibrations, this SCP was able to give its watery body a distinct form as it rose up from the ocean and towered above the waves. In order to maintain its shape and control its movements, this SCP employed a huge amount of energy. However, the Foundation quickly observed that it was rarely able to maintain its form for very long. As soon as the sea serpent rose out of the water, its mountainous twin would begin to move, sending tremors around the world that disrupted the frequency needed for SCP-4568-2 to remain animate. Exhausted and unable to maintain its shape, the sea serpent would fall into another period of dormancy, gliding lazily through the oceans. But this dormancy suited the Foundation. Without the constant seismic tremors, researchers could work fast. Two operating bases were set up to monitor each SCP. Two mirrored bases with mirrored teams in constant communication with one another. As soon as one team made a discovery, it was conveyed to the others and vice versa. One operating base was set up high in the Andes Mountains, specifically designed to be as earthquake-proof as possible, capable of withstanding earthquakes up to 9.9 .9 magnitude. Meanwhile, in the South Pacific Ocean, an underwater research center was built just above the seabed, with regular vessels drifting out into the unknown to gather whatever data they could about the great SCPs. Several early findings stood out. Firstly, SCP-4568-1 appeared to have a very different internal structure from its twin. Researchers initially assumed that the creature would be largely composed of earth minerals and rock, as its exterior appearance suggested. However, scans of its body indicated the presence of what can only be assumed to be artificially created components. Great gears resembling clockwork structures and even rudimentary circuitry were present throughout the creature's body. The function or origin of these gears has yet to be determined, especially as there is no evident way that their movement corresponds to the autonomy and movement of the serpent itself. The far more striking discovery, however, came when the SCP Foundation discovered a way to communicate with the two beasts. Ultra-low frequency waves capable of traveling vast distances, even light years, were discovered to be emitted from the two serpents' heads at intermittent periods. The Foundation had to develop some of the largest antenna ever created to pick up these frequencies and interpret the data coming through them. What they found were two twins locked in a fierce debate about the fate of humanity and the universe itself. It was only then that the motivations of these two serpents started to make sense. In 2010, almost as soon as the Foundation was able to tap into the frequency, they were contacted directly by SCP-4568-1. Foundation, I know that you can hear me. I will not apologize for my actions. I know that I am the reason that millions of your kind face their demise. I know your pain, and I feel it too. But I shall never apologize for it. I simply ask you to listen to myself and to my word cannot be translated. You are curious. You can be patient. Exercise that, and you may one day understand. And listen, the Foundation did. Efforts to contain or destroy the two serpents were put on the back burner. Instead, Foundation agents prioritized spreading disinformation across South America and beyond about the source of these earthquakes. The two serpents are far too large and far too powerful to overcome or contain. Instead, the Foundation prioritized the use of amnestic drugs, disinformation, and the creation of fringe conspiracy groups to discredit any claims of the serpent's respective existences. 
Meanwhile, some of the most senior leadership figures in the Foundation were, and still are, locked in a fierce debate as to what to do with the Twin Serpents. By listening to the communication between the two SCPs, the Foundation discovered that SCP-4568-2 is intent on wiping out the entire human race. The only thing that has prevented it from being able to do so thus far has been the existence of the Other Serpent. Every time that SCP-4568-2 begins to mount an attack on humanity, its land-bearing twin triggers enormous earthquakes to disrupt its progress. But why would the Sea Serpent want to destroy the human race? As Foundation generals gathered in the Deep Sea Operations Base, SCP-4568-2 came to the observation window to look them in the eyes as it told them. I am sure you can see it. How your world dies a little bit more every day. Mostly by your own hand, no. You poison the oceans, taint the rivers, blacken the skies. You do not need angels of death to destroy your world. But there is something else. I see it in the bottom of your eyes. Something unforgettable. Unconceivable ideas cloaked in madness and impossible colors. Do you think I would let you drag the rest of the world down with yourselves? Do you think I will leave this world, my world, to die in flames? It sees your world, and it comes in fives. Since this revelation, the Foundation has poured countless hours and resources into trying to identify a cosmic threat. For well over a decade, many of the smartest scientists the world has to offer have looked to the night sky, scanning for this impossible color, this shroud of madness, but to no avail. Some within the Foundation believe the Serpent is lying, trying to make up an excuse to justify its genocide, but information from SCP-4568-1 seems to confirm everyone's worst fears. Your minds burn bright from this, Hume. All of humanity shines from this rock, like a candle in a dark room. It sees you. An idea exists only because something thought of it. Have you ever considered how such terrible concepts could have been given form? What kind of atrocious mind could even think about it? Humans cannot conceive the colorless green. What if you are playing into this creature's hands? There appears to be an underlying implication that ideas are the source of power somehow. This colorless green, this unimaginable cosmic threat, seems to be a monstrous idea incarnate. But whose idea? Humanity's? There is a deep lore that the two serpents discuss with one another. One that makes little sense even to this day to the Foundation. They talk of gods and goddesses, deities of flesh, of steel and gears, and of the Fives. Quite what these creatures are, if they are even creatures at all, is a mystery to the Foundation. Researchers have not discovered a way of communicating back with the two serpents directly. Attempts to mimic their language or transmit signals asking questions to them have largely been ignored. Instead, they address humanity and the Foundation as a whole, seeming to take the view of the human race as being a collective hive mind, one that they are evidently able to tap into. The pair seem uninterested in informing us as to exactly what this threat is, or explaining who the gods and goddesses are. Perhaps they assume we know these things already, or more likely, they believe that our consciousness is not yet capable of perceiving the scale and depth of the concepts that they are debating. What is clear, however, is their shared understanding that if humanity were to be eliminated, the candle was to be blown out, this cosmic threat would pass by. The pair have names. Trenten is the land serpent, while remaining dormant much of the time in an enormous cave system beneath the Andes Mountains. This serpent seems keen to help the Foundation in some way. Kai Kai, the sea serpent, is intent on sacrificing the human race for a greater good, one far beyond our understanding. Speaking to the Foundation in the Andes Mountains, Trenten gave a short speech that served both as encouragement and a terrible warning of the darkness to come. It is something I like about you, Foundation, about mankind. 
While it is easy to just take the simplest path, to just give up, there will always be some among you who refuse this path, who do the right thing. Maybe not all of you are this strong, but I can see it in your methods. Those so-called containment procedures. There will always be someone who stands up against the dark, even if it takes a thousand million years to emerge victorious. Maybe you can stop the fifth. After all, ideas can be killed with better ideas, even if it takes a thousand million years. Blood in the water, floating bodies covered in bite marks. It's hungry. More meals will arrive soon. The ocean is a beautiful place, filled with majestic dolphins and whales, colorful coral reefs, and every kind of fish you could possibly imagine. It's also a horrifying place. Dark, endless depths filled with sharks, anglerfish, giant squid, and unknown creatures that look like something straight from a nightmare. The ocean definitely isn't the sort of place most people would want to go after dark. But for one particularly adventurous newlywed couple, a nighttime scuba diving excursion seemed like the perfect way to kickstart their life together. Well, Brad the husband thought so at least. His new wife Lacey was a bit more reluctant. They had both been scuba diving before, but that was during the day. She loved the ocean when it was sunny and bright, when she could see everything around her and relax with a nice sunset dinner afterward. The idea of diving down into the depths after dark sent shivers down her spine. But in their vows, she and Brad had promised to always take risks together, and she already said no to skydiving, so this was the compromise. This was what they were doing for their first honeymoon activity. Tomorrow, she promised herself, she would find something more relaxing for the two of them to do. Maybe a nice brunch and a trip to the hotel spa. But for now, the couple found themselves standing on a boat side by side, ready to take the figurative and literal plunge together. Brad gave Lacey's hand a comforting squeeze, a silent promise that everything would be okay. It wasn't too dark out yet. The sun was just beginning to set, casting a soft, warm glow across the surface of the ocean. Lacey took a deep breath. They wouldn't be going it alone. The dive master would be with them the whole time, she reminded herself. He was an extremely experienced diver. He had already walked them through the necessary hand signals to let him know if they needed to resurface and handed them their flashlights. They had already sprung for the diving masks equipped with voice communication systems so they could stay in touch the whole time. Every potential issue had been accounted for. Now, it was time to dive. Lacey, Brad, and the dive master switched their lights on and slipped below the surface of the water. The dive would take them close to a coral reef, which the dive master promised would look extra vibrant, illuminated by their diving lights. As it turned out, he was right. The reef was a sight to behold. The beautiful blue, green, purple, and red pigments so striking that they briefly distracted Lacey from her fear of the ocean at night. She called out to Brad over the voice communication, encouraging him to come take a closer look at this, but he wasn't there. Where did he go? She turned, shining her light this way and that. She called out for him again, and this time he answered. His next words made her stomach drop. Did you hear that? No, she hadn't heard anything. What did she hear? Was something wrong with his oxygen tank? Did he hear something happen to the boat up above? When she pressed for an explanation, Brad simply said, I heard a voice. That was almost enough for Lacey to want to bail on the whole dive together, but she didn't want to be the one who ruined the excursion they had spent so much money on. She spotted Brad and began to swim after him. There it is again! He exclaimed. He was still hearing things. Something must be wrong with his oxygen tank, Lacey thought. He's hallucinating from lack of oxygen. She swam closer to him, reaching out to grab his hand and bring him back to the dive master. But just before she reached him, he swam away from her grasp. She was about to call out to him again to demand he turn around and come back or she would divorce him, but she suddenly froze in place as a sound came over her voice communicator. A voice. Not Brad's. Not the dive master. Not even her own. A woman's voice she had never heard before, whispering to her in a soft, soothing tone, almost like a lullaby. Lacey. The voice cooed. Come this way. Come to me. Don't be afraid. That was impossible. There was no one else out there with them. Who could that possibly be? 
And why did she feel so compelled to do what they said? Somehow she felt a pull, the tug of an invisible thread leading her in the same direction she just saw Brad swimming. She could hear the voice of the dive master, demanding to know where she and Brad were going, telling them to slow down and let him catch up, but she had to follow that whispering voice. She swam along the path that invisible thread was pulling her, the light in her hand illuminating the way. She was swimming away from the reef a bit and swimming closer to what appeared to be a dense kelp forest. There up ahead, she could see Brad amidst the kelp. He was thrashing around, kicking his leg. His foot apparently caught on something. Then, her ears were filled with the sound of his screams. The flashlight slipped out of his hand and it fell through the water. It cast its beam of light on Brad. Lacey could see the full extent of what was causing those blood-curdling screams. The kelp nearest to him wrapped itself around his leg and dragged him slowly down towards the holdfast on the ocean floor. Brad was fighting with everything he had, clawing at the vegetation that pulled him, but it wouldn't budge. Lacey shone her light down towards the holdfast and nearly dropped it in shock. There, she saw a mouth, wide and waiting, filled with sharp teeth. The horrible sight was enough to shake her into action, and she fought her way through the water over to Brad, struggling to unwind the kelp from around his leg. She was just beginning to make some progress when another piece of kelp gripped Brad's other leg, continuing his slow descent toward the gaping mouth below. Lacey was so preoccupied with freeing her husband that she didn't see the strands of kelp creeping up behind her. She wasn't prepared when they grabbed hold of her arms, pulling her down towards another monstrous mouth. She thrashed and fought, but she was unable to free herself. All she and Brad could do was watch, helpless, as they approached those gnashing teeth. But wait, there was still hope. The dive master, he was still here. Lacey called out to him over the voice communicator, begging for help. From the dive master's perspective, it sounded like the couple had lied about their experience level in diving and had gotten themselves tangled up in some kelp, and now they were panicking. With a sigh, he paddled his way in their direction, looking out for the kelp forest. As he approached, he heard a curious sound, a woman's voice, lilting and sweet, a lot like the voice of his wife's in tone. Where are you? Come closer. I need you. I want to see you. I want to hold you. Hello? Who is that? He replied curious and confused. Lacey and Brad both began screaming even louder, trying to drown out the voice. They begged him not to listen to it, to focus on getting them out of there. They warned him to be careful and not get too close to the kelp while helping them. The dive master scoffed. This couple was ridiculous, but he would check it out on the off chance something really was wrong, and he would try not to get distracted by any mysterious whispers, no matter how seductive they might sound. As the dive master approached the kelp forest, the screams over the communicator went suspiciously silent. He called out for the couple, waiting for a response, and received nothing but silence. Then the whispers started again. Don't worry, come find me, I'm waiting. He shook his head as if trying to physically shake the voice off and continue his search. There, he spotted two unsettlingly still silhouettes amongst the kelp. He held up his flashlight and saw the water blooming with a thick cloud of unmistakable red, blood in the water. Lacey and Brad were hanging upside down, bleeding out into the ocean. As he swam closer for a better look, he saw their injuries, bite marks. At first, his instinct was to blame a shark, but there hadn't been a shark in these waters for years. As he turned to examine the area for evidence of a shark attack, he saw a winding green shadow advancing toward him. The kelp ensnared him before he could realize what was happening, and before long the mouths along the ocean floor were feasting once more. Up on the surface, the boat's captain waited for the divers to return, but after a few hours, realized that something must have gone terribly wrong. The next day, by the time the authorities had found the bodies, there was nothing left but bones. The deaths were written off as a horrible accident, possibly a shark attack that was finished off by scavengers. No one knew that this poor couple and their dive master were victims of SCP-5189. SCP-5189 refers to anomalous variations of organisms belonging to the order of Laminarales, or kelp. Instances of SCP-5189 are physically identical to the non-anomalous versions of their respective kelp species with one notable difference. Along the base or roots of the organism, there is a mouth-like structure made from organic algae matter, as well as dentin formations resembling the teeth of a tiger shark. 
When a human reaches within 80 meters of an SCP-5189 instance, they will hear the sound of a pleasant, alluring female voice whispering to them. These whispers vary from instance to instance in terms of voice and content, but are always seemingly intended to entice and beckon the person to approach. Strangely enough, specimens of SCP-5189 do not possess any vocal cords, so it is unknown how they are able to produce these sounds. If a human heeds that siren's call and moves closer to the kelp, the instances of SCP-5189 will move their thralli and blades, grabbing onto the person with a vice-like grip. These instances are strong, seemingly impossibly so for the variety of organisms they appear to be. But no matter how improbable it may seem, once they've gotten hold of their prey, it is very, very difficult to break free. Once a human is in the grasp of SCP-5189, it will begin to slowly, inexorably pull the human toward its mouth and begin to consume them. It is not a quick process, unfortunately, for the humans involved. The organism takes approximately one bite every half hour. There are no organs attached to the kelp's mouths, so their chewed meal drifts out of their mouth and into the water, filling the surrounding waves with floating streaks of red. Surely the victims drown during this process, making the suffering as short-lived as them, right? Wrong. SCP-5189 will hold living bodies above the water as they slowly devour them. Once the blood loss kills them, these newly deceased bodies are pulled below the surface, left hanging from instances of SCP-5189 until they are completely eaten. Greedy in their feeding habits, instances of SCP-5189 will hold on to multiple victims at the same time. They will keep the thallus wrapped around these captured humans, leaving them floating underwater, taking bites out of various bodies until all of them are gone. Sometimes instances of SCP-5189 will grow together, as non-anomalous kelp species do. Once a group of SCP-5189 has accumulated 50 specimens of 5189 within 100 meters of each other, it is an instance of SCP-5189-1. These instances will work together to capture and feed on bodies and are highly dangerous. On January 15, 2021, an offshoot of MTF Gamma-6 Deep Feeders was dispatched to eliminate the first known instance of SCP-5189-1, which had been discovered off the coast of Southern California. The team approached the process of eliminating this instance the same way they had previously eliminated smaller gatherings of the kelp. For the first two hours, the process went as expected, and the mobile task force was able to make a small dent in the population there. But then, something changed. The instances of SCP-5189 began to work together to attack and trap the task force. The first member of the task force to be captured was the captain, who was gripped around the waist with a rapidly constricting thallus of SCP-5189. The rest of the team swarmed around him, attempting to break him free. But the thallus squeezed tighter and tighter until it had squeezed the life out of him. Then it began to drag him down toward the nearest mouth. The sight of their captain's blood spilling into the water was enough to shock the rest of the team into action, but it was already too late. Their attempts to free the captain had brought them too close to the rest of the SCP-5189 instances. Task Force members would attempt to avoid the thallus of one of the instances, only for another to block the path of their retreat. One would grab hold of an ankle, while the other grasped a wrist, pulling in opposite directions and making it impossible to wiggle free without severe injury. One by one, the task force members were ensnared. Some of them drowned. Others were dragged down towards the waiting mouths, screams leaving their mouths as bursts of air bubbles as they vanished into a cloud of red. A few of the task force members were able to swim away, but as soon as they stopped for a moment of rest, they were snatched by more instances of SCP-5189. The kelp had spread further than they had realized and was able to follow them much further than expected. Mobile Task Force Members 8, 13, and 31 were devoured in the chaos. Members 3, 14, 18, 24, and 29 passed away from blood loss within half an hour of the attacks. Members 2, 5, 8, 11, 21, and 22 died quickly. Others were not so lucky, suspended out of the water just enough to stay alive as the kelp feasted on their teammates, ready to eat them next when it was finished. No members of the task force were left to exterminate the SCP-5189-1 instance ever made it back out of the water. The instance is still there, picked clean skeletal remains of the task force still hanging from the kelp. To this day, it is uncertain how much SCP-5189 is in the ocean. 
there could only be a few small patches, or it could be spread out all across the world. Smaller instances of SCP-5189 can be transplanted to the nearest available aquatic SCP Foundation facility with minimal casualties. However, if the instance is an SCP-5189-1 infestation, this should not be attempted. The area must be blocked off at an area of 80 meters from the nearest SCP-5189 instance and left alone until further notice. No attempts to eliminate it should be made until the Foundation is able to ascertain a safe and effective method of eliminating these instances. No one wants a repeat of Incident 5189-1, or to see any more bodies added to the grim aquatic graveyard there. Maria Delgado tumbled through the air. The furious sea wind whipped all around her. Her hair blew in her eyes, trying to shield them from the view of what was rapidly coming to hit her square in the face an ocean as black as the night sky. She barely had a second to brace herself before, splash. The impact in the cold knocked all the air out of her. A flurry of bubbles disappeared into the darkness as she sank further and further down, not knowing which way was up. Maria kicked frantically as her waterlogged clothes dragged her back. Her head found the surface, and she barely had a moment to gasp in half a lung full of air before a wave hit her in the side of the head, knocking her back under. Kicking and spluttering, she managed to poke her head up again and tried to wave desperately at the metal behemoth looming over her. The cruise ship that had felt so safe and warm now looked like a cliff face. The lowest window that she could see was more than 100 feet above her head. There had been music playing on the deck, but she was so far below now that she couldn't even hear it anymore. All she could hear was the rumbling of the engines and an ominous swooshing, chopping sound behind her. Maria's stomach dropped. She felt the ocean pulling at her, a current forcing her beneath the waves. She had fallen off the back of the cruise ship, and that meant the current gripping her and turning her beneath the water. She tumbled and twisted in the darkness, feeling all of the air rushing out of her lungs again. Squinting as best as she could through the stinging salt water, she saw the thing that she'd been dreading, an enormous propeller, each blade the size of her house, spinning and spinning just on the edge of her vision and gliding steadily towards her. The water was sucking her towards it, pulling her faster and faster. She'd never been a very strong swimmer, but there wasn't time to feel bad about that now. She needed to escape any way she could. Desperately lashing at the water, Maria kicked and clawed herself out of the current. She had to swim sideways as fast as she could, otherwise she didn't want to think about it. The propellers were getting closer, getting larger in the water. The awful sound of their approach didn't just shake the water around her. It shook all of the water inside of her, making her stomach turn in fear. She hadn't breathed in in a long time. Her body was going into shock from the cold. Everything around her was doing its best to drag her down to a slow, icy death, or maybe a fast, painful death, from the impact of several tons of spinning steel. Something hard and fast crunched into Maria's heel, moving so quickly that it sent her spinning through the water. The propeller had hit her. Its next revolution passed about a foot in front of her face before the turbulence of the cruise ship's wake took hold of her and threw her away. Then, all of a sudden, fresh air was hitting her face. The water had lifted her up to the surface and carried her in the foamy wake that stretched away from the cruise ship. Already, the metal juggernaut was a couple of hundred feet away from her if she tried to swim after it. The currents in the water would only carry her further backward. Maria had no choice but to tread water and stare as the cruise ship that had once been so large and imposing above her steadily became a dot on the horizon and then disappeared entirely. Her husband had been in bed. She had just stepped out onto the deck to have some fresh air. He could sleep through anything. Chances are he wouldn't notice she was missing until he woke up in the morning, and who knew what time that would be. They were on vacation, and he hadn't set an alarm. He would probably assume that she'd gone for an early breakfast without him. Only once he'd sat down and finished his breakfast and gone back to the room to find she was still missing would he start to worry. By that point, she would have stopped kicking hours ago. She wasn't sure how deep the ocean was out here. How many minutes would it take for her body to sink to the bottom? Or would it take hours? Perhaps her corpse wouldn't even be halfway down to the seabed by that point. She was shivering so violently that she was struggling to keep herself above the surface. Her legs weren't kicking like they would in a pool. They were spasming and tensing up. 
Her clothes ballooned all around her, doing nothing but get in the way as she tried desperately to stay alive. She had no phone. It had fallen off the deck with her. Now likely on its own way down to the seafloor, she had no light, not enough air in her lungs to cry for help, and no one between herself and the horizon to hear. This was it. This was how she would die. A sense of morbid curiosity filled her. What exactly was below her? Maybe there was a reef somewhere down where her corpse could lie peacefully. What she saw when she stuck her head beneath the surface was darkness, swirling and empty, and painfully cold. Except, there was something else moving down there. It looked small, smaller than she was, some kind of sea creature swimming up to meet her. Maria lifted her head, took a deep breath, and swam down towards it. It wasn't swimming like a usual fish. Its shadowy silhouette seemed to ripple and twist. As her eyes slowly adjusted to the darkness, she saw what it was. A squid, maybe a meter in length. At least she wouldn't be dying alone out here. The squid started to swim faster, approaching her quickly. At that moment, she suddenly remembered some of the things she'd heard about squids. Weren't they hunters? She had seen a nature documentary once where sperm whales had come up from the seabed with enormous gouges around their eyes from where they'd been attacked by a school of squids. Suddenly, Maria didn't want her companion anymore, but it was too late. The squid had almost reached her end. She felt her mind starting to float out of itself. Her eyes weren't focusing properly. The squid wasn't just swimming towards her, it was flashing, almost like a strobe light. Different lurid colors filled the ocean around her, and it convulsed in different colors until all of a sudden, it wasn't a small squid at all anymore. It ballooned in size, swelling and bulging all around her. Enormous tentacles unfurled themselves and whipped at the water all around her. It was 10 meters tall now, 20, 40, 70. The squid seemed to fill the whole ocean, swallowing up all of the available water and leaving her in a tiny puddle floating just a few feet away from its gnashing beak. Some of the tentacles didn't even look like tentacles anymore. They had turned into pinchers or even human-looking arms and legs, except the fingers were tipped with grotesque talons. She had to escape, had to get away. If Maria had thought she'd swum fast to get away from the cruise ship's propellers, it was nothing compared to how fast she swam now. Without care for her trembling limbs, struggling lungs, or rapidly fading consciousness, Maria knew she had to get away from this monstrosity. There was no hope for her without escape. The flashing lights felt like they were all around her. No matter which way she swam, it just felt like they were getting brighter and brighter until a pair of hands grabbed her and lifted her out of the water. Maria kicked and screamed, trying to fight the tentacles off, but they pinned her down to the deck and held her there. Voices surrounded her, bright lights shining in her face. This was how she would die. Until a shadow blocked out one of the lights, and her eyes managed to focus on something. It was a man. He was talking to her in another language, desperately trying to calm her down. Where was the squid? What had happened to it? Maria lashed out with her limbs, trying to shake herself free from the fishermen who were holding her down on the deck. She threw her gaze sideways and saw an enormous net lifting a school of fish out of the water. There were hundreds of them, all thrashing and slapping against one another. And there, poking out of the bottom of the net, was a single tentacle. Dread filled her stomach, but her body gave out on her, and she fell unconscious. All right, we run it one more time. Dr. Matthews sat at the laptop and watched the grainy CCTV footage for what felt like the hundredth time. It was footage from a fishing vessel captured off the coast of Senegal. The first 30 seconds of the clip just showed the view from the front of the boat, waves splashing here and there, but mostly darkness. Then, all of a sudden, there were two shapes moving through the water. One was a terrified woman desperately swimming towards the surface. The other shape was harder to pin down. When Matthews had first watched the video, she'd seen a colossal sea creature writhing beneath the surface. But each time that she'd watched it since, the creature seemed to get a bit smaller and lose some of its sting. Perhaps the shock of what she was seeing had just been wearing off. Regardless, it was time to do the mandatory checks before the latest SCP was brought into the facility. Dr. Matthews walked through the corridors of the containment facility and came to the large double doors that led into the main hangar. It had been hard to find a facility large enough to contain this SCP. 
They knew it was capable of reaching enormous sizes, so they had to construct an aquarium big enough to house it at its maximum size. Dr. Matthews started walking across the walkway. It hung suspended over the reinforced aquarium and would be strictly off-limits once the SCP had been moved into the facility. It was far too easy for the squid to simply grab a member of staff and pull them beneath the water. She was heading towards the control panel at the other side. The tank was 150 meters cubed, and so walking the length of it took her well over a minute. This was by far the biggest containment she'd ever been involved with in terms of scale, as well as severity. The logistics in trying to organize the containment of this squid had run into the millions of dollars, and were still going up every day. It had taken her and her research team a while to convince the board that this SCP posed a significant enough threat to warrant the investment. She needed to make sure not to screw it up. Guards stood all around the perimeter of the tank, holding B-74H harpoon guns with electrified discharge shafts. Looking down into the water, Dr. Matthews could see the 15 depth charges, all hanging at various heights throughout the tank. Each of these depth charges were wirelessly connected to a computer that monitored the integrity of the glass all around the tank. If the SCP were to make even the slightest crack in the glass, all 15 depth charges were to be set off simultaneously. She hoped that was enough to kill it. God help her if it wasn't. It would keep one entity here for study, but she had reason to believe that there were more of them all over the world. And so, preparations were in place to arm a team that could scour the oceans and eliminate any others that were found. Today was the day. SCP-252, the humbled squid, was about to arrive. The shipping container was lifted by a crane and carried to the right spot. Somewhere inside it was a large sealed tank of water holding an instance of SCP-252. They would drop the shipping container into the reinforced aquarium and let it sink all the way to the bottom, before detonating remote charges on its doors and on the sealed tank inside, allowing SCP-252 to escape and fill its new enclosure. Dr. Matthews stood with her hand shaking over the button. It was now or never. Taking a deep breath, she pressed it down firmly and watched on the security camera monitor as several puffs of bubbles rose from the container and the doors swung open. None of them could see inside the container, they just had to wait. Then, all of a sudden, a small shape darted out. It was tiny, no more than a meter in length. What had happened to the reports that this thing was 75 meters across? Dr. Matthews looked around at her co-workers in shock. She didn't expect to see a monster to unfurl itself out of the container and grow larger and larger, but all that had emerged was a tiny little black squid. But none of her colleagues looked back at her. All of them were staring wide-eyed at the security feed. Matthews glanced back and saw that the little squid was flashing various colors as it swam around, just like the CCTV footage that she had been studying for the prior few weeks. A scream filled the room and was quickly answered with another as her fellow researchers ran away from what they were seeing, terrified by the shapes on the screen. Matthews just looked back and forth in confusion. The colossal sea monster that had been reported to her wasn't there. There was just a tiny squid flashing various colors. What were all of them so afraid of? And how would she break it to her boss that she'd spent millions of dollars on a giant aquarium loaded with depth charges for a squid the size of a large dog? Two weeks later, she found herself attempting to do just that. Standing in front of the disciplinary panel, Dr. Matthews tried to explain what had happened. SCP-252, the humbled squid, is suspected to be the origin of a lot of myths surrounding giant squids, and perhaps even the kraken itself. When hunting, all of the squid's prey attempts to flee by the most direct path possible overcome with terror at what they are seeing. The squid can appear to be anywhere between 50 and 75 meters in size, with up to 200 appendages growing from its mantle. These appendages can all take various forms, often depending on what the prey is most afraid of. For example, a test subject who is terrified of spiders will see the hairy legs of a tarantula amongst the tentacles. But C is the important word here, because while SCP-252 appears to take on its form, the reality is that these are all hallucinations brought on by viewing the squid's rapidly flashing colors. While hunting, SCP-252 rapidly cycles its chromatophores, 
which results in powerful hallucinations. All prey will then immediately lay down their defenses and try to flee as quickly as possible, leaving them open to being eaten by the relatively small and weak real squid. However, as Dr. Matthews had discovered, it was possible to inoculate yourself against these effects by viewing the grainy CCTV footage from the fishing boat on repeat so many times in the run-up to SCP-252's arrival. Dr. Matthews had built up a kind of immunity, allowing her to see the SCP as it actually was, even though her colleagues ran away in terror. One fun fact, Dr. Matthews said, is that the prey will attempt to rationalize the SCP's size, even when it is in a confined space that's impossibly small. So, if you were taking a bath with the squid, you would somehow believe that the squid was both 75 meters large and fully submerged in the tub in your guest bathroom. Funny, isn't it? None of the disciplinary board members had a word. They all stared at her in bemused silence. Please don't fire me. Squishy Human 76 was the only one left. Every other squishy human had beautiful, shiny new skin all over their bodies. They were cuddling, poking, squeezing, and tickling each other in what used to be the cafeteria. All these humans piled on top of each other, no one feeling lonely. Only Squishy Human 76 was left, huddling in the darkest corner of the facility away from everyone else. He sure was feeling lonely. Almost every inch of his wet, slippery skin was calling out to join the others, but there was one tiny problem. The pesky inch of human skin left on the top of his head. The graphs had been a massive success, with 97% body coverage with SCP-2790's skin to replace his disgusting, calloused human skin, with only a mild case of severe necrosis eating away at him. He sat in the corner in the dark on his own, stroking the patch of rotten, dying skin on the top of his head. Soon, it would be all beautiful, soft skin. He just needed the human part to finish dying. Then he slithers into the cafeteria and hug and cuddle and squeeze and poke and prod with everyone else. Then he wouldn't be so lonely, huddling in this, where was he actually? Squishy Human 76 looked around through blurry eyes. There was a name tag on his chest. Head Researcher Hopkins, SCP Site 32. What did all those words mean? Hey boss, we've got the new SCP just shipped in. Where should we put it? Melanie Sanders looked up from her desk with a sigh. She'd been picking at the dry skin on the backs of her hands. Every single person at Site 54 was burnt out. But she was burnt out in chief. It had been such a manic year that she hadn't even realized they were due to be receiving an SCP transfer. She asked which number it was, and they informed her it was one called 2790. Didn't ring any bells. She asked what class it was. The junior researcher, Millie Rogers, studied the shipping container uncertainly. It just says BFF. There's a note attached. Melanie walked over, feeling the headache pound with each step. Why did they have to have the lights so bright in this facility? She snatched the note off the side and read it. It was signed by head researcher Hopkins. She recognized the name and the signature. He was from Site 32. They'd teamed up a handful of times in the past. Dear Melanie, a gift from us to you, SCP-2790. Morale was at an all-time low at Site 32 before the arrival of this wonderful little SCP. We hope you welcome him warmly, just like we did. You'll all have the best time together. We promise. Just give him plenty of cuddles. Only one rule with this one, don't touch him. Hopkins. She realized immediately that it was obviously a trap. Melanie scrunched up the letter and threw it on the floor. She jabbed a finger at her junior and instructed her to get on the phone straight away to senior command and tell them that something weird must have happened at Site 32. Under no circumstances was anyone to touch that shipping container. Did this SCP really think she was born yesterday? Boss, I'm actually going on annual leave for a couple weeks. I don't really have time to- Melanie didn't have time to deal with this today. She'd leave it to her team to sort it out. But that evening, as Melanie was working late, she found her mouse drifting over to the SCP main list and her fingers absentmindedly typing in 2790. An adorable picture of a little squid came up right away. Even in the midst of her stress, she couldn't help but crack a smile. It was very cute, whatever it was. She would just check its containment measures, that was all. She needed to make sure that it was safely stored while it was here, raising everyone's morale. 
It would obviously need to go back because there was a major containment breach. But while it was here, personnel are freely invited to splash around and play with him. SCP-2790 should not be touched and must always be hand-fed. All forms of physical contact with 2790 are allowed and encouraged except touching. That seems straightforward enough, no issues there. Rub his belly while feeding him, especially while feeding him treats. He loves treats. Hug him before and after playtime. Maybe it was worth going and checking on SCP-2790. She wouldn't want him getting lonely. As soon as Melanie Saunders turned the corner into the delivery depot, her worst fears were confirmed. He must have been very lonely. The shipping container hadn't been opened. He must have been left in there all on his own all day. That simply wouldn't do. She opened the container up right away and saw in the shadows inside a large aquarium. Hello, little fellow. Are you all on your own? Did all those mean people not give you a cuddle? She walked closer and closer to the tank, the darkness enveloping her. She couldn't see anything inside the tank. Maybe it was hiding? She pressed her face right up against the glass, trying her best to get a look inside. He wasn't there. A scream filled the room. Melanie turned in a flash and ran out of the container. More screams. She sprinted through the corridors following the sound and rounded the corner to see happy faces, laughing, cuddling, and playing. It was SCP-2790 surrounded by all of her best researchers. They had set up one of the Class II deepwater aquatic containment tanks, especially for their new guest. Everyone had gotten into the tank, some of them still fully dressed, others rolling up sleeves and taking off shirts to get more skin-to-skin -skin contact. Could she blame them, really? Melanie Saunders laughed along with them, flooded with relief that their new BFF wasn't lonely in there. Okay guys, I'm glad to see we're all welcoming our new special little friend. Just remember the rules. We can cuddle him, squeeze him, stroke him, give him tummy rubs to our heart's content, but no touching. Got it? They all nodded in agreement. Absolutely no touching. Then went back to patting 2790 on the head, beaming. And why wouldn't they be happy? SCP-2790 is a male Atlantic cranch squid. Teothuina Megalops, who is just the cutest little guy you've ever laid eyes or hands on. The Foundation first recovered him from the curio shop Curios of the World, and it is a good thing they did. Someone mean had put him in a tinted glass tank with the word IGNORE printed on the front. Despite the Foundation's best efforts, it had been unable to ascertain as to why anyone would want to separate SCP-2790 from everybody like that and make him feel sad. He's just the best SCP out there, perfect for petting and caressing with your skin on his skin so that your skin and his skin are making contact skin to skin. Just don't touch him. In fact, he's so perfect in every single way that all personnel are actively encouraged to engage in as much physical contact with him as possible, except for touching. Anybody on their lunch break, after work, before work, or while doing work is encouraged to spend as much time as they can give as CP-2790 tummy rubs and back scratches and squishy cuddles. Foundation personnel who object to playing with SCP-2790 are to be coerced in the strictest way possible, in the interest of everyone's safety. This is because SCP-2790 can get lonely. If he gets lonely, then he escapes containment. For Melanie Saunders' team, the rate of containment breaches was far too high. 2790 was escaping at a staggering zero times per week. They needed to do something about it. Melanie, gathering the best minds in Site-54 as well as all the others in the Class II Deepwater Aquatic Containment Tank, where they stood around stroking 2790 for a very serious, important meeting. As I'm sure you all are no doubt aware, 2790 is feeling too lonely at the moment. He has breached containment zero times already this week, which is an increase from zero times a month yesterday. This just isn't acceptable. We need to come up with creative, innovative solutions to make sure that without touching him, we are maintaining as much physical contact with him as possible. Any suggestions? She gave 2790 a good belly rub for being such a good boy as she spoke. Dr. Romero piped up almost immediately, fingers intertwined with 2790's little tentacles in a cute little game. He'd been thinking about this nonstop, and he'd come to the conclusion that the correct answer here was skin. Dr. Sirnivasan agreed enthusiastically right away. Dr. Romero continued feverishly explaining, skin to skin, that's what they needed. 
They needed to maximize physical contact whilst avoiding any touching, so it made sense that they put their skin against 2790's skin as much as possible. He proposed skin grafts, taking skin from 2790 and grafting it onto their own bodies, so that their skin is always against his skin, forever. The more skin, the better. Skin to skin, skin on skin, skin over skin, skin under skin, skin interwoven with more skin. Melanie weighed that as an option. And you can do that without touching? The doctor nodded. So the skin grafting procedures began. At first, doctors Romero and Sirnivasan were worried about hurting 2790 in the operation, so they made sure to give it constant tickles and pats as they worked. It was all worth it to help them attain the smoothness and loveliness of his skin. They worked swiftly, never touching him, but constantly stroking him to make sure he knew everything was okay. There was a line of staff members waiting at the door to the operating theater, each one of them offering up their arms for the sake of making sure this adorable little guy wasn't lonely ever again. All resources and machines in the facility were immediately switched to aiding in the cloning of the skin sample taken from 2790. Before too long, they had a whole production line of beautiful soft skin for them all to not touch. 189 personnel volunteered to take part in the trial out of a possible 189 personnel at the facility, so it aligned with the average turnout for fringe experimental surgical procedures in the United States. Every single one of the volunteers had disgusting, dry, calloused, gross, disgusting skin that desperately needed to be replaced. One by one, they would enter the operating theater, scream in pain from the lack of anesthetic, which is now common practice in medicine, before striding out proudly with lovely new pink wet skin on their hands, feet, forearms, chests, or faces. Many of the patients were so pleased with the results that they immediately took their place at the back of the queue all over again to go back for more. Naturally, antibiotics and immunosuppressants were handed out to everybody who took part in the surgery, with the goal of preventing any kind of serious infection or skin rejection issues. Not that anybody could ever reject 2790, just look at him. Again, this was a roaring success. Only 87% of patients reported suffering from complications from the grafting procedure. For some unknown reason, many of their bodies were rejecting the perfect smooth new skin that was so much better than their horrible old skin. And only 70% of the patients suffered severe necrosis in their bodies as the inferior human skin around the grafting site died and began to rot away. How's that for cutting edge foundation science? Most importantly of all, there was a dramatic increase in SCP-2790's morale and, indeed, the morale of the whole site. Containment breaches, once rampant, had gone down from zero times per day to zero. Given the unprecedented success of the operation, <laughs> Melanie Sanders herself, the proud new owner of a facial skin graft with necrosis eating away at her neck, greenlit an even greater rate of production. They were rapidly hurtling towards continuing Site-32's pilot program of sending 2790 to other sites to boost morale, but there was more work to do first. The operating theater was open 24-7, with the scalpel passed on to anybody who was around at the time, regardless of qualifications. Anybody not in the operating theater was to be in the water tank with 2790. It was paramount that this level of positive morale was maintained. The best part was now everybody had a little bit of 2790 skin. They could always be horsing around together. Researchers, agents, security, juniors, everybody piled into the tank together, cuddling, poking, squeezing, and patting one another. Just to make sure everyone was on the same page, someone had painted the words, no touching, in what looked like red paint over the tank. Morale soared, and everybody was happy until that junior researcher, Millie Rogers, came back from her vacation. For the first time in two weeks, somebody didn't want to be cuddled. She seemed to have developed some strange kind of phobia while she was away. Quite irrational. Any time any of the staff members would approach her, she would run away screaming and brandished improvised weapons at them. For the most part, the staff of Site-54 paid her no mind. She would occasionally bludgeon one of them to death when all they wanted was a peaceful squeeze to stave off the loneliness, but aside from that, it wasn't a big deal. They'd cut off all the phone lines, computer systems, alarms, SOS beacons, and defense systems a long time ago. None of those things related to skin or cuddles or not touching, so they had to be removed. Millie Rogers was locked in there and would eventually see how high the morale was and decided to join in. It wouldn't take too long. 
But Millie had a plan. Somehow resisting the harmless urge for constant physical contact with all of her co-workers, she decided that the best course of action was to terminate SCP-2790 once and for all. Maybe its adorable charm and lack of any sinister subtext would dissipate after it died. To do that, she had to be like one of them. There was only one place where SCP-2790 could be. It had breached containment zero times, so it could only be in one place, the center of the writhing, cuddling bodies in the water tank. Queuing up for the operating theater, Millie volunteered to do a graft on one of the patients in line. She couldn't recognize their face at all. All of its skin had been replaced and it smelled like death, but the name badge told her it was Dr. Romero. Millie picked up the scalpel and stood over him, hand shaking. Actually, she rehearsed a thousand times but still felt nervous. I'm going to go and have one more frolic in the tank if that's okay. Okay? That's the best thing I've ever heard! I'll join you! Millie marched through the corridors, escorted by a bizarre skin job of a man who stroked every co-worker he walked past with a sense of constant euphoric wonder. Millie stood at the edge of the tank, clutching the scalpel. She'd jump in and kill it. The others might suddenly turn on her, or the spell might break, or they could die. Who knew? The water was acrid and full of floating chunks. Nearly 200 people were living day and night in the tank as their bodies rotted. The smell was unbelievable. Millie took one more breath and dove in. She kicked and punched her way through the tangled throng of limbs. Come to think of it, their skin was remarkably soft. She wouldn't mind it so much if her hands felt like that. Focus. She kicked deeper and deeper wrestling people out of the way in her race to get to the center of the human cocoon. Just a bit further and she'd. It was quite nice to have so much physical contact with her colleagues, come to think of it. When would they have gotten to cuddle like this before? Without so much as the dull thought, Millie's hand loosened, and the scalpel sank to the floor. The arms of Melanie Sanders wrapped around her and stroked the horribly coarse skin on her face. She'd have to get that seen to, for the sake of everybody's morale. Little did she know that it would have been hopeless anyway. The SCP-2790 Good Morale pilot program had been extended. Earlier that day, SCP-2790 had been shipped out to another undisclosed site that was having morale issues. You see, not all SCP stories end up being horrific. Some of them are just good, heartwarming tales of caressing and skin grafting with your new BFF. The diver screams a silent scream as the giant squid's beak digs into his skin, its many grasping tentacles grabbing him and holding him in place. Nearby, his fellow divers are driven half-mad with terror as they see mysterious figures floating towards them through the murk, and strange Russian voices speaking in their heads. Nobody can help them. They're down too deep, too consumed by the darkness and the pressure of the sea. They're now at the mercy of whatever is inside the submarine. Beginning in the 1940s, with the dawn of nuclear weapons, the American government conducting the world's first atomic weapons test, and the Soviet Union responding in kind with nuclear testing of their own, the two powers entered an arms race fueled by rivalry and a thirst to prove their strength on the world stage. What followed were decades of staggering technological advancements as each nation tried to outdo and intimidate the other. The Soviet Union crossed into the cold reaches of outer space, deploying the satellite Sputnik. The United States responded with the founding of NASA. Tensions reached a fever pitch during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, as United States citizens feared they were teetering on the brink of nuclear war. In July of 1968, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, and the United States came together to sign the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, agreeing to abandon their pursuit of increasing nuclear power and turn their focus to disarmament. But several months before the treaty was signed, the Soviet government was dealing in weaponry far more dangerous than nuclear missiles, something the other world powers knew nothing about. These deadly secrets were hidden aboard a submarine known as SCP-741. SCP-741 is the underwater wreckage of a Soviet submarine that sank in March of 1968 and came into the custody of the SCP Foundation in 1999. The submarine, a version of the Charlie II class, was deployed under unusual circumstances, which attracted the attention of the United States government. In an attempt to learn more about the submarine, the US government launched Project Redacted, which attempted to recover the vessel from the ocean in the early 1970s. They managed to recover a few pieces of the vessel, 
though the specifics are highly classified. In the late 1990s, the US government contacted the SCP Foundation, informing them of a possible Euclid or Keter class anomaly in the wreck. At this point, it passed into the custody and surveillance of the Foundation. The submarine is on the ocean floor, broken into three pieces. The hull was broken into bits during Project Redacted Recovery attempt but was largely intact when it first sank except for two holes, one just in front of the sail and one just below the starboard missile tubes. Apparently, the vessel sank rapidly due to flooding after an enemy missile strike, which occurred while it was surfacing. Though all parts of the submarine are accounted for, no members of the crew have been located. Additionally, none of the emergency escape equipment on board has been used, raising further questions about what became of the crew, wherever they went, they seem to have left something behind. Whenever divers are sent down to investigate the wreckage, they report experiencing anomalous currents and strange sea life, and hearing moans, disembodied voices, and incoherent whispering. They also report seeing blurry, faintly glowing figures. Additionally, the ocean life in the area is unnaturally aggressive, particularly large squid and sharks. This effect was first noted during a manned expedition into the waters around the wreckage, described in Incident Report 1741-A. Divers A26 through A30 embarked from the icebreaker Yamal into the waters below with the intention of studying the potential anomalous activity surrounding the wreckage. As the group of divers approached the submarine, they could feel the shift in the water around them. The oppressive feeling of abnormally increasing pressure bearing down and threatening to crush them. If their specialized diving equipment were to fail, they knew that that would be it, and the command would have to come and fish their corpses out of the water. Or even worse, they would vanish entirely, meeting the same mysterious fate as the crew of that doomed submarine. But they couldn't fixate on that. They had a job to do. At first glance, the wreckage appeared undisturbed, unchanged since the previous inspection. Still, they needed to take a closer look to be sure. As the team got closer to the vessel, A-30 was startled by the sight of movement from within the wreckage, spotting motion through one of the holes in the structure as something passed by. He pointed it out to his colleagues, but they dismissed it as likely a giant isopod or spider crab, which were crawling all over the surrounding area. A-30 laughed off his jumpiness, agreed that they were probably right, and continued the exploration as planned. Control authorized the divers to proceed to the next step and A-29 activated sonar and lights, moving toward the starboard side breach. There, a faint glowing caught his eye. The glow resembled that of radioactive material, but when the team checked the radiation levels in the area, they remained stable. Whatever the source of the glow was, it wasn't radioactive. At this point, his neutron counter began to register something, and all of a sudden, a disembodied voice could be heard saying, Vasily Yevgeny, can you hear me? The voice was muffled, and though it could be heard over their communication channels, it emanated from somewhere in the wreckage, deep, deep underwater. As A-29 watched, a glowing shape emerged from the darkness. It was only an outline, the suggestion of a silhouette, but the shape was undeniably familiar. It looked like a person. The other divers quickly noted the apparition too and began to panic. Some checked their nitrogen levels, believing it to be some sort of nitrogen narcosis, while others pointed out that they couldn't all be suffering from nitrogen narcosis at the same time. The unknown voice continued speaking, saying, Help me, it is getting hard to breathe. The divers debated what to do next, questioning whether what they were seeing was even real, when all at once, the humanoid figure vanished from sight. The divers attempted to shake off the startling encounter, and they resumed their duties, the investigation proceeding as normal. After a few moments of uneventful work, another interruption presented itself in the form of a five-meter-long squid swimming around the wreckage. Its presence startled the divers at first, particularly those closest to the animal, but the others encouraged them to ignore it, citing the fact that there are no records of these squid attacking humans. So they did, continuing their work as the squid circled them with apparent curiosity. A-27 spotted an unusual shell below the wreckage, notably large and difficult to identify, and Control requested that they bring it up to the surface for further inspection by a marine biologist. The diver began attaching haul cables to the shell as the squid crept closer and closer. All of a sudden, A-26 screamed, and there was a sudden bloom of blood in the water. The squid, 
despite it being uncharacteristic behavior for its species, attacked the diver, biting him savagely. Prompted by cries for help from the diving team, Control began to reel A-26 back towards the surface, proceeding slowly to give him decompression time, and the squid took advantage of the slow retreat. It chased after the diver, grabbing hold of him and biting down again, tearing away at him as it gripped him in its tentacles. Still, Control continued reeling him in, hoping to free him from the squid's grasp as they yanked him to the surface. The other divers were ordered to get themselves out of there as fast as possible, an order they gladly obeyed. As they swam back to the surface, A-30 saw something else moving in the depths. He couldn't make out what it was, but the sight of it gave him a sick feeling of dread deep in the pit of his stomach. The four divers were recovered alive, along with the shell. Examination of the shell indicated that it resembled that of the extinct orthoconic nautiloids, but it was not fossilized. It was taken for further study, given the possible implication of extinct species anomalously manifesting in the vicinity of SCP-714. Diver A-26 lost a limb and was exposed to an unknown venom via bites from the attacking squid. His camera was destroyed in the process. As squid are not known to attack humans unprovoked, this behavior has been attributed to the influence of SCP-741, though the exact link between the two is yet to be determined. An anomalous pressure gradient surrounds the wreck with a radius of approximately 250 meters, starting around the center of the submarine. The pressure in this area is much greater than it should be, given the depth of the waters there. This unusually high pressure makes sonar analysis extremely difficult, as well as threatening the safety of any divers in the vicinity of the wreck. The few records that the Foundation has managed to obtain from the Russian and U.S. governments indicate that the submarine was being used to transport some sort of secret cargo. Though the specifics of this cargo are still unknown, there is reason to believe that it differed from any type of nuclear or chemical weaponry. On a date redacted from official files, the SCPS Basisti was patrolling the area around SCP-741 when its sonar detected some unknown entity approaching SCP-741 from the south at a pace of 46 knots. The crew compared the acoustic signature of the contact with known submarines and torpedoes, but could not find a match. The Basisti attempted to reach the contact via sonar buoy drops and active sonar pings, but it did not respond. When the contact crossed into the total underwater exclusion zone, it became classified as hostile. At that point, the sonar recorded sounds of an underseen missile launch, and Basisti responded with the utmost urgency. The ship broke away from its original area and fired a Type 53 torpedo at the underwater threat. Fifteen seconds after the Basisti launched its torpedo, missiles of an unidentified configuration were seen breaking the water, flying at a height of 1.8 meters and a velocity of 0.92 Mach. The missiles did not emit any detectable radar, nor did they respond to any launch chaff or flares from the Basisti. Both of the missiles were engaged by Basisti's 3KN5 Kinsol surface-to-air missiles and Kashtan point defense systems, and were destroyed at 1800 meters and 210 meters from impact, respectively. After the missiles were neutralized, the hostile vessel could be heard engaging in evasive maneuvers. At this point, there were four closely spaced explosions and the sound of a submarine disintegrating. The identity of the attacker, as well as its intention toward SCP-741, have not yet been determined. The incident resulted in the Foundation research team suggesting an expansion of the acoustic sensor net, as well as additional patrol and defense assets placed in the area. Additionally, they advised an acquisition of undersea retaliatory capability. The incident was classified Incident 1741-C. The sonar recordings from the SCPS Basisti during Incident 1741-C were taken for further analysis by the research team. The in-depth review revealed anomalous acoustic signatures that did not match up with any known forms of propulsion, including magneto-hydrodynamic drive. Currently, the nature of the unidentified attacker remains a mystery, and it has not been attributed to any particular government or organization. Following the incident involving the SCPS Basisti, an American intelligence agent reached out to the Foundation, offering further insight into the secretive government programs looking into SCP-741. He agreed to sit for an interview with a Foundation researcher assigned to the project, on the condition that his identity remain protected. The SCP researcher's name is absent from the official file as well. 
The two men sat in a foundation interview room, and the interviewer asked his informant why he chose to come forward, given the U.S. government had simply chosen to sit on this information for 30 years. You've seen those reports. Project Redacted. Now we know that part too. How the directors didn't make the connection is beyond me. That and the stuff the Redacted pulled up? Yeah, the other part you don't hear about is what some of the research team died of. And the crewmen we buried? Just uniforms. Also, the nuclear device we recovered wasn't a missile or torpedo warhead. It was a demolition charge. Does that make any sense? After all those clues, I had to come forward. Why the director and didn't is something I can't fully explain. This particular statement puzzled the Foundation researcher, raising questions he hadn't anticipated. Only uniforms? Did this mean that the sub had been unmanned? The informant replied, no, no, not unmanned. There were no bodies, but personal effects were everywhere, along with uniforms. There was some blood, human. Before you ask, on one of the torpedoes and a bit of skin where somebody probably crushed his hand loading the thing, just no bodies left. When I first looked into all this, I had no clue what the hell had gone on down there, but I started putting things together. The Foundation agent began to speculate based on the mounting evidence. Could it have been a Soviet weapons program? A deadly biological agent of some kind. No, no, it wasn't that. I thought maybe it could have been, so I dialed up some of my contacts at BioPreparent. Our spies wind up owing each other favors after a while, and they denied it vehemently. Not your usual cover-up baloney either. They clearly stated that whatever the sub was carrying, it wasn't theirs. They wanted no part of it. Sound like he was gonna puke when I mentioned redacted. Doctor, do you have any idea what it takes to make a bioweapons researcher sick? Now that wasn't what really bugged me though. What really kept me awake at night was the KGB file that fell into our hands. They mentioned a covert op by the Soviet military against an internal unnamed faction to get rid of a quote, terrifying weapons that even the Soviet Union can't safely control. They wanted to lose it, whatever it was, or maybe fob it off onto the US. Of course, that all came to light right before the Iron Curtain fell. And given the atmosphere at the time, it was practically impossible to convince the directors that they weren't talking about nukes. And even once I did, they still didn't even think this was worthy of action. I mean, the redacted would probably have me hang for treason if they ever find me, but it was worth the risk. And by what I can gather, sounds like Russia thinks so too. Loaning you half the Pacific fleet and all. The interview continued after this point, but the rest of the conversation was considered irrelevant and stricken from the official file. The interview left the Foundation with more questions than answers, though they were more certain than ever that SCP-741 must be kept under strict containment procedures. Due to the object's location at the bottom of the sea, as well as the unusually elevated pressure around it, it is unlikely that many civilians will come into contact with it. However, as an extra protective measure, sonar and submersible monitoring is conducted on a periodic basis in order to verify that the wreckage has not been interfered with in any way. The Foundation contracted Russian warships, SCP Esposisti and Krasnoyarsk, has been selected for this purpose. If any unauthorized activity occurs in the area surrounding SCP-741, nuclear and conventional missiles may be deployed. Any movement of SCP-741 is grounds for an immediate nuclear strike. Whatever secrets SCP-741 holds, whatever it was transporting that was even more of an uncontrollable threat than nuclear warfare, they're better left alone down there, at the bottom of the sea. There was blood in the water, but at least the screaming had stopped. It had been an ill-advised party boat floating out in dangerous waters, where a bachelor party full of rich and naive men had ignored every warning. Some had told them, don't you know that pirates operate in these waters? Others had cautioned, you might get confused for pirates and shot down by military boats. Nobody had expected the impossible monster that had actually killed all 10 people who'd gone out there on that warm ocean night. But in the chaos that unfolded the day after, they would find out. A cargo ship carrying hundreds of millions of dollars worth of products and valuable raw materials was scheduled to cross those same waters. If they could have gone any other way, they would have. But with corporate shipping deadlines to reach, they couldn't afford to take the scenic route and potentially add over an entire week to an already long trip. The cargo ship would need to take the risk. They would need to face the pirates on their own turf if it came to that. Meanwhile, on a number of secret compounds on land, the pirates were preparing. 
Their corrupt government shipping sources had given them a valuable tip about the coming ship, and they were doing everything they could in order to ensure this flagrant act of piracy would be successful. They loaded fuel into the tanks of their speedboats. They clicked magazines full of armor-piercing bullets into their AK-47s. They slipped on bulletproof body armor and clipped grenades to their belts. They were a terrifying force to be reckoned with, but they had no idea that, within a few hours, they would be encountering something far more dangerous. You see, strange things had been happening on some of the world's coastlines. It started with surfers. Foolhardy, sun-kissed thrill-seekers with an addiction to catching the biggest waves possible. Of course, there are plenty of surfers who get claimed by the sea every year. It is an occupational hazard, especially for fledgling surfers. But the mysterious circumstances of all the workers had something in common. Blood in the water. Of course, it didn't stop with surfers. Anyone who swam a few feet further than the edge of the water seemed to be at risk. Lonely moonlight swimmers went first, but it didn't take long for whole families to start disappearing in the waves. A few here, a few there. Nothing that most people even noticed, just a whole bunch of unconnected, isolated tragedies. The sea is a cruel mistress, though when looking at these cases, nobody ever considered that something else entirely could be behind all these terrifying disappearances. But back to the cargo ship, making its way across the turbulent waters. And those waters were indeed turbulent, far choppier than the forecast had predicted. The waves were huge, towering even, but that was no excuse to delay their important mission. Their comms had recently received a communique from the local government about the missing party boat and all its occupants, assumed dead the previous night. Pirates, most likely. The cargo ship had come prepared for this eventuality. The companies sponsoring their efforts had lost too much time and money to let their ships be sitting ducks, floating goodie bags for violent criminals. That's why they'd spent a little extra money on a precaution, heavily armed mercenaries patrolling the ship, ready to kill in order to protect their boss's products. The scene is set for a bloodbath, and certain things out there in the deep love a good bloodbath. The pirates, ready to make a lot of money by any means necessary, loaded into their ships and speedboats, their assault rifles slung on their backs. They took to the waters, howling battle cries as they zeroed in on the cargo ship across the bucking waves. They prepared to fire, but they didn't expect their target to fire back. With no mercy, the mercenaries ran to the edge of the boat and started firing down on the smaller boats surrounding them with machine guns. Several pirates went down, chock full of bullets, dead before they could even figure out what was going on. As their bodies sank amidst the waves, their blood floated on the surface like big, red plumes. While the pirates were shocked at the resistance, they weren't unprepared. You don't get to become the rulers of this particularly tough part of the ocean without being ready to give it even harder than you can take it. In accordance with this, the pirates loaded up the handful of RPGs they brought out with them and fired their deadly payloads at the side of the cargo ship. Boom, boom, boom. The ship was rocked by explosions, knocking over some of the many mercenaries standing on the hull. Some fell, screaming down into the water, where pirates quickly cut them down with bursts of ruthless gunfire. But one mercenary who fell off the back of the boat got lucky, or unlucky depending on your perspective. No pirate spotted him, potentially leaving him safe and sound, until he noticed a large wave coming towards him. It took more than a little water to frighten this hardened soldier of fortune, until he saw something nightmarish hiding in the dark. The flash of white fangs and an ivory jaw. It hinged open and bore down on him as the wave prepared to crash. The mercenary screamed, and after the wave hit him, he was gone. Meanwhile, the violent battle between the mercenaries on the cargo ship and the pirates trying to claim it raged on. Using grappling hooks, the pirates were climbing up onto the hull, having disabled the back rudder with sustained gunfire and targeted bombing. The ship was soon suffused with bloodshed, as pirates and mercenaries gunned each other down in bloody combat. Men were falling left and right, but there always seemed to be more. Little by little, as each man fell, there was more and more blood in the water. Out in the depths, as a storm began to rage and the waves whipped and roared, something hungry could smell and taste the blood. 
One boat full of pirates kept circling the cargo ship like a hungry shark. One worked the engine with practiced efficiency, while another three aimed AK-47s up at the ship, waiting for the moment when another unfortunate mercenary stuck up his head, ready to receive a bullet. But their true enemy wasn't even on the ship. It was sneaking up behind them. Only the man working the speedboat's engine spotted it before it was too late. A wave rose out of the sea, moving with a speed that shocked even this veteran seafarer. At first, he thought nothing of it. Too busy to keep out of the range of mercenary bullets, he was hardly the type to worry about getting wet. And then, he saw the teeth. As the wave rose well above his height and only a few feet away, he saw something impossible floating in the water. A shape he'd been seeing hanging above the fireplace in a bar he'd been frequenting for years. The jaws and teeth of a great white shark. Perhaps it was just refuse from a dead shark floating in the water. That was the most reasonable explanation, right? But if that was the case, why would the jaws be spreading further apart as though ready to receive him? He screamed so loud that his crewmates first assumed he'd taken a bullet, but when they turned around, they saw the truth. A huge wave was crashing down on them, and they saw the teeth. Not just one set, the one that the engine man had seen, but a different set of teeth for each of them. Hungry shark mouths without sharks bearing down. They all screamed, their desperate sounds of terror blending into an incoherent chorus before being cut off by the crash of the waves. The boat was wrecked, empty and bloodstained when the water dissipated, sinking lifelessly to the bottom of the ocean. But, of course, the worst was yet to come. The anomaly in the waves was insatiated. All the mercenaries and pirates it had taken so far were just the appetizer, and now it was ready for the main course. Everyone now on the cargo ship, pirate, mercenary, and sailor caught in between, who was fighting and even dying for money, had no idea what was coming. The wave rumbled and rose behind the ship, getting taller and taller and taller, until even the giant vessel looked like a toy boat in its wake. In the darkness of the wave, hundreds of pairs of gnashing shark jaws, the sharp edges of their teeth glistening, the wave fell upon the ship, sending flesh-eating water coursing through every nook and cranny. When the water cleared, there wasn't a single survivor. The ship, irreparably broken, sank to a metal graveyard down below. Nobody in the normal world would even know what happened. For those with a fear of sharks in deep water, this particular anomaly is a living nightmare, and one that the French division of the SCP Foundation has encountered with unsettling frequency. It's been recorded manifesting off a number of different coastlines, and who even knows how often it's manifested out in deeper waters. Despite its Euclid classification, containing this anomaly has been no mean feat. It's involved shutting down a number of coastlines completely on the pretense of animal research, the administration of Class A amnestics to witnesses and Class B amnestics to victims, as well as a complicated disinformation campaign to suppress photos and reports of the phenomenon online. But even with all of these containment procedures in place, many have still lost their lives to the jaws of SCP-054-FR, or the Great White Wave. By the Foundation's current estimations, recorded attacks by the Great White Wave have been fatal 68% of the time with survivors often experiencing wounds consistent with those of an abnormally bad shark attack. In case our opening case study didn't clue you in, the Great White Wave is a set of ravenous shark jaws, most closely resembling the Carcharodon caracarius, or Great White Shark, manifesting inside ocean waves. Any waves over 4 meters tall can become a host to a Great White Wave event with there theoretically being no upper limit to the size of a wave capable of causing this kind of anomalous catastrophe. The power of the Great White Wave's bite is also directly proportional to the size of the wave it manifests on, too. Meaning that, in theory, a tsunami playing host to the Great White Wave could devour an entire town. While every attack that the Foundation has failed to prevent is, of course, a tragedy, the number of attacks has allowed the Foundation to uncover some extremely interesting data. For example, while attacks could happen anywhere at sea, they're most common in the 250-meter ocean radius around a coastline. When a human or non-aquatic animal is present in the attack zone, great white waves move at three times the speed of a normal wave in pursuit of its unfortunate prey. 
The Great White Wave isn't picky about its prey either. Divers, swimmers, and even aquatic vehicles like boats or jet skis have been devoured, though the waves seem to show a particular preference for surfers, which is gnarly in the typical sense, but not in the sense that surfers say it. The ghostly shark jaws will only become visible next to the part of the wave closest to the victim, meaning that they often aren't spotted until it's too late. But that doesn't mean it can't consume multiple victims at once. As you saw with the unfortunate sailors and pirates in our opening story, many sets of jaws can manifest in the case of having multiple victims to devour. The actual consumption occurs as the wave crashes down upon the victim, so the only recorded way to survive being on the wrong side of the Great White Wave is to dive into the water before the wave crashes. The French division of the Foundation conducted a series of experiments in hopes of understanding the dynamics of the Great White Wave, which had results both encouraging and disturbing. Based on non-anomalous sharks' ability to electromagnetically sense blood from extreme distances, the Foundation wanted to see if the same could be said for the Great White Wave. After pouring several liters of animal blood into the water of an affected area, they found that a Great White Wave regularly manifested within two minutes crashing down and devouring the affected blood. However, an extension of this experiment found an alarming result. The same amount of human blood attracted a great white wave in under 60 seconds. Even a small amount of human blood attracted a great white wave significantly faster than a large amount of animal blood. Interestingly, non-anomalous great white sharks will rarely ever attack humans on purpose. Whenever they do, it's often because they mistook a swimming or surfing human for a seal their natural prey. You'll often find that most shark attack victims are only bitten once, a common shark behavior known as a testing bite. Once the shark realizes that it isn't eating a seal, it will quickly move along. Yes, this probably won't make the person with a shark bite taken out of them feel any better, but the shark didn't truly want to eat them. Great white waves, by contrast, enjoy eating humans significantly more than animals. But that doesn't mean they won't eat all kinds of animals. Several maritime birds were eaten by a great white wave when they flew in front of the wave that was over four meters tall. We suppose the great white wave has never heard the salty old sea dog tale that it's bad luck to kill a seabird. The Foundation discovered a few useful things from their experiments. If you want to avoid getting eaten by the great white wave, you should avoid getting into the water if you're suffering from any kind of injury. Wounded people are four times as likely to be the victims of attacks, with the Great White Wave manifesting in less than 60 seconds. You can also improve your chances of surviving by following Sam Neill's advice from Jurassic Park. Don't move a muscle. Movement, especially panicked thrashing, has a tendency to lure this unique aquatic predator into your vicinity. But here comes the disappointing part. Other than staying in a landlocked area, there's basically nothing else you can do in order to stop a Great White Wave event. Weapons have proven completely ineffective, with the bullets of even the highest caliber weapons simply disappearing into the wall of water. Stealth, beyond avoiding movement, is also ineffective. No attempt to camouflage the smell of humans has been effective in helping them evade the detection of the Great White Wave. You can probably imagine how many unfortunate D-classes got devoured in the process of finding that one out. The Great White Wave is a disturbing reminder that perhaps we shouldn't worry about what lurks in the deep ocean when nothing has a greater capacity to destroy us than the unimaginable power of the ocean itself. Now go check out SCP-3760 Like a Doll's Eyes and SCP-1449 Dreamtime Whale Shark for more.